welcome to the Hawk's Nest live stream show. My name is Brandon Cannon. I do appreciate you for tuning on in today. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. An off-season of delights continues on. We just get to have ourselves a special show today. Why? Because we got some Seahawk news, some grand news at that, some uh, close to ideal news from my perspective, considering the lace landscape at play here in this current ongoing search for the staff underneath new head coach Mike McDonald. And this uh, began last night as uh, we were learning Chip Kelly was going to Ohio State. So, oh my gosh, this guy that looked like he was now in the forefront, now to the back burner, not just the back burner, he's off the stove. Who's going to be the guy? Who's left? Grubbs got the press conference in Tuscaloosa. He said, I'm going there. I'm going to be the offensive coordinator down there. That was the main target for many of us. Uh, Certainly many Husky fans out there were definitely pounding the drum for that. And so we're looking at going, man, uh, none of that. Mike Kafka is going to go back to the Giants here. I mean, are we going to go with the Ingolstrad? A guy's never called a play before uh, in his life. Uh, Come on. And then, and then last night, one of our, Twitter sleuths out there. I should be giving you props right now, but I can't quite remember what your name was on the deal. I'll give you a shout out before this ends. But one of our Twitter sleuths out there is uh, able to deduce in a bar out in Renton this pick that comes out of nowhere. And this pick lit Seahawks Twitter a fire last night. That's not John... That's not Mike McDaniel. That's not Grub. What are you talking about? And everyone went back and it was very, it was a lot of fun, frankly, listening to people because it's a blurry picture. Then uh, you got people like my man, Randall McDaniel texting me going, look, I I lived across the street from that pub. It's right near Renton. So then we could connect the dots to Renton on this one. And uh, the flurry happened quickly, but the bottom line of this is yes, indeed, that, that big, that, that melon, look at that melon, that big melon in the bottom left-hand corner, my God, my God boy, you could blow out the sun with that, how is any light still getting to the room? That indeed, that big melon right there is Johnny boy, John Schneider with his back turned to the camera, and yes, Grub right there is in the middle of a, what I can only... Uh, wonder or I guess is a soliloquy of offensive brilliance being you know put across the table in, in a flurry of of words and football acronyms and terms you can see Mike McDonald he can't even drink his beer he can't even he can't even bring himself to drink the beer he's leaning forward he's like what what else what else are we going to do my god so this basically has led us to finally getting now the confirmation that our man, Mr. Grubb, is going to be the new head man of this offense, the Husky offensive coordinator the past couple of years that has, I think you could arguably say, guided this Husky offense to the two best seasons uh, of its the, the program's history. Um, he walked in there to an offense in Washington two years ago, and I, I guess before we get to that, let's go to a little bit of his background. He starts out at uh, South Dakota State as both a running backs and wide receivers coach, moves on to Sioux Falls. So kind of a slow rise here through 2007 to 2013. Eastern Michigan continues to kind of work his way up. Fresno State, he's got a background as an offensive line coach. This is where he really was cutting his teeth in at Fresno State before he became the OC, only a year after being announced there as the offensive line coach. But the offensive line background is one that's going to be one that we're going to talk, I think, a good amount about him and that, um, you know, understanding the value of linemen, the type of linemen he's going to look for in this scheme and whatnot. He went to Fresno State uh, with uh, DeBoer there, of course. They uh, had a really nice pairing. They turned Jake uh, Hayner into a, almost a legitimate quarterback prospect in the draft or sub. He's still out there, I think, banging around the league a bit. So technically so, still there. But then, of course, came to Washington for the two years, this last year and then the year before that. Brilliant, brilliantly run under Michael Penix. And he was going to go to Alabama at this point and be their offensive coordinator if he had not come here to Seattle. Now, in, in Washington, the year before Mr. Grubb got there, the, Hawk, the Husky offense finished 73rd in passing and 114th in total offense. So he was not inheriting a great offensive core or something that was just divinely put together and he could just keep it it ongoing, you know, already the, 
the engine was revving. He just had to well, kind of just keep it going, just keep it on the road. No, no, no. He needed to turn this around. And it wasn't like this took a three, four, five, six year process. Instead, 2022, 515 yards per game, which was second in the NCAA. Then this last year, 462 yards per game, which was 12th in the NCAA. And that's uh, also this year, they were seventh in yards per play. So from just a productivity standpoint, when you look at Grubb on the right, just on the front surface of this is, you know, he's worked his way through the coaching ranks, offensive line background, taking a Husky offense that's had, we've had a lot of great quarterbacks come here from through here from Warren Moon to Mark Brunel, even your, your Jake Brownings and Lockers and uh, pick, we, got, we had a picket come through here didn't we, at one point. So um, we've had a lot of guys come through that have been really good quarterbacks and great, really good offense. Brock Heward, Damon Heward, can't leave off the Heward boys. Uh, so you got all these guys that have come through yet. He's put together in, in two, two of the, I think, two, truly the best offenses in Husky history. He was a prospect on the rise a prospect that you looked at and you said, uh, as a coach, at least, you know, he's got a really bright future. He seems to be on that track. It's not right now time to go make him a coach or he's earned that. It's, it's you know, it's two years is basically what it's done. But what he's done, and we're going to go through the ins and outs of it today, of course, on from a player standpoint, because I think that that part is a, a very interesting part of it to just talk about in itself, the development of Penix, the utilization of offensive linemen. Um, how you know that that program started to develop here some pro players the receivers on the outside i mean he's gonna have a drag he's gonna probably have three wide receivers taken in this draft in the first three rounds uh if jalen polk goes out there and goes anywhere close to sub four four on his testing on his on his 40 time i think he's going to be into that place and if you want to see how bitter and angry alabama is about losing this man about not having this guy running their offense. If you want to have a little bit of a, a little bit of a window into the soul of where they might be, last night, as the uh, bar photo was breaking, we had uh, somebody, some poor bitter soul here, down there in Tuscaloosa. Not very crimson tide like. Changed Ryan Grubb's Twitter. Ryan Grubb, born April sixteenth, nineteen seventy six is an American football coach and circus clown who is the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach for the Seahawks instead of the NFL's minor league program, Alabama. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, they're, a little bit, they're a little bit not happy about this one at this point, understandably. So he brings an offense that's uh, spread-based concepts that spread-based attack that, that will utilize um, still a lot of power concepts. I mean, there's certainly some parts of Chip Kelly kind of designs and at points in the running game and what he wants to run. They're there. He's not like Chip Kelly in other ways. They're not, uh, for instance, you, you might think with him with the spread of concept that they're trying to get as many plays off as they can and running a lot of hurry up. You know, they'll do a lot of what they, what they, the, you know, the sugar huddles or whatever they call it on that, where they just kind of, it's not even a full on huddle. You just kind of have a check with me and the quarterback gets to come up near the line of scrimmage and run through a lot of checks. And, and at that point you still end up grinding the play clock down fully. So the worries you might have with the Chip Kelly going overdrive coming in here with the offense versus grub is it's not that way to illustrate this a little bit. Um, they were, do, 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 what do we have? Uh, they were at 27, 27 points two seconds per play last year in college football were the Huskies. That's 87th out of 130 teams for perspective. So you, you know, they're much more high, you know, Jackson state at like 20 seconds was much faster per play. So he's not necessarily trying to do that. So this isn't necessarily your atypical type of spread concepts, um, spread offense, excuse me. Uh, Husky offensive linemen were all over 300 pounds. So he's going to look for not necessarily big size guys, but he's, you got to hit, he's going to want the 300 pound re requisite and, uh, you got to have mobility. These guys have got to be able to move in space. It's not going to be kind of a need. It's not going to be like sort of, if we can get around to it and the guy we're going to look at for the line, it is an absolute necessity with this guy that you've got to fill the ranks with some guys that can move in space. Cause that's where this offense can be at its best. He's uh, in looking at a little bit of the the tape here as I was trying to do some background on it. He does some nice jobs and maybe the offensive line background, but just even making kind of in-game adjustments 
in blocking up problems. You know, he's got a wide nine here going to the play side and his, you know, pulling guy can't, his pulling guard can't get out to him because he's crushing down on the line and he'll run a different concept then where he'll work to clear that guy out, working off that aggressiveness and how he's pushing down the line. Like you can see, a, a, there was, I'll, I'll get the video I saw today out here eventually. Uh, we'll feature it up on the channel and give the guys some props, but did a great job of really showing how he did that throughout the course of the game. So he's, he's also not going to be your atypical spread concept guy who doesn't really understand the running game. The running game is a, an inconvenience that they'll get around to if they can get around to it. You know, it's all about the passing attack. Let's, let's let it rip. You know, you're certainly going to get a lot, a lot more passes probably than runs, but he will be a guy that still understands the commitment to the ground game. And I think especially when he's got two of the backs that he has to work with here that are so, so very talented. The uh, Huskies ran 73 screen passes last year. So to put that in perspective in regards to uh, their pass to run rate, that's one screen pass every eight throws. So you're going to get a heavy amount of the screen game worked into this offense. This is also why I say the mobile offensive linemen are going to be needing to be a bit, bit more of a centerpiece here to what you're putting together because you're going to need to not only get those guys hit and reach blocks and second level, they've got to get out there in space to the screens and be able to get to their man. And so this does become uh, really, really important if you're looking at guys that are tackles to move to guard kind of types in this draft. This potential goes much further and higher up now at this point with this higher because uh, that's often not what you're going to get a lot of times with these guards on the inside is they won't have that immobility to get around there and get it done with that, so to speak. Hey, you like trick plays? You, you guys, anybody out there miss the trick plays from last year? Well, you're, you're going to get a lot of trick plays as well. I'm trying to find where my stat was on this, but the, uh, the Huskies ran a pretty incredible amount of screen plays last year. Uh, I don't mind that at all. I think uh, they ran like, I think 20, I think it was like 25 or something. Maybe it was 17, something. They almost ran at least one a play, over one a play per game. So they will run the trick play. I like that myself because it is not a trick play. It's there just to, of course, entertain fans. Like, ooh, look at that. That's wild. But it's also you're taking advantage of the aggressiveness of defenses. And you're taking advantage of those defenses. They're going to try to be a step forward and get to a spot a little bit quicker and maybe overcommit a little bit more and rally up a little bit harder uh, from the secondary to the back front. So it's, a, it's an effective way to utilize that. And if you have it so molded into your scheme like Grub does, then when you do run those plays, it doesn't look as sometimes disjointed as we've seen, not just our Hawks team, but with teams across the NFL when they run these trick plays where you can see that they don't really work on it in practice. You know, they probably ran it twice throughout training camp and then it's like, here we go, let it fly. And uh, that's not going to be the way with him. He'll be on the, the, the particulars on it, how to sell it, how to really layer it in really nicely. And then um, what those trick plays do is it forces defenses to play disciplined. And you've got a single high safety on the back end who's got to cover up center field. He's got to stay in center field. He can't come down and help out in the run game. So it's, it's got a very, a, a very smart amount of strategy built behind doing it when you're doing it from a purposeful standpoint. Like to give you some reference for this, when our Seahawks originally started out here, Back in the franchise's beginning, they didn't have a lot of talent. So the head coach had to go to the trick plays a lot because you didn't have a lot of talent. And so it, was, it became the prerequisite because of that situation. But here, you're doing it not because you don't have the talent, but because you have a defense that's trying to lean a certain way, trying to get a little bit of a, a, a lean to trying to take a step forward and get, you know, get in front of you. So um, love that he kind of uses that. We're going to get an uptick in that. People are going to love this offense, I'm telling you. Not only is it explosive, not only is it... Uh, Going to put some points up on the board, but it's going to do so with some of those, uh, some, some trickeration and uh, fans, all fans, I don't care who you are and where you stand. I don't think I've met a fan yet in my life who doesn't like a little, little trickeration. You know what I mean? Um, he is a, he is a guy that's got some statistical basis in how he calls plays. I was going to try to play a, a little bit of an interview that I had kind of clipped away here, but uh, the pack, the old pac 12 doesn't want to let you play that on YouTube. So I can't play the clip for you here. Um, I might have to save that one for a member stream or something, but um, he seeks to hit 16% of his plays to be explosive, 20 yards or more. So another unique wrinkle to this spread-based concept is that he is going to seek to try to not just dink, dunk, screen passes, but he's looking to also hit you up deep and long. So for some that might have some worry here that this offense, for instance, might not fit a guy like DK Metcalf as much, quite contraire. You know, he's going to be able to definitely utilize this. And uh, in fact, DK makes this offense even that much more lethal 
because teams love to go to their double teams to DK. And with all of the short stuff now underneath, that numbers game that you create with the, if not just double teaming them, the bracket coverages that you commit to on the back end, open everything else up in a way that'll be unique in how you're going to see it this year because it wasn't that year in prior years. It wasn't that way in prior years. I don't think that we we found a way to kind of take full advantage of that as most, I think, offensive coordinators kind of could. Um, he's also trying to eliminate the negative plays. So they want to have less than 12% of their plays be negative plays. So there's a, a built-in part of this as well that is, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're staying on the positive side. We're getting ourselves into third and makeable. Uh, this all makes sense, of course, because this is a kind of a, a more of a move the chains offense with some explosives built in, I guess, if I was trying to um, really give you, a, you know, how to, how to elaborate on it. But it is an offense that's going to fit Geno Smith. I've had some people that have asked me a little bit about uh, Geno needing to be more mobile now in this scheme and needing to run more now. But if you go back and you look at the attempts on the year for Michael Penix and the number of rushes he had, and then you look at the number of attempts uh, like a Geno Smith had um, last year and the number of rushing attempts he had, Geno actually ran with the ball more last year than Michael Penix did. Um, so I, this actually, if anything, I think removes down Geno's need to use his legs because so much of this is uh, prefabricated in, in in the sauce in the respective from the quarterback standpoint. There's a lot more stuff that's going to be built in pre-snap to just boom, boom, hit that there. There's not as much necessarily the need to always go through the process, though that's built in there because that's a big part of Michael Penix's game. So it's, it's nice about this offense is it can kind of fluctuate between different types of how it runs. Some of it can be real preordained and scripted and it's uh, just get the ball out of the quarterback's hand, you know, like he's a, a point guard just trying to get the ball down into the blocks. Other times, though, it can be, okay, now in this drop, you're going to sit back and bank, bank, bank. You're going to have to probably go through a few reads because we're looking to get the shot play here. I got a few shotties. I got a few shotty plays on the back end here, and, and you might need to process through where you're feeling the safety leverage on the play, blah, 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 blah. So, um, He's got some, this is what I like about his offense. It's not just a, an old style of spread concept. It's not just a finesse style of, um, you know, spread concept. It's got some different, different little wrinkles into it that make it unique unto itself. Probably one of the reasons that it's had so much success that it's had here over the past couple of years with the Huskies and why they were in this national title game and, you know, fight, fight it out right there with Michigan step for step, really on the back uh, of this offense and what they were doing. Um, player standpoint, he's going to have two guys in this draft that are going to be taken in the, in I believe the first two rounds. I, I may be a little bit high on the right tackle, but I think some teams might even look at the right tackle as a guy that could fit very well as a left tackle at the next level. So um, I feel like they'll have two guys taken in the first, at least two rounds on the offensive line, three uh, receivers taken in the first three rounds of this draft. Michael Penix, I believe is going to be a first rounder when it's all said and done. So, you know, he's, He's getting these guys uh, and maximizing the talents and and getting it in a way where, you know, these guys I think are going to be at their brightest point as far as prospects go based on what they did with him under his watch. Uh, I love the hire. If you can't uh, read into it um, more deeper than that, uh, past all of this, I think that this is exactly what you want to do offensively, which is defensively. You said we're going to commit to, and I know that I'm throwing this word around and it's probably been overused so much that it's lost its power. Cutting edge. I know that it's a market term, it's a fancy term, but it still means what it means. You know, you are on the tip of the spear as far as pushing wherever you may be in whatever given occupation or background you have or what you do. Maybe it's filmmaking, maybe it's drawing freaking cartoons, whatever it is that you're you're pushing at the forefront of what you're doing in the cutting edge aspect of what you're bringing to play. And when you have Mike McDonald's defense, you're having a cutting edge kind of defense in what he's bringing to play. It has its origins. It has its backings. It's a bill by Kyle Shanahan. It's like he's got his West Coast offense origins in there, but it's become so much of something else down this line. It's, it's something that what you'd think logically would happen with, with offenses, defenses, schemes is that a guy takes it with time and it just isn't the same old dusty playbook. I hand this dusty playbook down to you, son. Thank you. And now I hand this dusty playbook down to you. You know, instead it's, you know, this doesn't work anymore. We've got to take that out, put this in. Okay, how do we adjust that to that? That point kind of still works. We got to, and then let's add, and let's build, and let's, and, you know, it, it becomes an evolution um, as much as anything else. And when I look at McDonald, I see him as an, 
an evolution from the old Buddy Ryan defense. It ain't Buddy Ryan's defense. It ain't cl- really close to that, even in, in alignments or in that, but the, the spirit of that still is within it, and it's still pushing the spirit of what Buddy Ryan was able to do back in the, in the 90s or late eight, mid-80s to 90, early 90s, um, just in a different way, but with, with some of still those tenants kind of built into it. And the same thing's happening here with Grubb, I think, on the offensive side of the ball is that he is pushing this in a way that is really, 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 really interesting. And um, I think that he is, uh, uh, you know, he is, he is going to help this offense not only, you know, I, I think he's certainly going to help get the offensive line on point, with the offensive line being on point, that then raises up DK, that then raises up the backs because now they're able to be much more impactful in what they're bringing to the table, but also with the scheme itself. And uh, with, within the way he's going to challenge his defenses, he's not going to allow, if you think about the way that this challenges defenses without getting too deep into the woods here, in, you, have a de- you have an offense that will pepper you with screens, you know, forcing your guys to rally up and tackle. If you don't have guys that are going to tackle, we're going to be able to now really go after that and attack that. He also is going to, you know, try, it's, what's, what I like about this is he's got a bit of an onus on removing negative plays off of those kind of screens. So there's some teaching within that of being on your P's and Q's to make sure that we don't at the very least have this as a negative play, whether it gains anything or not. And then you have the shot aspect of it. So pull you up, but then we can still hit you out deep and then you still have a running game that isn't boring, that isn't even like, you know, Chip Kelly's running game has come forward with UCLA a bit, but it was known for being boring back through its first run, right? Inside zone, outside zone, inside zone, outside zone, inside zone, outside zone. Well, this guy's going to run everything, you know, gap, power, everything in between. He'll run down at you and he'll pull linemen from every different direction. A little bit of the Ben Johnson flavor in this. Ben loves to take all these linemen and move them this way and that way post-snap sort of creating that wall of defenders for that alleyway to one side of the football field. The alleyway of defenders. And uh, you need the mobile linemen to do it, but you need the commitment within the scheme to also go out there and do it as well. So uh, hard to pick much apart in this particular hire. I love it all the way down the line here. The last thing I'll say with it before we get to a couple of the other hires here we have is we got the rest of the staff starting to round into shape now is um, you have to also consider what the lay of the land was here on this one. Who was available? What other hires could you have gone and grabbed? Who would have been the person that it was the better hire? Uh, I look through the landscape. There was the Frank Reichs. There was the Eric Bieniemy's. You could make maybe an argument to me that you get some more certain ground because of their pro level experience. And, and I might listen to that. I'm not certain at this point, Reich really wants to go be an offensive coordinator this year. We'll see if he does. He's going to get paid this season, whether he works or not. He's had to move two different times here in recent seasons from Indianapolis down to Carolina. Does he want to go in again a third season to Seattle when he is being paid? Or maybe he wants to just chill for a year. Maybe he's just, you know, kind of kind of like, well, I'd, I'd be wore out if I was in his, in his position. So I don't think that there was as much of candidates available here for us to go out there and grab right now. There isn't anybody really on the college scene that you can really go and push to that was going to come up here that would be that mind. Um, unless you were looking to go really outside the box. And then you had a guy like, I mean, pro level, really the rest of what you were looking through was a, like an Ingle Strad guy. They're out at Detroit, the passing game coordinator. You'd be getting a guy never even called to play. You'd be back to the Waldron zone of things. Having a guy that was going to have to kind of learn the ropes and the ups and the downs of, and how do I call plays and what can I get away with? What can I get away with? I'd, I'd like a guy that's already kind of gone through that, be it either at the pro level or the college level. And I think that, that you're going to get that here with Grubb. Really good hire. I think you guys, fans are going to love this offense. It's going to be an exciting offense. And now, like I said, you get both sides of the ball, a cutting edge offense and a cutting edge defense. And that means that you're going to, from at least a philosophy standpoint, a coaching standpoint, seek to maximize the advantages a coach can bring in every way, shape, or form. That's what you've sought to do with these hires, especially when it comes to just Bottom line, baseline, not culture stuff, not at the team atmosphere type stuff, but just on the field, X's and O's, philosophy, identity, approach, attack. This is what they're going to bring to the table. And I think with it brings much more potential for success with it. You've got to get the drafting right. You've got to get the talent right. You've got to get the cohesion right. You've got to have the injuries hold up. Well, a lot of things got to work in your favor. You've got to make a lot of other right and correct choices. But I think that the Seahawks here have all the way down through the line this offseason taken their their time and taken the smart approach to getting these things right, all of these hires right, uh, and this offensive coordinator hire along with it. One uh, 
coaching hire that we didn't discuss. And I'm not going to go definitely as much into a little bit in regards to this one because of the fact that um, I've got a reason behind it. But we do have the almost the full staff here kind of filled out at this point as far as the new guys brought in. Of course, head coach Mike McDonald is uh, your guy here. Assistant head coach Leslie Frazier. Offensive coach Ryan Grubb or offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb. Defensive coach, and he's also the quarterback's coach as well. Uh, defensive coach is going to be Aiden Durd. Now this is the uh, the new hire that is going to be our DC that I'm going to talk about in a second here. Linebacker coach Kirk Olivedotti. And uh, boy, that's a name to say. And offensive line coach Scott Huff, who's going to actually co- come with Ryan Grubb from UW or from Alabama in this case, and uh, kind of an interesting thing because he is a guy, of course, who's just produced a couple of NFL linemen for this upcoming draft. So interesting guy to take a look up. And then you've got Jay Harbaugh as your uh, other guy that has been announced there, the bottom left-hand corner, the redhead down there, fiery red there, bringing his uh, fiery red uh, burning special teams attack. Uh, so with that's our staff right now. Let's talk a little bit about Aiden Durd, who... is going to come in and um, be your defensive coordinator. He has uh, been the defensive line coach for the Dallas Cowboys the past couple of seasons. Or, different, yeah, defensive line coach, right? Um, behind Dan Quinn there. So he's uh, been doing some pretty impressive work. I've not really highlighted as much this hired for this reason. Because... I think he's going to be sitting sort of third in the ranks in this situation and that this is not your typical defensive coordinator hire. Mike McDonald has announced he is going to call the plays and maybe eventually, as he said in his press conference, he's going to let Aiden take over on this and and run this through. But as it stands now, right out the gate, he's going to be calling the plays and he's going to have, you would think, a very heavy oversay on what's going to be happening with this defense with that, meaning almost not defensive coordinator-like control, but certainly uh, he will be one of the head chefs in the room, right? When they're, when they're cooking up the defensive dishes. Then you've got Leslie Frazier in addition to this. Another wise in mind, been around the game for many years, strong defensive uh, background, who again, I think is going to be another very um, strong voice in that room in getting across what the Hawks would want to accomplish and how they want to get it done on the defensive side of the ball. Okay, so I, I have a hard time when we get to then Durden here as the third guy being able to get much as far as overruling on these guys. I'm not calling him, I'm not going to say he's in, a, in the yes man role. Certainly not that. And he can grow into being a very good defensive coordinator. He's done really good work with the Cowboys. If you just, what he's been able to control was the defensive line. That's a multiple uh, defensive line from the Cowboys with their, where they can slide between different looks. Uh, what stands out to me is that He's gotten guys that are really good players as far as star players to perform really well. And he's gotten the, the good uh, secondary guys behind the star players to perform really well as well, all the way around the line. So Demarcus Lawrence was kind of dipping a little bit after that big contract he signed at $23.5 million, like, what, four years ago? You know, when he got under Durden here, while the sack numbers haven't been there, the pressures have still been there, and he's been an outstanding run defender, still very highly graded by PFF as uh, Demarcus Lawrence. Um, still really good player, and he's, he's flourished well under under um the dc uh the defensive line there um defensive line coach i gotta make sure I'm, i want to call him durden it's dirt and i keep wanting to i think it's the fight club reference on it, <laughs> it keeps pulling me into that um so he's got that that stands out obviously micah parsons walks in the door there at penn state not as much of doing the edge rush stuff a lot of middle linebacker a lot of off ball linebacker stuff at penn state comes to the cowboys and instantaneously is is one of the best pass rushing forces in the entire league from the second he steps on the field, which was um, certainly a testament to, to, I think, what Durd did and his uh, help down there. Other guys, Jonathan Hankins, um, not a high, highly picked guy, just a big down there you know, plugger for them. Maze Smith has not been able to get on the field this year, maybe partly because Maze didn't you know, perform as a first rounder up to what they thought he could be coming out of college, but also because of the depth and strength that the Cowboys defensive line had. And, and that this is a little bit of a testament to the ability this guy has in growing, not just the star guys, the really good guys, but everybody seemingly kind of raised a little bit under Durr's watch there. Um, Osa Adui, I, I can't even begin to pronounce his whole last name, but he's been a really good player for them there. Dorns Armstrong, 
Another guy off the edge there for them has been a, a really, you know, quietly really good player. Sam Williams, they took in the second round, continues to develop, and he's been a, a pretty solid force for them. So you look up and down, uh, you've got maybe Nelvin Gallimore guy out, I think if they took out of Oklahoma third round, wasn't, has kind of been a little bit, you know, maybe quiet, but again, he's got a little bit of the Mazze Smith problem here where they've, they've got a stack of guys that are performing pretty good on that defensive line. And so it's, it's hard to break in there if you're a, a young pup trying to, you know, find your way still as a player. So he has seemingly done some really good work down there with the Cowboys. They can, they've run some games and do some things down there like that. So um, it's kind of hard sometimes to pull apart on that. What is uh, Quinn to Dirt there? Because Quinn's, of course, got the defensive line background as well. So there becomes a little bit of a, a difficulty there, but it's a good hire. I love uh, getting another guy in there that can help out on the defensive line and, and develop those guys along and get the, that productivity up. Uh, I still do hope that the team does retain BT Jordan and then he can stay in the house here. But um, another, another really solid hire, again, one that I don't think is just, uh, to me, the Frazier thing is much more bigger almost than the DC here because of the fact that uh, I think he and McDonald are really going to be the two main chefs and they're going to have dirt over there, over the pot stirring. <laughs> You know, just a little bit, but uh, good hires all the way down along the line on this one. Love what I see from it. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Is this a, uh, a hire that uh, these hires, are you with it? Who did you want? Was there another guy that you think they should have gone with? Uh, let me know down in, uh, in the comments, uh, in the comments of the video here or down here in the, in the chat. And we'll chop it up a bit here today. We're going to be doing the uh, Super Bowl coverage tomorrow throughout the course of uh, the day. So uh, feel free to pop on in there for that as well. Um, I thank you guys for watching today and all the new subscribers who had some great growth for being in right here in the, the depths of the darkness of the off season. Things are clicking along well. So I uh, appreciate you guys as well for watching and uh, liking and subbing and all that good stuff. Very kind of you. Uh, Jace, what is up? How you doing? Is this a stream? This is a stream, man. We're going hot. We're going hot. Surprise stream. That's right. It's going to be an emergency DC stream, but I probably would have had it done last night if I was going to do an emergency stream. If it was an emergency, the, uh, the person would have probably passed out by now. PGs, you, you got another live at the start, man. Let's go. Yeah, I got to get my... Uh, we're going to go through my bets here too. We got underdog fantasy. We got to get a little feature of here in a second. Um, give a little underdog name. I'm going to give you guys some of my my Super Bowl picks here for some of the stuff, but I would definitely be looking towards the Chiefs right now too. I heard Sally, 70% of the money's on the Chiefs. Like, woo. What's up, Rudy? UW commentator? UW commentator. Thank you. Sorry. UW commentator, let me shout you out. Sorry I missed you on the, uh, that was a great picture you got. You broke this one. Props to you. You, uh, Hell of a tweet, my man. Hell of a tweet. Got everybody stoked on a Friday night. You know, everyone's half in the glass. And I blurry eyed looking at that. How does this look like him? It looks like him me. Yeah. <clears throat> That's him. No, I mean, it's him. <laughs> Ethan, uh, what's up, 12s? As a completely non biased Husky with the combination of also bringing O line coach Scott Huff. I'm very excited about this. I just love the approach of high reward. I do too. High risk, high reward. But even on this side, when I look at the alternative candidates on this one, I don't even know if it's that super of a, the, the big risk, comparatively speaking. Yeah. Dude disgusted to John really going big or go home with this coach. He's tough. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Uh. Father Fist says we got Scott Huff, too, who is truly the coach that led the Huskies to winning the Joe Moore Award. It's pretty freaking amazing. It is pretty freaking amazing. That's a big boon in getting him brought in. Uh, getting a guy like that in there to help you out this line is just what the doctor ordered. I think we're getting an upgrade there. Go dogs, go Hawks. I'm with that. With it. King Bomber, I wonder if uh, part of the reason was because of Grubb's connections and they can get those late round picks to hit. I don't know if they would be bringing a coach in for late round picks, potential hitting on that. On, uh, but, 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 sorry, uh, follow the goat, imagine this, Herbert Fire, who wants to be high drafted. 
Batalu, uh, yeah, Husky left tackle, definitely. I think even Rosengardner, I I liked him too. I was watching his tape the other night going back through. I think both those guys are could be interesting. We'll see. Efron Herrera trick plays, chicken god. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Only the old old school know. Haley says, I want beef. Offensive guard, defensive tackle early, linebacker, safety, tight end as well. Let's go. Sign me up for all that. You know I'm in the same lane, Haley. And <laughs> give me give me the lines of scrimmage addressed here. Especially now that you know you need the mobile guys inside. Can't get it done with with cement shoes. We got we got to get the the ballerinas down there. Brian, wow, I didn't get notified. Hey y'all, I did a kind of a it was sort of a create the stream out of the blue because I didn't plan it out as longed out. So that's probably on me. Doyan says, I wonder what quarterback we're going to be drafting now with the OC here. If he wants Penix, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd rather have Rattler knowing how hard of a schedule he had. Yeah, it'll be interesting because I think if Penix does fall, you'll you'll learn real quickly where. Um, Grubb's opinion stands on the kid, right? If he passes on him, it's like, well, you know, that could lead to a big Penix fall, quite frankly, at that point, because then teams are like, wait, they kind of need a quarterback for the future, and they're, they just got the coordinator, had him in college, and they're going to let him dip at this point, you know? So, could tell us a little bit more about the true feelings of Penix, where Grubb stands with him. But uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if they do that possible anything's in that's definitely anything's in play at this point uh father first says man gino still has great football in him i really don't think mcdonald or grub that matter will not be excited to keep him around for a couple of years he's a win now quarterback yeah i think uh i think grub's going to be happy with him i don't think it's going to preclude them necessarily from drafting a guy but i don't think that it's going to be looking to just get uh, gino ushered out the door this year and um different type of scheme different type of tack could really suit this type of scheme could definitely suit what Gino does well I mean after all Gino is really really good in those two minute situations really good kind of coming off the pot come up the line of scrimmage to do some what's going on giving him some time to kind of go through and process some things and then letting it rip you know he gets into kind of a bit of a rhythm with that at times Jesse Lund how you doing Yeah, you had, I never understood the Giants hype behind Kafka or any of that either. Fans since 92 was up. Haley says we should roll with Geno this year. There's no real downside uh, vet presence to counter the rookie offensive coordinator head coach. If he succeeds, that awesome. If not, scapegoat and get a rookie next year. Exactly. I think you roll with Geno this year. It doesn't really make sense even just from looking at the standpoint of cutting out Geno and, and what it really costs and, and what it really benefits you by doing so. But to move off Geno doesn't really make sense from a dollar cent standpoint with the dead money you carry. But if you get to next year and now you've gotten through two years of the role of that deal, it's in much more of a place to where if that's really where you want to make that call, you can make it at that point, saves them substantial money. And uh, if you've drafted a rookie this year, then you can move to the other one. But I still do believe he knows. Going to be your starting quarterback next year, game one. Mark says, hi all and sub. Any bet on what uh, quarterback they try to draft now that they have this OC? Laughing out loud. It's going to be an interesting call on their part. I don't think you're going to be able to get a guy that's got uh, J.J. McCarthy's off the board. So if all you J.J. McCarthy lovers can put that Put that baby to bed. She needs a nap. It's not happening. You gotta, you're gotta. you going to have to have a guy that can make all the throws and hit the ball deep down the field. He's going to, he's going to, he digs the deep ball. So he understands the, the necessity of that in his attack. Explosive plays. And you don't, do, you don't get to explosive plays just merely on the back of a, a guy like, throwing a five yard screen and getting up the field 25 yards every time. Yeah, that happens sometimes, but you got to let the big dog hunt from time to time. So it's going to take guys that have the arm strength to push the ball up the field. Any guys that are limited in that range have got to, in my opinion, kind of be probably pulled back a little bit. I mean, he did make it work with Hayner out there at Fresno State, but that was also a little bit of a different level of competition too. Ponte wants to move on from Gino. What's up, Ponte? Uh, 
I like it. Grub highest upside. It's a great way of putting it. From Posse, I'm sad we lost Larry Izzo. The Michigan uh, special teams did not look great with Harbaugh. Hoping for the best, though. Yeah, it was an odd one. I would have thought maybe they would have had a little bit more opening on that one to keep in Larry in the house. And and uh, with the job he had done being like, no, he's, he did, he's done really well here. Um, not only has the special teams units performed really well, absent Myers having that dip, and that had nothing to do with Izzo, of course. But you didn't have any real like punt blocks, kick blocks. All that stuff was kept pretty clean, too. So uh, hopefully the uh, the younger Harbaugh has got it in him to he's got a he's got big shoes to kind of fill here with Izzo. I'm not saying that jokingly. Like we were the best thing we did by far last year was special teams beyond offensively passing, running, stopping the run, rushing the passer, turnovers, yards per play, third down efficiency on either side of the ball. The best thing we did last year was special teams. Three hour, I would take a look at James Williams. Also, dude is huge. Dude's big. He's fun. And uh, talking to Coach Evans there over at Baltimore, he said he's been looking at the kid for a long time and uh, says he's real athletic. He feels like he can go either way as far as you can, you can work him as a safety, you can work him down maybe as a linebacker at times. Can he be kind of a Hamilton type guy? Got, he's got a, a bit of the Hamilton build there, maybe a little bit of a bigger Hamilton, just not as it, as athletic or, you know, quite as instinctive maybe. Hamilton's just off the charts with his instincts. But uh, Williams is fun. Good player. At least as I also think Grubb's more likely to turn down head coaching offers unless it's a team with a lot of tools already. He's not going somewhere he could fail. Indeed. I think when you got Alabama as a job set up for you there with what they're going to be able to do in the future, especially with DeBoer as a head coach, I mean, he didn't have to leave that situation unless it was a good situation. And I've long maintained an, an offensive coordinator will look at this job and, and certainly want it. I don't think that there was a, a lot of guys turning down the opportunity to come here. Kafka got held ransom by the, the Giants if that was indeed one of the guys they really wanted. And we know Kelly was interested in this. Grubb's been interested in this. Uh, they've had a couple of other guys they've gone through on this. I don't think that there was anybody that wasn't wouldn't have been loving to come in here with this talent where it's already sitting and say, yeah, we can we can build this up. We can make this work. Cliffick says it would be amazing if we grab Rattler and ended up following the path of Russell Wilson, considering Wilson was drafted in the third round. Not sure where Rattler is projected to go. Been busy. Uh, Rattler really had a really nice senior bowl and won, of course, the player of the day, player of the game in that um in the senior bowl. So it, it is going to be probably hard to see him falling into the third round at this point, especially into the middle portions of the third round. I think he's probably pushed himself up in a second round discussion at this point. Um, this is also though, if me operating from a standpoint and a belief that we're, we're likely to see, I think five quarterbacks taken to the top 20, which ends up pushing him up as the next kind of most valuable guy, which will then push his value up naturally with it. Jay Frost says, thank God it wasn't Chip Kelly. Yeah, both Phil Haynes and Lewis will definitely not be retained at this point. They do not fit the marker for athletic necessity for the position. Now. U.S. UK says the uh, Ben Grubb hire is the electric vehicle of offensive coordinators. Seahawks being early adapters is a good thing. <laughs> I love the uh, great metaphor. <laughs> I love it. Promise, uh, thank you for being a member of the Hawks Nest for two, three months. It didn't have anything in there it put uh, for your comment, but thank you for doing that. I appreciate it, Promise. Kyle Mulkey, thank you for the $5 donation, Kyle. Appreciate you as well. He says, you see JSN couldn't tell Chicago Sports Radio anything good about Shane Waldron. It's hilarious. If you can find it on YouTube, go Hawks. Kyle, I, uh, not only did I find it, I've got it actually posted, Kyle, to my shorts channel. So, uh, yes, I indeed, uh, I indeed saw the clip and got that thing. I said, oh, I got to put this on the channel. People are going to want to see this. Uh, that's why I put it on there. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a very funny clip. Um, I do think he's being, there's, there's honesty in there. I don't think that he's just being a jokester. I, I, I think he's, you know, doesn't have maybe the greatest opinion of Shane Waldron. And um, I don't know if that's necessarily Shane's fault. 
you know, was was Shane impeded in his offense here by Carroll? Was he restricted? I don't know. I, I don't know. The thing I'll say about this when it comes to Waldron is we'll learn the truth about who he is as a coordinator here with Chicago. They've built up a team that's going to have a lot of resources they're going to put on the offensive side of the ball. He's going to get um, one of the best um, – you know, prospects, uh, quarterback prospects we've seen maybe in a couple of years in this draft. Um, you know, they're they're going to have another first round pick in the top 10, probably to put maybe even on the offensive line again in addition to this. So, I mean, he's going to get a lot set up there for his success in Chicago is kind of what I'm trying to say. So if he is not good, then uh, we'll learn it. And um, I think that's also about what the offense is going to look like in Chicago. If it starts looking a lot more like the Rams offense, then we go, oh, he was restricted here. He was impeded here. And then you got to give a little bit more of the, Tip of the the, the 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 nod to Waldron going, okay, it wasn't all on, it's not all your fault necessarily. But yeah, it was very funny. Is this live? Uh, is this live? <laughs> I got to get that clip for just so I can hit that as a hot key for moments in the chat. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Kyle. Funny clip. Snail, thank you for being a member of the Hawks Nest for 12 long months says, B, I still need to know who's the strength and conditioning coach. I have not yet heard Ivan has been moved on from. So Ivan the Terrible's reign may still yet long continue. You can't get rid of Ivan. It's like the roach that you step on five times and it's still moving. Father Fist says, uh, the new offensive line coach is a tremendous offensive line coach. He's coming over with Grubb. He was the coach that led the Huskies to winning the Joe Moore Award for the best offensive line in college football. That's going to be huge for us. Great point. Great point. Best offensive line in college football. They barely let Michael Penix get touched. You talk about Gino going for an offense that just gets him waylaid like the running run and shoot in 1988 to now actually having an offense with spread concepts that's just going to just have him with the ball out of his hands in a 1.7 seconds. He's going to like it quite a bit. Hans, the biggest factor here is iron sharpening iron, I think. Imagine going against McDonald's defensive scheme every practice for the offense and the other way around. Another great point. You guys got some good stuff out the gate here already. Um, it's absolutely. Both defense and offense is testing each other in just a variety of ways. And uh, I love it. You know, certainly is... Uh, Certainly going to be no easy day on either side of the practice field. You know, you're going to have to be on all of your details. Chad Hard, where's Pumpkin? I don't know. She's sleeping right now in the other room. Usually she's going to, she'll be here probably another 10 minutes or so. She's having a, she's having a quiet day. Dogzilla says we have the worst defensive line in the whole freaking NFL. That's where the picks need to start. Certainly could use some investment there. No doubt about that. I promise. Thank you again for being a member of the channel. Appreciate you. Zen Lunatech says the 49ers will lose this weekend and this will become the greatest weekend in Seahawks history. <laughs> I love it. I hope so. I do hope so. Three hours says if we want Penix, we would need to use a pick. 16, then you'd be putting him behind a bad O-line, a quarterback who's been hurt multiple times, and a bad O-line would be a recipe for disaster. Amen. Yes. One of the reasons I've been a bit hesitant on Penix with that you, you more need to have your line in place already if you're going to take Penix. More than, okay, now, now let's get to the line. That'll be a, and that's, that's a stage set up for the guy to fall off of it. And Haley, you know I'm with you on the Geno thing. Good. It's, it's, a t it's why I don't get too much deep into the Geno discussion now at this point because I think that minds are fairly made up on one camp or the other with this. You're not moving. You just won't move a ball with it or one way or another, but... You know, I, I think that 
this kind of hire is going to take a guy like Geno Smith, even if you're anti-Geno Smith. And I understand that there's a, there is a contingent of Hawk fans that are in that lane. And if you find yourself in that lane, it's my belief that this is going to be a guy that brings in here. And if you give offensive talent, the offensive line talent inside now with Grubb, you will see Geno performing well inside a top 10 state as far as the quarterback play goes. And I, I don't know if at that point it'll just be people then saying, well, it's not even him. It's, it's the supporting cast. I'm guessing that's probably going to be the next turn of the coin that we're going to hear with this uh, when he does perform like that. But this kind of hire paired with a couple of offensive line bodies down there that are improvements from what you've had in the past and fit more to the mobile scheme that you're trying to um, put, put on display will bring out a better G Gino, in my opinion. Yeah, he says, I hate to be a wet blanket, but we're excited about Waldron, so I'm going to temper expectations. Truly, but kind of like I was saying, uh, Jose, with Waldron on that a bit, um, you in Waldron, while he didn't turn out to be a good candidate, it's also potentially a candidate there that was being encumbered by your coach. And your coach was saying, okay, we're not going to run the Rams offense. I'm going to have you run more of what my old offense is. I'm not going to let you throw to the middle of the field. I want you to hammer in the running game up the middle over and over constantly. And now if you don't have that coach in place here, if Waldron doesn't have that coach in place with Chicago, who's doing that to him, you may see the, the bright side of Waldron at that point. It's the great unknown, really. Good to see in the house, though, Jose. Face Joe Alt, 6'8", 315, runs a 4'9". He's also young, too. I think he's like 20, 21 years old. He's, he's maybe my best, the best left tackle prospect in the draft for me. I think his age is a big part of his upside. Yeah, Wicked Garden, I get where you're coming from, man. I know you're passionate on your take with Gino, but there's a lot of proof in there, and it's a little bit of the troubling game, I think, that we get to try to discuss, and I'm not going to get deep in the woods on Gino today. I'm not, but... It's the, it's the troubling part of the Geno discussion is you have one side of a Geno camp on this that are the pro side of the Geno camps that say, you know, we were told he is what he is. He can't bring you from behind. And it's like folks, folks like yourself with Garden a couple years ago would have said, well, Geno's value is this, that. He can make NFL throws, but he's not a good quarterback because he can't bring you from behind. He, four or five comebacks this year alone. Uh, so he, he throws that whole narrative out the door. You can't say that about him. Um, by PFF markers, he's a top Top 12, to, right on the edge of a top 10 quarterback this year. He was certainly last year. He's doing so without any kind of running game, with that uh, wicked, with all, with all of those offensive impediments I just talked about, right? You throw to the middle of the field at the 32nd rate in the entire NFL. You don't run fly sweeps. You don't attack with a running game to the edges. Dealing with that as well. Dealing with the 28th best pass protection in the entire NFL. And yet he still performed as he performed. So if he performed at that sub top 10 rate as it is now, you improve any of those markers. How is it not logically conclusive to say that he will improve with that? But again, I, I think quicker, and this is something I'll say with you too. I just, I think it's one where people are in the camp they're on on this. Um, and, and kind of neither side, I think needs, seems to understand the other side of it where they stand on it to the degree it seems as I look at it. But I can't quite get the other side of the anti-Geno camp because the past couple of the past two years have not been a representation of Geno Smith failing. And that seems to be a bit of the narrative that some of my fellow Seahawks faithful fans want to present to me. Because if you're telling me that Geno's sim simply just been here as a bridge quarterback or he's a jag, you're kind of telling me in certain ways he's kind of failed here as the, as the quarterback. And I don't know if I can see it in that same way. As I've said, with all those markers that, that I just spoke about, and I've, I've presented this to many people that are anti-Geno people, and I've yet to hear anybody present an answer that, that counters me saying this. A line that can't open any holes in a running game and is unimaginative as you will find in the NFL. A passing attack that throws at the 32nd rate in the NFL to the middle of the football field. Completely ignores the football field. By philosophy, by the coach's drive and the manner by which he wants to approach offensively. Maybe protecting him against turnovers, but not making them the most explosive or productive on that side of the ball. And then you're getting hammered, hammered at 20, to, at, with the 28th best pass, block, pass protection rate. Where you're having multiple games this year where over half of the snaps that you drop back, you're having pass rush win rates all across the board on the defensive line. Meaning guys are getting to you in under two and a half seconds. 
Yet, if you look at it, your sack rate is under top six in the league. Speaking to the quarterback's decision-making, speaking to his ability to get the ball out of his pocket and to avoid danger and avoid harm. As I've said, let's remove Geno from that. I put any quarterback in this league under those parameters. We're thinking that there's, there's a whole lot of other guys out there that are going to be successful with that, that aren't going to fall flat on their face and fail. Also adding one little extra item, by the way, which is a defense that spends three-fourths of the football game on the football field, meaning you also have to be maximally efficient as the quarterback of the Seahawks last season. Just all of that, you know, just that downward slide that's greased, greased up. I, I, that's the part where, as much as I, I understand the people on the anti geno foot, that's the part where I don't see any of that benefit of the doubt or that really looking through the details of it and the gaining the understanding. It'll come down to like, well, he just isn't that it guy. Well, he's just not that it is what he is what he is. It's a, well, he's a bridge guy. It's these, these phrases and things that they're talked about in regards to him that are just, they don't mean anything. There's nothing tangibly behind that. And I'm bringing you some tangibility on things that are backings to what I'm saying on why he deserves a little more benefit of the ballot, I think, from the fan base at times, from the folks that are so hard-lined on out on him. Not merely that they're kind of like, may. It's like just there's a ferocity to being out on him that I don't get with what he's done. And uh, it's, it's not easy finding quarterbacks. These, these things don't just grow on trees. They're tough. They're tough to find. But I, I mean, here some people talk about it. It's just like you figure we could just walk outside of our house, reach up and pluck it right off a branch. And Poop Dog says, you, you willing to pay $55 million if you want a quarterback with the it factor? There we go. Great point. Great point. See them Hawks and Wilson didn't play behind a terrible line most of his time here. But Wilson makes adjustments to what he has. Gino can't do that. All right, so I can counter that though. My my opinion is my countering of that that see the Hawks them see them Hawks is what Russell Wilson was always sacked at one of the highest rates in the entire NFL. Every year he was here behind those lines. I don't counter I, I don't push back on you at all about the terrible lines that he had to operate behind. But Russell Wilson also was one of the league leaders in holding the ball in the pocket longer than any quarterbacks during his time through that 10-year period as well. And that's going to lead to more sacks. The thing that I'm going to counter on you in the end of that, Wilson makes adjustments to what he has. Geno can't do that. I just presented the fact that you have the 28th worst pass protection in the NFL, meaning that a pass rush win rate under two and a half seconds, the pressure is getting there. The block has been blown. You have the 28th worst pass protection rate. So why I say Gino makes those adjustments, why I say he sees those blitzes, that you had an under six was your sack rate this year. So it, it, it presents that the quarterback's making really smart decisions under a lot of duress, which I, I'm not here to knock Wilson on this, but he took a lot of sacks. He held on to the ball for a long period of time. Those were not, that's not making adjustments. That was him trying to play magician in the, in the pocket, improvise. Uh, cool breeze of Gino has been uh, top eight to 12 the last two years with a stale scheme and a terrible offensive line. He could be more than serviceable with the proper scheme and decent offensive line. Amen. Hans, yes, Gino is that guy with just two years of NFL star starter mileage on the body. I'm with it. Card crazed. I think the Seahawks keep Gino one more year at least. IRC. He has two years left on his three-year contract, so we'll have to wait and see. That's, the, I think, the bottom line on this card, Grace. Is I think certainly this is a discussion maybe to come up next year for where we stand on it. If the cost is going to increase, if there's more of a decision about what we're doing with the contract. But right now, with the cost to eat the dead money and for where the play's been and for the potential upside this year, if some of these things can be addressed, I think you got to roll. Thomas, I feel Seattle will decide after the Super Bowl. Maybe at Dino's, they talked about it, but Schneider will look to see if teams are desperate to trade Geno. It's certainly possible. I don't have to see it, though, but it's possible. William Asapaco, go Hawks. How you doing, William?
a couple of deals here. Uh, Sanchez, thank you for the $5 donation. I appreciate you for that, Sanchez. He says, uh, tepid on Mike McDonald, even less thrilled about the two first-time coordinators. I'm going to need a bigger liver for next year. <laughs> well, thank you for the $5 donation. I'm sorry we do disagree on it. I love these. Uh, I do love all these hires. Um, I would love to hear where you'd like to have gone on this, Sanchez. If you guys, I'd like to hear from everybody. If, um, if you're not in on, on these hires here, which, which would have been an uh, alternative route you would have looked to go. Um, I'd certainly love to hear what, you know, maybe there's a, guys I'm not considering that would have been the better route here, but um, I think that they did, uh, I think they did pretty good with these. And there is a, the boomer bust factors there, Sanchez, you know, it's, it's got the, the potential for failure. It's got the potential for blowing the roof off. And I don't know if there's a much of a, the in between here uh, a little bit and how that they've set this up. The nice part, at least looks the coordinator hires. And if you're not in on these guys and, and liking what you're seeing from them is that with coordinator hires in the NFL, it's not like in the coaches where you've got to be married to them for a couple of years before you can start to make moves and move off of them. If, if there's a coordinator, you got to move off and go off of that doesn't work in a first year, then Bing, bang, boom, you make the move and, and get to somebody else. So, um, you know, it's, it's one that is, uh, that's why I say take the risk on it because it, it, you don't have to marry yourself to it doesn't work out. And I like taking the big swing, you know, but uh, hopefully they can uh, save your liver next year, Sanchez. And uh, it can all, you see the, the plan will work just beautifully and wonderfully. <laughs> hopefully so. Thank you, brother. Appreciate the fiver. Uh, John M429, thank you for the $5 donation. Just got to say, with all the coaches, hires, my level ex of excitement for next year is off the charts. Good or bad, I'm excited to see how it all looks. It's going to, as I say, be cutting edges, both sides of the ball, which will be a funner brand of football to at least watch on the surface of things. It doesn't mean immediate success. It doesn't mean ultimate success. But it does mean that you can see them moving towards trying to be something that's well, lack of a better term, uh, modernized on both sides of the football. And I think that they're going to accomplish that this season, at least in trying to get those instilled. And we'll see if it takes a long period of time, if they're able to get it right on board really quick. Certainly with um, Grubb in Washington, he didn't seem to take a long period of time to get that offense cooking or as an OC there with Fresno State when he took over those duties, didn't get, take a long time to get that offense cooking. So you could say he's got maybe a natural touch and feel for what he needs to be doing there as a, a coordinator to, to get this set up and get this rolling quick and good. But uh, I'm with you. My excitement is off the charts. The things that I've called for for years on this channel and talked about ad nauseum on this stream over and over again, a modernized forward-thinking approach, uh, schemes that seek to take advantage of their players' abilities to the utmost instead of just slamming them headlong into your scheme, into your system, and forcing them into just, this is what we do, you know? More of a, let's, let's, go, let's go hog wild. Let's be a little more open to some other variety of ideas. Let's be open just to the bottom line of, I got this player here who does this and who does that and who does this. How do I take advantage of that skill set to its utmost? And uh, you have coaches now here that seem to have a lot more of that outlook in their, in their thinking. And uh, that gets me very, very excited for the future. And I feel like you get to being a great, a great team or you get to being a contending team. It's on the back of making a lot of really good decisions you keep stacking up. I think these are good hires. I think this has been a good, good decision making throughout the offseason from both the front office and ownership. And I think that this, in my opinion, will ultimately lead to the team finding a uh, better, higher rung of success than we've had here in the, at least the last seven, eight years. And that does, like you, John, get me excited off the charts. Nick Craig, Gino has been top 10 in PFF two years in a row. Look at the top 10 quarterback contracts. You won't find Gino. Bingo. Bang for the buck. Just another place where uh, it's hard to find much, you know, argument there for what he brought part of what i loved about gino is he came back in and gave you a very player-friendly contract and what he signed but at a place where there's not a lot of not a lot of um benefit in the doubt and wicked i know i can definitely see wicked you can proclaim that you believe that gino's a waste and that he's this and he's that and you're making magnanimous statements that, that you feel are fact now, what I'd ask you to do is just back it up. What is, the, what is your backing to that? Is it just your personal eye test and look? Or is it actually something that you can, you can speak to tangibly like we've spoken to a little bit 
on what it is that why we have in our minds he's in this place as a quarterback, where he's at this spot in our head. Um, I'm open to being sold to your side of things wicked, like I'm sure many people are in here in the chat. But it's got to be on the back of a well, strongly placed argument. And if you're just saying magnanimous statements that you believe to be fact without putting any backing behind what you're saying, just this is what I think. I don't know if you're, you're really bringing anybody over to what you think. You might stir up people's passion for it and get into some maybe lively debate with from their perspective, but you're, there's not a lot you're giving us back to the other side when you say that stuff. I mean, I get that you feel that way. It's clear as a, clear as a bell. Now, how do you build your argument on that? How do you, how do you build that up? That's why I say I don't know where we can go on this Gino discussion if the other side of it just wants to make statements about, you know, uh, Gino sucks. Okay, let's have a discussion. No, Gino sucks. Let's talk about the past. Gino sucks. Okay, but the lack of... Gino sucks. Not the guy. Okay, but um, the scheme, they don't throw the mail. doesn't matter. He's just garbage. All right. Where do we go from on there? Like in your mind, where, where do you where do you where do you run next to on that as far as conversation? Like, okay, <laughs> you you can you converted everybody with that one. Brian Myers, Jason Lock and Fora would not stop praising the hire of McDonald, Grand Slam hire. I could see an insider connected to the league. Here's scuttlebutt from every different direction. From a variety of different sources and uh, i think that there's in the nfl when they look at these hires you know uh, same maybe there's some some tornness here within the hawk fan base a little bit but without nationally when they look at these hires these are not looked at as dumb hires they're not waking up out there in san francisco going oh seattle seattle did stupid things with their head coaching search today and with their offensive coordinator hire and uh I think that that is a little bit from a representation of unbiased a bit sources on this, that we are doing this stuff smartly and that you can, whether you agree with the signing or not, that you can see that there's a smart process that brought them to put this staff together from the head coach on down. Haley says, I, uh, I like Drew Locke more than Gino, FYI. I think he has a massive upside in the right system. I just also know that Gino's ha Gino has set a very high bar. And people don't respect that. I, that's the way I feel with this too. Um, I'm not even a guy to say I'm looking at Gino to be a guy for us into the future or that I think we have to ride with him. We should ride with him until he's 40 years old. Um, it's just that like you, it's, I see the, a bit of the discrepancy between performance on the field from the opinion I hear from the fan base on him. And I don't, I, I don't always understand why. And that's why I pick on the conversations with folks that I'm disagreeing with on this is I'm truly trying to get beneath the surface. I, I, I got the surface of he sucks. He ain't the guy. He is what he is. I, Pick all of your, the, the words that they say in that way that are all meaning the same stuff. Like that's, we're on that surface. Let's peel that back. And now let's get down a little bit to the depth of the argument a bit. Um, what, what do we mean by that? How, how do, how is that representative on the field? You know, well, they, they go, they'll say, well, is he skittish? And well, he's skittish, but they just said he's in a pass protection 20 at a time. That's going to make a lot of quarterbacks skittish, right? The fact that he's not getting sacked, the fact that he doesn't have a huge bad turnover rate fight the fact that he's under that onslaught. I mean, take the Cowboys game as just a representation. Every drive in that game, you start out from the 25-yard line. Every drive that game is a long field. That, that whole game, he's got over 54% of pressure rate in his face, including when there's, he's trying to get him down at the end of the game and you've got Micah Parsons unblocked by Waldron's beautiful scheme. And he's got him hitting him in his face in two seconds. There's nothing that Geno can do. Like he still puts you touchdown drive after touchdown drive after touchdown drive against one of the better defenses in the entire NFL in that game in Dallas. Give me an equi equivalent argument. If you're an anti geno guy, give me the equivalent argument to just what I represented there. Don't speak to some vagaries. Give me something, give me something specific with some teeth in it. Teeth. Brian says, very good chance Locke will not be here once he gets a free agent offer. Hawks more than likely won't match. Agreed. And this is why I also think they're going to go to the young quarterback. They will draft a guy, I think, because then you can not only potentially get a guy who might be there, earmarked to be your quarterback of the future, but also a cheaper guy. Haley says, uh, people said Gino was a bad quarterback, career backup, so he wasn't. Locke just needs the right opportunity. 
yeah, I'm not, I'm okay with the potential of Locke too. I do think Gino's at a higher spot than he is, but there's some potential with Locke and he's a much younger guy. Gino had a lot longer time to mold himself into the player that he's become, you know, uh, as he was waiting on that bench and waiting his opportunity. Thomas Cox, I'm guessing T. Martin was one, but Dan Vine said hiring assistant coaches is less restrictive than hiring head coaches. Wicked says, Gino's decision-making and confidence severely regressed last year. Some of that was O-line, but mostly it's on him. So why wouldn't it Wicked Garden be, when you say re regressed, it regressed in the way that you feel like his decision-making should have been better against 28th pass protection? Isn't that kind of a symptom then of any quarterback that you put behind league worst pass protection is going to eventually be led to regressing? is eventually going to be led to not always making the best decisions. And even in those lack of decisions, he's not taking sacks and he's not being one of the more higher turnover worthy quarterbacks in the league. So what, what is the, the, your, your stance on that is then I could take a, a, even let's just say another top 10 quarterback or a sub top 10 quarterback like a Derek Carr and put him in that situation. You think a Derek Carr is going to overtake what Geno did last year or a Kyler Murray? Or a Dak Prescott, who I think had nearly three Pro Bowlers blocking for him last year for what he was able to do. Or Jalen Hurts. And we can go through a, a variety of quarterbacks here, but I mean, I think there's very few and far between. I like that you're giving me a point here because that's what I'm looking for on this card. So, but now, who's the quarterback that's doing that? Is it your belief that you can go find 10 to 15 of those guys that would be under that kind of thing? And is it not... Uh, thinking from your standpoint, then that once you get him those items, that he'll be able to perform much better. The first 12 games of the year and the first start that he first, not less last year, but the year before that Geno started, he had that protect, that pass protection. It just went awful by the end of the year. But remember through those first 12 games, when he first started out, he was playing like a top five quarterback. When you gave him that pass protection, when he had a running game, he played like a top five quarterback. When all of that slipped into the tank, from game 12 onwards of last year through this most of this whole year, that's when you saw this, this I guess what you're terming the regression. So then how do we not logically then think that if I can clean that thing up, I'll get back to that other former prior play. That's all I'm, that's all I'm taking it with, you know? Mark says, I bet they offered Drew 10 million with bonus or goals. I think he gets it maybe on the open market, maybe. I don't know if we'll have the money to offer him that mark with Geno's $31 million hit because then you'd offer, you know, then it's another 10 on top of that. You're putting 40 to the position, which is part of what I think they signed the Geno deal was to get the bit of the discount at that spot. I know 31 for some people's more like, oh, 31. But remember that the high water mark in this league now is going to be 60 million per. So it's, you know, quarterbacks are just overpaid in general. <laughs> the bottom line on that. Brian Myers, thank you for the $10 donation. He says, uh, Brandon, quick notes on how Grubb will need to adjust his offense to the NFL. Thanks. Um, well, the wide hash marks allow you to spread guys out a little bit extra at the college level in a way that you can't necessarily always as easily spread guys out at the, at the pro level. So he's going to have to probably find a time, some creative ways to get those same spread concepts, to get the Essentially, the spread concepts with wanting to run the ball into light boxes, you know, you spread defenders out because they're covering out in space away from the box. You have less defenders down there now. You get a hat on a hat. There's more space for running backs to work. There's less piles of bodies down there to have to navigate through. But how do you do that? How do you, how do you pull that through? Um, I don't think that this is going to be as much of a steep learning curve for Grubb to go in this way, though, Brian, because typically spread concepts don't have as much of the built-in shot plays, uh, don't have as much of the commitment to running the football, don't have the creative running commitment, the, the pulling of linemen, the, the different type of play, running, running plays that they can run at you, you know, from counters to powers to uh, traps, everything in between. I mean, they're, he'll use the whole running game kind of skill set to roll at you. Um, the bubble screen game like, like San Francisco, um, you know, they throw a screen once every eight passes. Well, I mean, it does seem like if I was to think about the Niner offense in my head, it feels like about once every eight passes, you're getting some kind of screen. 
be it a bubble screen or just a typical screen. So I don't know if that's something that you need to change. And with him, Brian, because he doesn't lean on what you might typically have with the spread concepts being the hurry up and let's go, 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 the Chip Kelly style of, of offense, he's willing to, you know, eat that clock, the, the sugar huddles, you know, where you just, you, you come up and it's a lot of the quarterback just come with the line of scrimmage and diagnosing and, and trying to figure out where he wants to go with the ball. So um, I don't think that there's really going to be a lot there that he's going to need to adjust. Um, the only thing that could come into an exception of this is if you're not able to get the mobile lineman in here this off season, where then now he's got to find a little bit better ways of getting it done without the guys that might be able to move in space. But um, I don't think uh, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of a steep learning curve there, Brian, with what the system he runs because these concepts are being utilized at the pro level, and it it wasn't just him. You know, there's some spread concepts, Brian, that'll lean heavily on just that that wide hash mark and then having that real you, know, you can stack the offense to this side of the field to the near and then you got all that space over there to the far and then you're just using and operating your whole playbook off the far hash he doesn't do that he goes to both both edges of the defenses because a lot of it times he's you know for instance with a running game he's trying to hit to where you're light a little bit where he's got a little bit of an extra man advantage so to speak i think it'll be pretty pretty similar at first blush. I'll be diving a little more into his offense, obviously over the course of the next week here, Brian, and, and getting a little bit more of an understanding of what he brings in full to play. But I think even the trick plays, I think you can still utilize that. There are teams all the way around the league that still utilize those. And I think that there's a lot of like Detroit, for instance, has shown you, you can run almost once one trick play a game and it can be very effective for an offense. Uh, you don't have to run it a lot, but if the if the defense knows you're fully willing to go to it once a game, and then if they don't play it legit, if that single high safety doesn't stay back there in center field, and he comes down to the running game, and then you beat him up over the top. Remember last year, Devin Witherspoon, first game of the year against that Detroit team. Remember the big play that he gave up in that game was on a flea flicker play where he's coming up. They know he wants to be a help defender in the run game, and that he wants to come up there, and especially the way now you ask your corners to tackle and your your secondary to tackle like never before. These guys want to come up and tackle and then bang, you got them up over the top. So now you force them to stay on top and you force to take that. It's a, again, just a, what you're trying to do is keep those boxes light. Keep, allow your backs a lot of room and space. Hasn't it always felt like in the last couple of years in our running game, everything gets so congested. And part of that is the onus on our offense to hammer the A gap runs and the B gap runs over and over again. Uh, part of that is just also defenses collapsing down in there. But part of that is that the extra defenders you would get down near the line of scrimmage, especially last year with some of those stack fronts that we would engage with. And if you got the spread concepts, you pull some of those stack boxes out a little bit and simplify some things down the line, I think, for quarterbacks and their reads as well with that. But um, no, I think he'll be pretty, pretty much similar on this to what he's been, Brian, in my opinion, at first blush. But I appreciate you, man. Very kind of you for the $10 donation. Uh, Snail, thank you for the $5 donation. Are you concerned that the Grubs offense didn't target the middle of the field at UW? Do you expect that to change now with the Hawks? Well, it's a little bit less of an onus, I think, when you're um, when you're running so much screen as he is, and then you've got those hash marks a little wider. You can lean on that a little bit. I, I would be a little bit worried with it if we're not going to target a little bit more to the middle of the field. Um, some of that was too, just I think you're you're leaning on where your talent's at. You know, McMillan was beat up and injured. That would be a little bit more of your, your your intermediate middle of the field guy they could utilize last year. And he was really not at 100% health, it felt like, through most of the year. And both with Polk and with uh, Odunzie, those to me were just kind of outside guys. And you had so many throws with those guys that you just felt like you could just throw trust throws up to. That, and the offense was so efficient in doing that snail, right? It wasn't like they were throwing those nine routes and they'd complete like one and eight. And you go, well, okay, you guys are throwing these, but they're, it's almost like it was just about like stealing every time they could take it like candy from a baby um, when they would go to those some of those throws at times with the matchups they would get. So I think that that also pulled a little bit of the throws out of the middle of the field and they didn't have as necessarily as the dynamic tight end talent. Uh, Westover was really good. I like him a lot and I, I wouldn't mind if our Hawks could find a way to grab that guy. Maybe even just he's such a gamer, that kid. But um yeah, I, we got to get back to targeting the middle of the field here. That's That's got to be a place. And maybe with a little bit of that, not having the hash mark advantage to work with a bit, that forces you to do that. Different talent forces you to do that. But um, it's worth noting, Snail. It's definitely worth noting. Thank you, man. Appreciate you for the donation. Uh, Mumbles, thank you for the uh, $5 donation. 
I'm just saying, Chip Kelly would have been a killer head coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, would have killed the roster. Chip Kelly, I thought they were targeting in on him. That's why I did that show a couple days ago. I wasn't trying to do that for clicky bait or anything. I thought with the uh, candidate list getting so low and with them seemingly at that time appearing to maybe move on from Grub that uh, here we go, you know, that this, this is the record we're going to get the Chip Kelly experience. And that would have been a wild experience because he is a guy that, you know, I don't think, he, while he had the four running defense 10 years ago, um, that defense is needed to have its own adjustments. Like I say with anything else, it could be a Carroll's defense. It could be a Vic Fangio's defense. It could be this old Buddy Ryan defense. It could be the offensively the same kind of thing. You always have to keep evolving. It can't be what you've been before. But how are, you, how are you accommodating and adjusting to the changes within the sport? Understanding that within the sport of football, it's so unique first to me, baseball or basketball, where those sports move more like an iceberg on the ocean. Whereas in football, it just seems like almost every five years, you're, just, you're seeing a reinvention at times in the way things are looked at and how coaches and teams approach things uh, philosophy-wise. And it just seems to be speeding up all that much more. So with Kelly's system, you know, he's gotta, he had to adjust it. He needed those updates. He didn't have, for instance, as much of the, the shot plays built in that we've seen with Grubb and how he's adjusted with the spread. You know, he's, he still leaned a little on the run in the somewhat fast at times and keeping the up, you know, keep, keep moving the speeds going and all that. But where can you find the adjustments? You know, where can you find the changes? I think there's a little more diversification in a uh, Grubb running scheme, for instance, than you see in a Chip Kelly. But Chip would have been wild, Mumbles. It would have been exciting. And boy, you talk about a divisive hire. <laughs> you, you'd have some, you'd have some very passionate, passionate takes on that one. Not for sale. Thank you for the five dollar donation. It says Brando, what up? It feels like a fresh new start. Yes, it does. I love how you put that fresh new start. Sad Pete had to go, but it seems like you got to evolve every seven to ten years in the NFL. Just what I'm talking about. Just what I'm talking about. And it is sad to see Pete go. And it's, I, I, I love Pete. I will always revere him. I'm not gonna. Where I can, I'm not going to talk about Pete, but in anything but glowing terms from what, you know, he did to the team, but it still is at the forefront right now because this decision just did just come down the last month and a half. Um, and then that's at the, that's at the forefront of it uh, for sale is you, you, Pete went through this 10 year period and there were minor, minor adjustments, but you had to make major adjustments and the willingness just wasn't there to take it all the way to that point. It was, it was a, okay, I guess I need to do it. I don't want to though. And that's why we stand where we stand here today is that you had to then go to the fresh start because the, the old would not take on the fresh and every coach in this league's got to do that. It's, it's your, it's got to be your requirement. And this is where the game's going. And those coaches that want to live long and prosper and, and have a, a three decade career in this league as a head coach are going to be those that, that find that adjustment and those that want to stay stilted and, you know, it's hard. It's not easy to move in off of an approach that's worked so well for you. But I think it's where the, the game's at right now. And um, I'm excited about it, not for sale. I think most of the fans are, are as well, like you are. It's great. Some great hirings. Uh, long live the king. Thank you for the $2 donation. Man, can you do the angry anti-Gino fan again? <laughs> Oh, uh, I forget what I was doing. <laughs> what was I? What was I doing? <laughs> I go on some rants, King. I don't know. I I black out sometimes on some of these. <laughs> uh, and anti Geno folks gotta understand too. I've I've heard it every stream for two straight years, so it's it is partially setting in a PTSD thing on me too. Where I'm like, oh my goodness, this again, you know, this again, again. And I am not saying yes, sir. I want another. <laughs> thank you, King. I appreciate it. A mumbles. Thank you for the five dollar donation. Says Gino ain't got the moves like Jagger. I said the moves like Jagger. The moves like Jagger. No, he doesn't move like he doesn't move like Jagger. That's true. He is missing some of that. And that is, and that is, in that mixed move. Stop it. Uh. 
Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger. Thank you, Mumbles. Appreciate the double dono dip, brother. That's very kind of you. Very kind of you, and I do appreciate all the support, folks. Uh, Sanchez coming in with a big $10 dono drop. Thank you, Sanchez. Appreciate you. Says, I'm not out on McDonald. Just not ready to crown him Bill Belichick 2.0. Wanted a season, uh, wanted a seasoned offensive coordinated offensive coordinator to alleviate some of the head coaching pressure. Uh, Frank Reich, uh, Chip Kelly would have been my preference. Oh, okay. I completely down the line, fair points. Um, McDonald's now the youngest coach in the NFL. He's never done it before as a, co- a head coach ever at any level. To your point, Sanchez. So, you know, there's, that's where I do say the, the bum, while I'm excited, I, I certainly am caught up right now in the bliss of the boom, the bust possibility of McDonald and these hirings are certainly as ever present there than it would be if you had gone with other directions. If you had brought in a uh, Mike Rabel, probably a little more certain about certainty about what you're, exi- you know, going to get as far as the floor goes. Um, and, uh, I, same thing you could maybe say a little bit with the, the potential of bringing in, um, one of those two guys. Um, the Frank one, I just wonder about with if he really wanted to, I put myself in Frank's shoes and I just go, got a tough couple of years in Indianapolis, never given the QB. Then you go to Carolina, not, QB doesn't really work, situation doesn't really work. You're kicked out before you even get through half a year. You know, do you really want to go jump to go be an OC at this point? I mean, maybe for the love of the game. I suppose he might be willing to do that. Um, but I mean, even from Frank Reich's perspective, it's like, he kind of knows his future, like I think Brennan said about this, where you're going to be a, probably a OC for the rest of your life now. There's not probably another chance you're going to get as a head coach. So, you know, slow to maybe embrace that as a reality of life a little bit. But those are all, uh, all fair points. Getting an OC to alleviate the pressure of a, a first-time head coach and a guy that is not learning and finding his way, I'm with that. I certainly wanted to make sure minimum on this Sanchez that we did have a guy that had called plays before and that had that background, that this was going to be the first time, the first game that he was going to be calling plays was here with the Seahawks. Um, I didn't want that at all. So um, I think that's fair. All that's completely fair. And, and I wouldn't have been, if they had gone those other approaches there, Sanchez, I, I wouldn't have been screaming and shouting angry. I wouldn't have been screaming and shouting angry with the enemy. I think even a guy with the enemy maybe gives you a, the high floor part thing that you get with him a bit. Um, where you where you question can he get you to the to the roof but i do like roof i do like upside and the one thing i think you would agree with me on this sanchez is that both of them um, being the offensive coordinator and and uh grub in particular are high upside guys i'll, I'll grant the bus factors there too no doubt i won't i won't over overlook that but uh the boom is also there as well and if the boom hits with both sides of the ball and it hits at both sides of the ball at the same time well it's like we've said throughout the course of this whole year man can we just get one damn game where both the offense and the defense can play good? How awesome would that be? But you know what else is awesome about Sanchez? All your donos. You're dropping two others here. I appreciate that, man. Very, very nice of you. Uh, Sanchez says, I don't care about the Super Bowl. I want to see Russ cut next week. <laughs> Boy, uh, wild to watch the Denver Broncos, isn't it? Sanchez twisting and turning in the wind with this Russ situation, and and well, maybe we'll, you know, I mean, we threw him under the bus, but uh, you know, we're not saying we want him gone. We just threw him under the bus because he was in the way of the bus, and you throw people go under the bus sometimes when they're in front of the bus. You know, they're over there like picking they're they're peeling rust back off the off the street like here we go upsy daisy no no it's okay we really i i'm sorry i'm sorry about that i just just no we're we're fine paying the money we're fine paying the money hey, give me a break i've never seen a team try harder to drum up trade <laughs> trade interest <laughs> seriously a seventh we'll do a seventh but he is ours right now. I mean, we might, we maybe, we won't, we might. We're probably not, but we could. I mean, there's no way it happened, but we might keep him on the roster. But no, no, there's no, yes, a little bit, maybe. Holy hell, that, that organization. You made your move. You made your bed. You, you chose your path with it. You know, you stomped on kid. Like, <laughs> you, you, you went dark. Don't be, don't be coming out and don't be coming out into church the next day after what you did last night. I'm trying to say, bless me, Father. 
Own it, Denver. Own it. Lisa Max says, I think the offensive line is more important than the D-line. That's where I'm at right now myself. That's where I'm at myself. Snail says, B as a mechanic, I hope Grub is more like a hydrogen car, not electric. Electric cars are a gimmick and won't last. That's true. They're having a little bit of a hard, hard road at the moment, Snail. That's that's for sure. I think he was meaning in, in more in the philosophy behind the electric car. You know what I mean? Tommy says, Pumpkin on the phone with Bama fans who have questions about how coaches can do this to them. <laughs> They've never had to feel the transfer board before. Alabama's getting a little sore, huh? I mean, that fan last night put this wiki thing up, circus clown, huh? I like how they had to bump themselves up at the end too. And they're like, Ryan Gloves is an American football coach and circus clown who is the offensive coordinator for the Hawks instead of the NFL's minor league program, Alabama. <laughs> oh, roll tide. I could get Pumpkin in here. Pumpkin! Pumpkin! Get in here! Card crazed, Hawks test. What about the rumors of trading for Justin Fields? Any iota of truth to it? I, I mean, I've heard people, I feel like card crazed on this, a little bit of putting two and two together. So I, there's an acknowledgement here that despite whatever Chicago's told us or they're trying to publicly put out on the face of it, that they're going to take Caleb Williams and they're going to move Justin Fields. And so then teams, people go around the league and they look at teams that are potentially ones that would jump on Justin and that'd be the landing zone for. So I, I think that there's a little bit of this just, well, there's this collection of teams that could be looking for a quarterback. So how about this? I, I, it's not out of possibility of happening. It could possibly happen. I card craze when it comes down to this though, you, you don't have, if he comes in here and has a really good year, you're paying him after one season. And you're, you're going to be paying him up 55, 60 million a year if he comes in and has a really good year for you, which doesn't appeal to me personally. So you're not getting any cheap club control. You're going to have to trade a pick for him and it's likely going to be like the equivalent of a second round pick. So two third rounders or, you know, you're moving around on the first round and then giving him a set. Like you're going to have to give him some pretty good draft capital for that one year of control. I don't know where it makes any sense for it to happen. I don't know if I've heard anything that really tangibly makes me feel like these rumors have any kind of truth to them. But I've heard them. I have seen them. Thomas says, Brandon, I'm sorry, Gino is in top 10. It could show the opposite when it comes to running Grubb's offense. Yes, Gino could ascend, but based off his age, JS may want to want a younger quarterback to grow with the team. Yeah, I've, I've definitely said, I, I don't think that Thomas... Gino is your long, long-term quarterback necessarily here. But for the foreseeable for future, yeah. And I don't think that they're, they're precluded from um, taking a quarterback in the second round. The tough part I have with the conversation on this one, Thomas, and the, the reason it does get exhausting for me is that you, you post in there, okay, he's not, he isn't top 10, but he is top 10 by basically any metric you want to use over the past couple of years. So when somebody comes in and says, well, Gino's not top 10, you're kind of telling me then, well, I base that he's not top 10 on my own personal, where I kind of slot them chart thing. And that's, I, 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 that's where, again, I come back to, we talk about having discussion back and forth about opinion and what's not opinion. It's hard to have much to go back off of that if it's just kind of, well, I just base this off my personal feel for it. I'm not devaluing that. I'm not trying to, to crap on that, but it's, it's also like, but that doesn't really, when I have one side that presents all this data and information and says, on top of what you've got from comeback victories and all that's been put on upon him, upon the failing defense, the failing scheme, the lack of throwing the middle of the field. I, I could, we go through all of these points that we bring up. There's no counterpoints really other than just kind of just, well, by my gut eye instinct, here's what I see. And as I say, there's value into that, but I never will only solely put value into that from just an individual per basis. I think you've got to lean back on this other stuff as well so that we, you get the full clear picture of what every player is dealing with in any situation. And that's the hard part for me on having this debate, Thomas, is that there's just not a lot on the other side of it to really pick from as far as understanding your guys on that perspective and understanding of it. 
When I have a quarterback dealing with all that, when I have a quarterback under the 28th worst pass protecting unit in football for the past two years, not just this year, but last year as well, quarterbacks don't flourish in those circumstances. Quarterbacks don't do well in those circumstances. Quarterbacks oftentimes and more often than not fail in those circumstances. So the fact that he's been able to perform at this mark under those circumstances should be for folks looking at this going, wow, he's been, he's been a good thing for us. He's been a helpful part of this team. He's aided us along. I shouldn't be jumping at the bit to find a way to where we can replace this given guy. And that's all been my point on this is not about him being the future of the position, but just the, the respect of what he's done. And, and they're just, it just seems like from people's standpoint, he hadn't done jack crap. He's been basically sub bad almost, or he's been just uh, passable. And it's like the, the statistics don't add up on that. Uh, for you guys that might feel this way as you do at this point with Gino, you feel it, but there's not really a lot statistically that you can, you can point to on this that adds that up to me. And that's what gets frustrating is I'm trying to understand your guys' side of this. And I keep coming back to so just kind of, just sort of my feeling on it. Okay, you know. The, the, the pass protection is not my feeling on it, you know. The, the lack of willingness to throw the middle of the field is not my feeling on it. You know, it's, it's common knowledge understanding. You, 32nd in the NFL at throwing at the middle of the football field. 32 NFL teams, you throw to the middle of the football field at the least amount. That doesn't make the quarterback position harder to play. There's, there's no... That doesn't affect it at all. Quarterback should just slide right past that. Just glide on past that, like float on high right over the top of that. Like, no, it's no thing. I'll stay on, I'll stay on the outside of the hashes all day. Hard to understand. That's why I do get to on this where I just go, man, the anti-Geno folks, I'm going to reach a point where just, I can't do the Geno talk much more. There's just nowhere to go with it anymore, I think, on it. I know it's, it's a hot button topic and people really want to hammer it and hammer it and hammer it and hammer it. But I... I, I I, I've tried like hell for two years to scratch, scratch this potential, this scratch and sniff sticker, and I'm getting no sniff. It's all scratch and no sniff. Pulse info: Wild run let Gino down last year. Had zero consistency in play calling and failed to utilize our stars. Amen. One of the reasons that you have uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba when they're asking him about what Chicago's getting him going, I don't know. Uh, is this live? Jeff Smith, Gino has been very good. I think Pete prevented the OC from calling certain plays. The theme runs through all of Pete's OCs. Amen. That's the connection I often make when we take this back to how Pete controls his OC, how he controls the offenses. The, the throwing to the middle of the field is not a Waldron thing. Waldron's background comes from the Rams. The Rams throw at the middle of the football field as much as anybody in football. For him to go to one team that throws in the middle of the football field as much as anybody, to go to one of the teams that throws the foot middle of the football field as much as, as the least amount in the NFL doesn't add up, right? It speaks to maybe there's a coach in there that's inhibiting that, right? And could it be a defensive head coach inhibiting that? Because certainly you're not going to have an offensive mind who says, hey, let me cut off half the field just for arbitrary reasons. Great point, Jeff. Great point. Wicked, part of that 28th pass block rate is Gino holding onto the ball, not stepping up and seeing ghosts. No, the pass block rate weight is based on pass block win efficiency, Wicked Garden, which is under two and a half seconds. That's how it's evaluated. It's, Gino was not one of the, no, Gino was not one of the guys holding the ball with the longest in the league. Again, there's no statistical, there's, there, you can go look up the stats on who held the ball longest in the league. Gino was not one of the high watermark guys in holding the ball. It's not, there's no backing to that. Ryan says, most different O-line combos of any team in the league. Put that in front of any other quarterback and he will have the difficulties as Geno. Amen. I, it's that part I'd speak to where you got to understand when we talked to that of how impactful this is to a quarterback's play when he's inundated by pressure constantly. It's, there comes a point where it becomes incredibly hard to play the position. And there also becomes a cumulative effect of this when you're dealing with it week after week or for a couple of years straight. It starts to influence the way the quarterback plays on top of it. But as I said, I just don't think that there's anywhere I'm getting with this one on this with the folks that don't believe it.
Hans says, Gino has the least sacks per pressure ratio in the NFL is what you're saying. Thank you, Hans. You did it much better than I did on that one. Exactly. Gavin Gardner, all of that plus Gino still performs in the top half of the league starters on a really fair contract. He doesn't deserve the hate he gets from fans. Again, you guys are succinctly putting this so much better than I, Gavin Hans, on the, in the chat and what I'm trying to say with this. That's what I'm trying to say. It ain't about me trying to be a fanboy of Gino or be a Gino stan or to say Gino is the, the promise and the, the, the promise foretold, the prince that was promised. I'm simply saying he's played the position really well under a lot of duress. The future is going to be very bright for him if we can start to remove some of those things that have been really inhibiting parts to playing the position for any quarterback. And that, that gets me really excited for his future here. And then in the, in the, the foreseeable future, not in the long-term future, but he's just right coming up into the next year, for instance. And uh, yeah, again, good job. Put, great way of putting it, guys. Much more succinct than I am. Haley says, Russell Wilson play, played behind one of the best offensive lines in the league last season, but still was one of the most sacked last season. Sounds like he made his own problems. Great points. Great points. Gunny says, I was initially against this, but if we can trade down, uh, drop Drew Locke and drop Michael Penix in the later rounds to be the understudy of Gino would actually be nice in the long run. Drew Locke's going to be a Gunny, uh, a free agent. So he has kind of, he can go anywhere this off season, but Michael Penix certainly with this new offensive coordinator is going to be in the, uh, in the crosshairs as potential. And it's going to be looked at it quite a bit. Space says, why does our defense play 40 minutes a game? Because it plays a bend but don't break methodology that allows teams to slowly bleed them up the football field and work, work clock over and over. Uh, that they're, they don't have pressure packages, haven't had pressure packages on third down, even third and longs that allow teams even on third and longs, which should be low conversion rates to be much higher conversion rates against our defense. Nick Guzman, I, I hope the football gods, Penix is gone by 16. I'm really sick of people wanting him. Yeah, I don't think it's still likely, even though it is maybe just a hair more possible with with Grub here, I think to your point, Nick, I just think he will be gone by the time we're taking 16. A millet, 06. I love McDonald. Haven't even seen him coach yet, but wanted him like a month before we got him. I love him, man. There was a lot of folks like yourself, very hot to trot on him early in this process. Got to give credit to my, my Hawk fans out there. Um, I wanted him on my list, but he certainly wasn't my highest, but some of you had him right as your highest top guy and, and really, really were locking it on this guy. I think even the Kansas City game, just for some of you that were in that role, like that reinforced it in. And uh, props to you guys. You, you were definitely out ahead of this one in, uh, in, spotting, uh, in spotting him for being the candidate uh, he was. A Rain Crow Film LLC says no to Penix, though I hope somebody will take a chance on him, keep him healthy. Where that's going to be his biggest thing for him. I have no doubt Penix can do everything you need him to do at the NFL level from make the throws to process in the pocket to lead the team. Um, he's got all, he checks all those boxes. Um, even the mobility will be fine, but he's got to go to a team that protects him, that doesn't have him with 28 worth pass protection, for instance. And uh, that's going to be, I think, a big part of what will dictate, determine his success or not. Tommy, I'm totally on. Uh, I'm totally in on these hires because I trust John when it comes to scouting, and I know he did a very thorough job. He didn't settle for anyone. We could have had other higher-profile guys. It's part of what I love about it too, Tommy, and what they've done here is they didn't take a quick process to this. They didn't feel hurried. They took a nice, slow roll process of making sure they were going to get this right, and I think that that's going to bear out to them the best candidates from this process. And um, you know, doesn't guarantee success, but I think it takes you much closer to that place of getting as close to that as you can when you undertake that kind of process like they've done. Card crazed. I don't see why people are so hyped on Penix. I don't watch college football, but 
what I caught of the national championship, he looked average. It probably wasn't the best game to probably have him featured card crazed. And he is playing against in Michigan, maybe the best defense in all of college football last year, the Mike McDonald defense, uh, actually. So um, that's a little bit to take into account. Um, and again, didn't play his best game. But uh, if, if you watch some of the other games that he's played and, and look at what he's put up from a production standpoint, um, he's not doing on the back of a spread-based concepts where he's just dinking and dunking. You know, he's putting big-time throws up across the board. He's processing in the pocket. He's showing off a, a plus NFL arm, a strong NFL arm. Uh, and he's going to run. He was the fastest guy, card crazed, the senior bowl, hitting up over 19 miles an hour on the football field. So he's also going to be a guy that's going to probably run somewhere between four five to four six on, on at the combine. Um, so he's got a lot of bar, another guy, a lot of boxes he checks that's going to push him up into that range. Um, on top of being a winner and what losing like what one two games last couple of years something like that. So he's a fun guy to watch on tape. Got a couple donations here. Let me hit this on up. Robert Landon, thank you for subscribing to the channel, Robert. I do appreciate you for doing that. And that is really kind of you folks for uh, jumping aboard over there on that. Uh, Dave Wolf, thank you as well for uh, coming aboard here onto the Hawks Nest, Dave. Appreciate you for that. Sanchez, thank you again for all those donations, brother. Russell will be cut. Make no mistake about it. Denver's can play all this little game they want to play, but they're going to end up cutting him when it's all said and done. Jay Stern, thank you for the $5 donation. He says, uh, Bama fans don't get their way for once and they lose their effing minds. <laughs> yeah. I like seeing the bitterness. Just speaks to how good of a coach they know we got, in my opinion. But yeah, you guys got to ride high on the hog for quite a bit of time. You know what I mean? You can sit in the back seat for a little while now. You got to ride shotgun for a bit. Now you can chill. You still got the boar. I'm sure he'll make a good signing out there, good hiring out there. I mean, he was the guy that elevated Grub up from offensive line coach to OC. So, uh, you know, they'll be fine. It's Bama, you know. They're, they're just a little bitter, too, about that program not being able to afford that NIL money like some of the other programs can, too, which, look, I get that, but, you know, too bad, so sad. <laughs> Dry your tears on your national title trophies, you know. But uh, thank you, Chase. I appreciate the fiver. Hope you're having a good night, brother. King, thank you for another $5 donation as well. He asks, uh, how many teams fail in the draft? Draft a quarterback in the first round every year instead of building a roster foundation. It is the definition of insanity. I think, uh, King, you bring up a, a point that I think should be... Um, in fact, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write down the note on this, King. But we'll do a show around this as well this offseason. And that's going to be a, a little bit about looking at the you know, quarterbacks drafted high over the last six, seven years. Um, because I do think to your question, there is a little bit of a theory at times that is pervasive out there that all you need to do is just target the guy. And if you just go target the guy, then you just go get him. And, and you can end up on that carousel a little bit heading around that. And that we get lost a little bit to me in this thinking of a, that, that the quarterback somehow drives this thing rather than it being a team-based sport and that it being, you know, the ultimate team-based sport. You, know, you got over double the amount of players just on one side of the ball on the field than you have in basketball. You know, 22 players on a field at any one given time, but 10, 10 other guys on your, uh, on your offense, 11 other guys on your defense. Yet you take, we take, we often see this one guy elevated to this realm of distinction where he's held on high and it's, it's, you have to go find the guy that you can hold on high. It's like, well, what about the, getting the rest of the team right? No, 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 no. That's, that's just, that's, we'll get around to that. We'll get around to that. Get the quarterback. Just, just the QB. You get the QB and you're, and such, to me, it's, it, it's just not the right way of looking at it in the, the sport of football. Quarterback matters. Quarterback is important. Quarterback and having a great one, boy, is it a big helper to a football team. But it is not the end all be all for success in this sport or for, to get a team up to the, to the, to the top, in my opinion. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm much more in the realm that you're talking about at this point, King, and, and watching this sport for so many years is that get the team built. Build up the team and greatness will come with it. Defense wins championship. Offense wins championship. Build a great team. That's 
what wins a championship. And I believe that now more than ever of, a, of watching football in my life at that point. But the, the, the quarterback and the way that he's been risen in the last, especially 15 to 20 years, and maybe it's the Brady effect, but the way that the quarterback position has been raised to this rarefied air as though they have angel wings popping out of their back and they're just, they float above the rest of their team, just. Like, no, no, don't work that way. Both for their success and their failure. They're as reliant on that as anybody else. Running back needs guys to open up holes. Quarterback needs pass protection. And if you don't have it, you're going to look like crap. And it ain't too hard to, ain't too hard to figure out. It's, it is the level of, it, it's in, insanity is a good way to put it to me, King. It's kind of insane to think that you have a, a team of 22 individuals and you take one and you say, this is, we get this right. All that other stuff just is kind of irrelevant. This is the place we got to start with. Let's begin here with this, this thing first. Is it? Is it the right place to start with? Is it the only thing? Is it the end all be all? Because it gets spoken about a lot in that realm. And I'm just with you, man. I don't, I don't see it in the same way. I see it like you do with it. Get the team built. But thank you, King. Great thoughts, man. Uh, John. M429, thank you for another $10 donation. Appreciate you for that. Says, Brando, how do you feel about Lockett? Out of all the possible cuts, I hope he's the one we keep. I watch no college football. Do you think Grubb would want to keep him around? Well, uh, you didn't exactly have a Tyler Lockett guy necessarily in the, in the Husky offense. All of the receivers had pretty good size to them overall. So he hasn't leaned in that way in the past. I um, I think that Lockett has still got enough solidity to him as a player to where it, even though he is a little overpaid for where he stands, and I wouldn't take away from that, a little bit of him being overpaid, John, as I say that we've got to consider with this is his cap hit is so high because you converted his base to bonus last year. It's not high because you paid him at the start of this contract at a certain spot for this point in the contract, and it's clicking in now, and you're you're bearing the cost, and now it's it's because you've moved money around to make this happen with him there. And that's why. Otherwise, it would be down much more substantially from where it is. So that's a little bit of what is in this. But I, you know, to me, Lockett gave you, you know, while it maybe isn't as quite as much of a deep threat as he's been in the past, he still pretty much gave you about the year that he gave for the last four or five years. And he's solid and he moves the chains. And especially since I do believe that Gino is going to remain here, he is a guy that is a, a good security blanket for Gino, especially on third down. I think that he still finds a way to remain here for another year. It doesn't mean they don't maybe draft another receiver and it wouldn't shock me if they necessarily cut him because it, maybe they just look at it too like, hey, just save the money, move on and, and roll. But um, no, I think that, uh, I do think that Tyler Lockett um, remains for one more year and then probably retires, John. There is some pretty good receiver talent in this draft. I'll say that. So that's a little bit of what might affect this just a little bit. but. Um, Yeah, I hope he doesn't as well. On top of thinking that I don't think it makes sense necessarily to do so, I'm, I'm just hoping it isn't as well. I think there's other cuts you can make to free up the money you need to free up without going too hog wild. And with Lockett's deal, it's a little bit like the Draymond deal. It's a little bit like a couple of other ones we've got in the books right now where it's just, you, you want to give that thing a year to breathe. Even Gino's deal. You want to give it another year to breathe before you start talking about the potential of finding move or, or cuts or whatever. Because... Dead money is a thing. And right now, already out the gate, you're going to be sitting on, to me, bare minimum, 10 to $20 million with Jamal Adams alone in dead money to move off of him. Another $10 million for um, uh, Quandary Diggs if you're moving off him. More with Brian Monet, more with Nick Floor, more with Dwayne Eskridge. Comes to a point where it's like, well, we're $45, $50 million of dead money. Are we really going to be able to compete at that point next year if we take that hard of an approach to how much we want to cut and pull off of there, John? That's where I come around just thinking, okay, you, you just roll with Lockett. You make your four or five real distinct cuts on the team. You save your substantial money. You got enough to move around and make something happen then and you call it a day. So uh, I, I just think you lean in that, in that territory of it if I'm, if I'm guessing. But I'm with you on that. I think you should stay. And thank you though. John, very, very kind of you for the $10 donation. I do appreciate you for that. Sanchez, thank you for the $2 donation. Says so quarterback talk is over. Too costly to not roll with Gino. Amen. 
I think it's a good time to just, we're going to push the ball forward on the QB talk. Like I said, I didn't want to get into it in the first place and I still got drug into it, but I, I'm not really looking to push any more further. I've, I've hit it at, I've hit it hard here for two years. And if I haven't converted you to one way or the other, or you haven't converted me, converted me to one way or the other, we're probably not. We just got to kind of handshake it out. All of us as a, as a Seahawk, uh, as a Seahawk family and say, you know, agree, disagree. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, too costly to move on. That's the other thing I think that gets lost a little bit with Gino is that if you move on Gino, it's not simply that you just get to get out from under that $31 million and that now you're just free and clear. And that now you just, you got $31 million to go spend. It's going to be about a 17 to $18 million cap hit of dead money on your books. If you move off of Gino. And as I said, you already have about 35, $45 million of dead money. You're going to be sitting on your books with the guys you are intending to cut. It's going to get very hard if we're talking about any chance this team has to compete next year if we're going and talking about rolling with 60, $65 million of dead money on your books moving into this offseason, which potentially could be possible depending on how overload they'd go. You'd have a lot more money the next year, I'll give you that, but uh, that would be a pretty pricey. Thank you, though, Sanchez. Rondaz, thank you for the $2 donation. He says, I'm so excited for the future of our team. Go! Hawks, run does. Thank you for that $2 donation. You should be excited. You have a cutting edge defense now in philosophy and schematics and approach. You have a cutting edge offense now in philosophy and schematics and approach. You have a front office the past two years that though in the late teens, they had some issues drafting, have told you and told you over and over again that something tangibly changed two years ago. They, they decided to reroute themselves back into the place of being truly about value in their approach to their draft boards. Who is the best value guy we have on our board when we select? That will be our motivating force. That will be our driving point as an organization. And on the back of that driving point as an organization, you have put together the two of the best drafts in Seahawks history back to back. Cutting edge offense, cutting edge defense, two of the best drafts in the last two years that we've had in Hawks history, the future is looking very bright and you should be excited. I wouldn't be blowing smoke up your guys' uh, behinds on this one if I didn't believe it. I told you guys at the time at the end of the year that I'm done with Carol. I'm out with this. I can't see this being bright if we move the future with this. So when you hear me now feeling optimistic or that we are moving the right direction, whether I'm wrong or right, you know it's at least coming from a point of being completely truthful and honest with you. And uh, I'm in that stage too as well. I'm hyped over the moon with what this team has done because I, there's, you only can control certain things in certain respects, you know? It's all, yeah, but then you need a real talented football team that comes together and has leaders and, you know, you, you get that lightning in the bottle thing that we had in the 13-14 where it just all kind of comes together. You need that little, that, that secret point to kind of all come, but you also need these other things to be smartly done. Smart front office, value-based approach, coaching staff seeking to maximize the players, seeking to run, a modernized approach and what they're trying to push on the football field, taking care of the things you can take care of. And they're definitely doing that now. Dave Kramer. Thank you, Dave, for subscribing to the channel here at the Hawks Nest. I appreciate you doing that. Really, really kind of you. Thank you folks too for, if you could hit that like button, but uh, Dave, appreciate all the new subscribers here. We're already uh, hot to trot here on the road to 20,000 subscribers. You're helping us get there now. I really do appreciate you for doing that. Uh, Sanchez with another $5 donation. Thank you, Sanchez, for all the donations, man, for the, the, the CS donation. It says, we should have kept offensive coordinator position open for when Tepper fires Canales for going 0-1. <laughs> <laughs> Only and Sanchez, it'll, it'll happen after a game where he has two drinks in his hands and then he throws, he does the double drink splash on fans just outside the booth. Maybe that'll be his thing now every week. Like he'll turn me, like if I was Tepper, I would just turn that into like, the way Tepper could turn that is around is he'd like announce every week, you know, have like a contest to who wants to be the fan to have a drink splashed in their face by David Tepper. And just, you know, who's going to get the magical row? And it's just like, all right, Dave, go for it. But uh, yeah, Sanchez, Tepper is, uh, I, I hope Canellas can go in there and make it happen. Um, he did a great job with Baker, great job with Gino. Um, pretty good work there with Russell through his time. And, um, you know, he seems, I, I think it was to me a little early with Canales. I, I feel like he did need maybe another year as an OC to kind of, you know, it, just get a little more maturation going, maybe just a little bit more there. And, and certainly having to just, you know, he sort of, of course, took what, what was available as the first, you know, hire there to be available in Carolina. But 
you, you got an uphill battle there, I think, with that with that Carolina crew. And it, it starts with ownership. When you have bad ownership or you're not even bad ownership, just poor ownership, which is where I think at the very least we could put temper into that realm. Um, I mean, we're hearing reports that many on that Carolina staff wanted, uh, you know, wanted C.J. Stroud, and instead they went with Bryce Young because of mainly your owner driving that. Ouch! Yeah, that's 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 a nightmare scenario to hear about as a fan. Like you talk about a, a type of decision that you hear coming from an owner that gives you zero confidence in ownership. That's one. You got all these football minds in the room telling you this, 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 this. Yeah, but I want that. <sighs> Happened with Manziel too. In Cleveland, right? Owner did it there too. I don't know what it is. These owners sometimes will fall in love with certain guys in the draft. That's where that NFL with the Coster, that draft movie, remember the owner was all hot to trot on the guy they were going to take. That's so, I guess that's kind of true. Owners are kind of like that, but hopefully Canales can pull it off out there, Sanchez. He does not have, it ain't going to be easy work. I will say the one nice thing in that division is it's pretty wide open. It's there for the taking. Thomas Cox, I like all these hires. Mike McDonald hiring reminds me of McVeigh and hiring his first staff. Now, whether it will work, gotta love it. Good comp. Midnight Sun, love the old Hawks, but so excited for the new season. I think fans are gonna be, be there's a lot of fans I think are gonna be maybe surprised a bit, Midnight Sun, by how many people are gonna be really reinvested back in the Hawks here into this next coming season with this change and how many had been kind of into a state, I think, where they had not full on checked out, but there was just more of a, a, a side-eyeing, passing eye sort of to the team a bit and their uh, outlook of them. And it'll bring a lot more people back into the fray, I think. UE2K says Chip Kelly would have been a terrible hire. He's a coward and a quitter. <laughs> UE2 UE and vi choosing violence today. <laughs> Uh, 5 0 first reject, hot, ta hot take. Cox will take JJ McCarthy. I said what I said. <laughs> uh, Dylan, when did the new coaches speak to the media? Ooh, they might, I don't know how they'll do this one, Dylan. I don't know on that. You'd think they might be doing a press conference or something where they just do one by one. Card crazed, can I please ask Aiden for a tackling technique university like the TEU? Too many trench guys do not know how to tackle and need a separate space to learn it. Boy, do they ever. It's a great point, man. I, I'll say, like I said, I think that the, the defense in the NFL that can figure out the way to get these guys to tackle and how to train it with the new techniques that you have to utilize because you can't use the old techniques will be a team, will be a defensive minded coach that's going to have a defense that'll be ready to, 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 you know, be one of the best in the league instantly. And uh, maybe McDonald's found a little bit of that in his way, in his manner, but it ain't easy. Gavin says McDonald has a track record of getting things on track quickly as a coordinator, almost a ringer problem solver for the Harbaugh's, hoping that carries over to the head coach position. And I think it will. He's basically Winston Wolf from Pulp Fiction, Gavin, you know? He's, he's basically, you know, he gets the call on the phone at the, at the cocktail party. He's like, it's 30 minutes away. I'll be there in 10, right? You got a body. You got a body in the garage minus a head in the back. Take me to it. Winston Wolf. Pretty please. We should go on top. Go in the oven car. Gun Sunny, Nix or Daniels would be a perfect fit for us. Not going to lie. I think they both would fit. Yeah, absolutely. Nix is, I think the Michigan game is a great reference point for Penix. He played a bunch of future NFL talents and didn't look good. Stroud's best game was versus Georgia, which had a bunch of future NFL players. I think that's a good, good way of comping it out. I think it's always hard to take just one individual game off a guy first body of work and, and sort of pick to that, especially when it's 
so different. But it's impressive what Stroud did to your point with Georgia. I mean, it's it is. I, I don't want to take that away because I think that was a driving force to him getting drafted as high as he was. So it's a fair point. I do like Penix, but there are some things that I think also to me, Nick, put him in a different categorical range from a prospect status than Stroud, where I had Stroud as the best quarterback in last year's draft. I don't have Penix, but I think right now fourth or fourth or fifth or something like that on my list. So I have him as a first round grade, but do see a bit of a difference in their their talent. Kind of down to the dealing with pressure specifically. Kevin Dilley, Leo Williams, and Zerzon Newton on the same line would be crazy. Yeah, but Kevin, who plays one tech? I guess Leonard can do a little bit of that. Yunk, I'd like uh, Fuaga as well. He's a great player. He's awesome. I'm scun summy. I've got Fuaga as one of my blue chip guys in this draft, so uh, he's darn near very close to being looked at from my perspective as a top 10 guy in this draft. Maybe not quite, but very close. Misfit, I'm, I'm most curious about linebacker class and if anyone has the requisite prerequisite speed. Yeah, there's some good guys in this class with some speed. Cedric Gray's got great speed. Jalen Ford's got great speed. Edrin Cooper's got great speed. I'm not sure with Colson or Trotter what they're going to run exactly. But there's some toolsy linebackers in this draft. It's a little bit better for the mid mics in this draft than it's been recently. Robert Landon, appreciate the shout out for the sub. It was an easy one. Listening to your level-headed and thought-out discussion on Gino and everything else is a breath of fresh air. Go Hawks. Hey, go Hawks, Robert. I really do appreciate it, man. It's a, it's a, a great kind. It's hard to get the sub sometimes on this YouTube, so it's... A big deal when we can, even at this stage of things, and I do appreciate it. And I try to do that. I'm I'm gonna have my rights and my wrongs. i definitely will have my bad takes do it filtered within there. But uh, I do have my things I feel pretty strongly about. This one's been built for a while too, as I say with the Robert. It's one where I feel like I've had to kind of sub defend Gino at times for two years without any progress made from certain certain camps on it. But I think most of the fan base understands he's a pretty good player. And again. Even if you're happen to be one of those folks out on Gino, goes I don't really want Gino. It's just I just don't like him. Well, you'll you, we'll all be satisfied in this situation. I think at the end of the day, where Gino's going to be your starting quarterback next year, you're likely to go draft a quarterback in this draft. There's still likely to be a future guy uh, that they will hitch themselves to and determine that this is the guy as they go along. So all that is uh, you know likely to be where this all plays out, which should make everybody happy, no matter where they're you where wherever you stand. Three hour, Fuaga's right tackle one, Latham is close behind. But Alton Fashino are tackle one and two. That's my list as well, three hour. Yep. That's exactly how I have my my horizontal board set up too. Big cuz the defense class so deep, you could find somebody in the later rounds. Definitely. Defensive tackle, uh corner, line middle linebacker, a lot of lot of guys at these positions, a lot of bodies. And Kevin Dilley, I do like Zerzon Newton. I do. I just wonder how you'd set that line up. I'm a little worried we over overclogged the three techs. Haley, what if I told you for the cost of Diggs, Adams, and Monet, you could have Leonard Williams, Patrick Queen, and Bobby back? I think I would take uh I would think I would take that ladder pretty quickly. And I think at least with the case, Haley, of Williams and Bobby, that, that both those two guys become really the main two in-house free agents you probably look to bring back. David Adams, Chief should shut down McCaffrey by any means. Let Purdy throw for 40 plus times a game. That's what I would do. I would come into the game and I would I would commit to running stack boxes all day. If I was Bagnola, I would flip my defensive secondaries every time. Whatever I show pre-snap, maybe 4% of the time, 5% of the time in the game, what I showed from pre to post-snap would be the same. I would commit to blitzing. I would commit to keeping him uncomfortable. Um, run blitzes all over the place. You know, I would especially look to try to take away McCaffrey to the edges. 
and force them to do a lot of their damage inside if they can do that. And uh, see how it goes. Play, play man concepts on the back end and let's roll. Scott Summy says, getting the quarterback should be the last thing. Build a good roster and get the quarterback after you have a good roster. Amen, Scott Summy. That's my approach too. I think people get it back to front, but it should be front to back. Get the roster in place and then go get your quarterback and then watch your quarterback flourish. Watch him shine. Watch the chances for his success only raise. I, I relate this back to Justin Fields. Why are the Bears trying Justin Fields right now? Is it because Justin Fields sucks? Or is it because they don't know what the hell they have in Justin Fields? And they don't know what they have in Justin Fields because they got the cart before the horse. Because they made the determination that some fans do that it's just the quarterback. Just go get the quarterback. Just get the QB. And so they just get the quarterback behind an atrocious offensive line without any kind of wide receivers that can do much to provide him any kind of good utilization of a skill set that he can take advantage of. We've seen that because the second that you started to pair him with DJ Moore, now suddenly he's got a guy that can roll. Now he can suddenly let it rip. Not really much at tight end unless you want to tell me Cole Komet is something really all that good. Running back position, blah. You got a hammer basically in Montgomery, but no line, which doesn't do a hammer very, very much good. And so then you finally now get a couple years later where you're getting close to having to make a decision on making a contract extension on him or not. You're paying, you've got the number one overall pick in the draft. You know, we don't know what to do because you got the cart before the horse. Because you went and grabbed that QB without getting the rest in place. And that's why I harp on this is we don't want to make that same mistake. Get the rest of those parameters in place. Get the rest of the fundamentals in place. And then he'll, he'll shine. He'll be great. Ricardo agrees with me. He says, yeah, if you don't have a good roster, your quarterback dies. Look at Aaron Rodgers on the Jets. Yeah, what did he last? Two series? One series? And that's Rodgers going from the Green Bay Packers, who for years have had a great commitment to building up really good, especially pass-protecting units. They understand the value in that. And uh, you, there's so many examples across the league through the years that you can go to on this over and over and over again. And it, it just stands out to me that it's, it's kind of slapping us in the face at times, this thing of, of the effect that it has and how helpful it is to QBs and, and, or how detrimental it is to QBs when they don't have it. DBN says, we still don't know if the Shanahan method works yet. Not completely, not for the ultimate success. Jersey says, if Gino couldn't put up 30 consistently with this offense, he's not good. People forget, we'll throw a pick or a fumble at the ball at the critical times. And yeah, again, I, I don't know if the, the backing is to that Jersey picker. Uh, if he was a guy that fumbled or threw a pick at the critical times, then why do you have five come from behind victories last year alone? Um, he should have put up 30 consistently with an offense that had was... Uh, at best, back end and, pat and run blocking. Uh, inconsistent as hell in your run, running game and overall with a bad defense that spends three-fourths of the field. It's time to get it. I just, I'm not going here anymore, Gino. Gino's done with me today. I'm not doing the talk. I, I've, I've done my discussion with it. I've hit my end point. We're moving on. Young is uh, Powers Johnson, the center from Oregon, as good as people are raving? I don't watch Oregon much. Yeah, I wasn't as super hot with him on the initial, but the more I went back and watched more tape of him, the more impressed I got with him. Uh, just a powerful guy with really good, uh, it doesn't, not, not a pure mover at the position, he moves well enough, but good long arms that just lock on to you. He can hold up against one tax. Uh, and he's a very young guy. I think he's got it, some fluidity there to being able to play goal guard and center. But um, yeah, he's probably emerged as the best interior offensive lineman in this draft. He's overtaken Van Pram and Barton and Breton. You know, he's, he's that guy probably at this point. Kevin Dilley says, uh, Powers Booth allowed zero sacks in 2023. I do believe. He's very good in pass pro. 
hard to get around. Strong as hell, long arms, just a big wide frame on him too. He's got a nat- natural, nice center, big body there, you know. You like those linemen with that extra width where it's like you got to you gotta go around the bend just to get around him, just naturally, whether you beat him, not, beat him or not off the ball. Big Cuz says, let us have Lockett. Let us have him. I think he stays. Hans, I'm with you, man. I'm done on the Geno stuff. Let let him let him rip. They can punch himself out in the chat. Misfit, Fuango at 16 is worth it. Or Powers Johnson looks great, possibly with a trade down, but I think we might be too good to get past 16. Uh, I got no problem at this point with either of those two players taking him there. With Powers, it's a hair early, but hey, if you're getting the best interior offensive lineman in the draft at 16, uh, is that something that's going to piss me off? Is that something that's that's going to anger me? No, it shouldn't. I mean, like, the bottom line of that is that that's, that's going to help to do this thing that I'm wanting done, which is to turn this offensive line into a powerhouse, to make this a true strength of the team. And if we can make it on the back of the team, then I think we can take this offense into a, a great place as well. And yeah, Haley, you're on the you're on the button with that about a lot of the folks that that I've seen go after Gino the hardest tend to be a lot of the folks that are also the biggest backers of Gene of Russ. And there seems to be some kind of connection here to the two. So yeah, I've seen I've seen that as well. Yeah, Lord Boom Brandon, we're still dealing with the G quarterback. Yeah, 11 out 40 minutes ago. I logged off to give my daughter off some food. I came back. We're talking about the same thing. Gino's our guy, guys. Get over it. I know, man. I, even as I try to get off of it, I, I'm not I'm not doing no more. I know I said I wouldn't. I got myself pulled into it again. But some of the things I'll just read are just like, really? Come on. Come on. Thomas is, of course, getting a Justin Herbert, CJ Stroud. May not get you to Super Bowl. The 2012 Seahawks had depth. Now imagine if Seattle didn't get Russ. Would uh, that team win a Super Bowl? Depth is great. Great points, man. Great points. Yeah. I think there's a couple ways to get there. I don't think there's just one fixed path to getting there to the to the promised land. Scum Summy says, I'm out on any quarterback that is a first or early second round pick. Most of the quarterbacks besides Caleb and May are already 23 plus. They have experience over most of the competition in college. Good point. Really good point. Yeah, a lot of a lot more older quarterbacks coming out. He's a kid out of Notre Dame. He's 25. He's going to be 26 years old. Ricardo says, no one's arguing that Gino is an elite quarterback, but when you want to dump an asset for a quarterback that is worse than Gino, it is going to get some pushback. Amen. Well said, Ricardo. Really well said. Mr. Rod, looking forward to my first Seahawks game. Hell yeah, man. Get it. Now Lumenfield. Roland says, who's the best college coordinator who was ab- able to effectively and immediately translate to adult men with big contracts? Who was the best college coordinator who was able to effectively and immediately translate to adult men with big contracts? I don't know. I don't have a good answer on that one. Thomas says, I, I had Cross, Fatanu, Oluwatimi, Zinter, Lucas with depth of Rosengardner for right tackle. What do you think? That would do it. Thomas, you know, that would accomplish definitely what I would seek to accomplish. I'm very hot to trot on Rosengardner after watching his tape the other night. So I, I like a lot of what he brings. A lot of what he brings. So uh, I'm, I'm completely good with that. I do think Rosengardner is going to go a little bit higher than some are thinking though too. Because I think teams might look at him, especially if he tests well as a guy that can play left tackle. Fatano put him out to right, but doesn't mean he can't play some left. Maybe. Haley, I really like Zinter, but that's too much of a question with our already suspect line depth. 
Yeah, you're probably going to have to draft him somewhat high too with the the injuries had. I've heard he's going to get back to it from full full steam though. That he's going to get back 100 percent by pretty quickly. Um, like we'll have him available by training camp uh, if we did draft him. But uh, there is a little bit of the worry there with him because that was a major injury he had right at the end of the season. Misfit, how patient will John be to build through the draft and draft our quarterback of the future? We should try and add an extra first for next year. Sign me up for doing that. If you can pull that off, I'm completely good with that. Uh, John's been pretty hesitant with quarterbacks in the draft throughout his history here with Seattle. Um, even just adding a little bit by the model of how the Packers added through his time when he was there in Green Bay. For years, Green Bay would go out and take a guy in the third, fourth round, develop him, flip him for a higher pick than they drafted, and it was kind of like a stock quarterback uh, you know, bond or whatever that they had. You know, So it would be Mark Brunell or Ty Detmer or Aaron Brooks. And they would always find a way to flip these guys for some picks. So John comes from that background model. Maybe he does look to apply it here. It's part of why I've logically said, I think that it's a good chance you do go and look at a guy in the third round, maybe not in the first or second, but third, fourth round. Could you take a Jordan Travis in the fourth? Eh, maybe, maybe. So uh, I think it's certainly more possible this year than ever that they do look to take a QB. Roll says Vegas has odds on when Brand's cat throws up next. My cat never throws. Ms. Fit, I love Odunzie. Wide receiver contracts are bananas and lock it short shelf life. I'd absolutely draft him at 16. He's, it'd be good value there. I mean, I definitely have him as a blue chip guy in this draft. So if you're taking it, I don't like taking another Q, necessarily another receiver, but I'm also a guy about value. And if that was the, you know, if he's, if he's fallen in that way and they love him in that way, it's like I, I would get it. It'd be tough for a lot of fans, but I'd understand the uh, thought process that would get you there. I don't think, I think like DVN says, I don't think Odunzie is dropping though. Haley, do you want uh, the third best wide receiver or the best center right tackle? It's more the value thing for me, Haley, on this. And it's hard with this because it's always a bit of a balancing act game here. You know, if you're up at 16 and you've got some Joe Alt falls to you from as the left tackle there and you already have cross, it's like, ooh, you know, what do we do here? Um, but when it comes down to that, if the it sort of depends on the evaluation. And from my perspective, Haley, what he's talking about with Udunzie, I have nine, 10 guys that are blue chip prospects in this draft. Odunzie is one of those guys. I like Jackson Powers. He's probably the best interior offensive line in this draft. I, um, I think you could make um, the right tackle, Haley. You can sell me on that. Fuaga, um, bet maybe a better pick there at that point, or Latham even maybe as a right tackle, a better pick there if you want to go that um, instead of Odunzie. That part's valid, but because there's a couple of guys I have a right tackle, Haley, that are blue chip, but. I don't have powers there. So if we're just talking about it being a powers or a, a Dunzie, if we're going to, if we're going to trust in value and if we're going to say philosophy by our draft is by value, who is the, I look up at my board and they'll have the, the guys all slotted on the board, right? Beyond their positional ranks, they'll have their individual ranks one through wherever they're currently at on, on who's available. Who's that number one guy you got on your board. And if Odunzie is your number one and Jackson powers is more like your number eight or number six, Versus the other guys that might also be there, it's like, well, you gotta you gotta kind of trust sometimes in that value and trust that the long term, that's gonna bear out the the most talented best team. It can create some log jams too, but as was spoken about with Lockett, it's not like we're necessarily set there at the the receiver position there long term with Lockett. Uh, when you look at Bobo and with Jackson Smith, you can make a strong argument that those are inside guys and in what they do best that they can do maybe a little bit on the outside, but you want them inside out of the slot to allow them to be at their best. Uh, I could get that thinking a bit. Hans, what would be the next Panthers with some game plan, cut Geno trade for the first uh, pay Brooks, 15 million, who knows what else? You win it. <laughs> if we were the Panthers, yeah. Uh, Lord Boom, thank you for the $5 donation. Sorry, I didn't see your uh, donation come through there. I was caught up on the chat. It says, Brandon, I want a middle linebacker in this draft. It's Cooper, Trotter, or Wilson for me. Who do you think, who do you value more? 
Uh, maybe a certain Wyman 2.0 from Ohio. Mm? Mm? <laughs> Go high. Uh, thank you, uh, Lord Boom, for the donation. Uh, Edrin Cooper. Gr- Edrin Cooper is right with Colson as being one, two for me as my two favorite line back, middle linebackers in this draft. Colson, I think I might just be a little bit out of pocket because there's so many people that don't seem to be as hot to trot on him as I am. So I'll just own that. Maybe I just like him a little bit more than others. When it comes to uh, Cooper, he is kind of the probably the overall freakiest of the middle linebackers in this class in size, length, how he will test his explosiveness and the full skills skill set that he brings. I have an early second round grade on Trotter on uh, Cooper as I do on Colson. Trotter's right there with them. My only worry with Trotter is straight line speed and burst. I think he's got a little bit of the five yard burst. I don't know if he has a 10 yard burst. I don't know if he has kind of 40 yard burst, right? Is he going to run a four, six, five, four, seven, 40 at his size being five eleven? Um, Where's his arm length going to be at? Am I looking at a guy with 31 inch arms? I'm, I've got some concerns with Trotter and that's where testing at the combine is going to be kind of a little bit more important for him than it might be for some of the other uh, guys, maybe like a Cooper Wilson that you can see it on tape and you know what, with their size and stuff, they can get it done. Uh, Wilson also has the, the big issue with arm length. He's T-Rex arms all the way. Now he can do everything else on the football field. He's a great blitzer. You can utilize him off the edges of wide nine outside linebacker. Um, he's instinctive. He just kind of always ends up flowing to where the play is going to go naturally, um, which really stands out. And he's got some twitchiness and some explosiveness to him. But 30-inch arms. Now, I'm not talking 31-inch. I'm talking like 30 and 1-8-inch arms. 30-inch arms on Peyton Wilson, uh, the North Carolina kid. So uh, there's only been in recent football history, I think the last 25 years, there's only been three, three, three linebackers taken with 30-inch arms inside the first three rounds. And initially, Lord Boom, I had Wilson into the second round, but I've got to knock him back into the third, given the track record of history for that. And I don't think his tape is so overwhelmingly great to push him up into the second round because of that. On top of it, you have some injury concerns with Wilson that come in to impact that situation as well. I don't know if his medical evaluations are going to be exactly clean. And uh, are you talking about Tommy Eichenberg? Ohio State, is that the, is that the Wyman 2.0? <laughs> Go Hawks, uh, Lord Boom. Go Hawks. Give me Cooper, give me Colson. I'll take Trotter or Wilson as a backup plan. John, thank you for another $10 donation. John, M249. And again, sorry, a little bit late on the acknowledge on the dono. And I didn't see those pop up. He says, I know this isn't the B&B show, but I just want to say thank you to you and Brendan for all the off-season support. You guys are awesome for us highly invested fans. Well, that I really do appreciate it. I'll definitely pass it along to uh, uh, Brendan. And, um, you know, we love doing the show. I, I love chopping up with him. He's got a, usually a different kind of perspective or a way of considering it in a way that I probably haven't considered it in a lot of respects. Um, and I think that there's a good back and forth between us with that. And we've really had a chance, I think, too, to do this for a couple of years, really get on the same point with our, our chemistry and where we're at and how, to, how we do what we do in our own particular kind of way. Um, but... What has stood out is that, you know, the fans and, and the feedback on doing the B&B show has been, I think, tremendous on both of our camps where fans have come back and said, we love, love what you guys do. Keep doing this. This is awesome. This is, um, you know, I deal with it. And so it's just driven us to want to do more of them and make sure that we're, we're keeping them commonly going throughout even the off season, even in the dead points, of the off season. So, um, John, I thank you for that, man. I, I love doing the work with Brendan. He's done a great job over on the channel. It's been fun to be able to go through and have this kind of growth I've been having the last year and a half, two years, and being able to see him experience it at the same point in time. And um, it's, it's a really fun time when you get to this size, I think, as far as your, the channel growth goes, where you know, you're into that, you know, a little more of the rarefied air from where you can find most folks at. And uh, he's earned his right to be there. He's earned his way to be there. Um, harder, harder workers you'll find here, I think on this platform. And, uh, I love what we do, man. It's, it's, uh, it's a, a lot of fun chopping it up with him. So, um, appreciate you. Very kind of you to say, and, uh, we will be continuing into the future going strong as ever with the B&B shows. We've got a whole off season, John Slater shows already all set up. Thanks to Brendan doing the hard work on that one. He did the heavy lifting of getting it all kind of, um, tracked out a little bit and getting it all traced out. But uh, the stage is all set. We're going to have an off-season here completely filled up of uh, off-season, off-season content and B&B shows. And uh, so thank you. I appreciate you for that. Really kind of you to say. Primo, thank you for the uh, $5 donation. 
He says, hey, Brando, I'm so excited for this coming season. What I saw from Ryan, Gr- what I saw from Ryan Grubb is the way the offensive line operated. It's a very important part when looking at it. It's going to be one of the probably first fixture points that I start to identify with Ryan Grubb on the offense and what you get with him is the utilization of um, uh, offensive linemen and how he works these offensive linemen through space and how he can adjust over the course of the game on a blocking assignment even, just on a minor adjustment by the way the defense might play it in order to free up a run that might be held down to a two-yard gain early on that now gets opened up for a 15-, 20-yard gain based off the back of the adjustment he makes. Pulls this guy to the space here, or, or it's not even just having the guy pull the space, of course, it's going to the play call that pulls to attack a defender's early position on the game, which shows his ability to adjust and, and read what's going on with the defense, not to just blindly go in with a plan A and say, this is what we do, that's how we do it, but also he's reacting off what he's seeing on the field, which is what I think really good coaches should do. Certainly something that we saw from Mike McDonald in that playoff game against the Chiefs, where you went to that second half and he needed to find adjustments against what that Chiefs offense was doing with all the bubble screens and the throws out into the flat. And he found those adjustments. That to me is a, an extra special level of good coaching because I think a lot of coaches have good plan A's. I think a lot of coaches can spend the whole week and have their opening scripted 15 plays and they teach it all up on the details. And it's all very, very hard for the defense to get a feel for what you're doing to them. And then you get outside those scripted 15 plays and it's a little bit like they're lost in the woods without a map. And uh, I don't think that that's what we have now in guys like McDonald and Grubb that have shown a little bit more of that background to do that. And with Grubb, it's for me, I see it on the offensive line and the way he'll block things up and set up running plays. Um, creatively speaking. And I, I, I really, really like those offenses in the ground game that will seek to pull guys across a formation, try to get a pin and pull block with a receiver, try to get a, a, a guard to get out there onto a, onto a defense, you know, tackle, um, and, and try to create the numbers game to one side of the football field to allow for those super explosive plays in the run game. Because you've got guys in Charbonnet and in Walker who can beat a guy one-on-one out in space. And if you have the rest of it blocked off, it's a home run. And that's what this kind of blocking scheme will, will build a little bit more into, more than we did in the past with the way that we did, we did things. We weren't as much built on pulling guys back across the formation and whatnot. It still stayed a little bit more uh, mono a mono. But thank you, uh, Primo. Many penny pull are excited, I think, for these hires and where the direction of this team is going. And I'm right along with the rest of you on this one. I, I find myself just applauding, you know, and, and applauding, with, uh, applauding with a lot of vigor and passion. But uh, Grub will be fun. It'll be fun breaking down some of this offense over the next, uh, over the next couple of months in this offseason as to what we're going to be getting from it. And um, both sides of the ball, Primo, you couldn't get a more starkly different way your offense and defense is going to operate this next upcoming season from how we've seen it prior. It's going to be, you talk about a breath of fresh air or people going, what am I watching? You could do this on a field? You're allowed to do all this? You can do all this stuff? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, Adrian XA, thank you for the $2 donation. Says, A, B, who you got tomorrow? Any prop bets for tomorrow? Well, this is a good time to thank the sponsor of the show, which would be Underdog Fantasy. I want to thank uh, Underdog Fantasy. has been sponsoring us throughout the whole course of this off season, season, off season, and then we'll continue to be sponsoring us here in the near future. You can click down in the bottom top of the descriptions link. There's a link down there below where if you click that link and you go to Underdog Fantasy and you sign up for the first time, they will match you up to 100% of your first deposit up to $100. So $100 on me to you simply by using my code NEST. That's NEST. We're clicking the link down there in the description below on Underdog Fantasy today. And they've got some great, great still ongoing prize packages here and especially right now. And so we will go through really quickly because I know I'm going to get a couple of questions on what my picks are going to be for this game. Uh, They've got a new customer special going right now. So you put these packages of picks together. And let me show you right now what you'd be looking at. I can get in here. It'll let me. Okay, here we go. So. Window capture. We'll get our font. Let's say picks here. So here's our picks now. So first off the gate, if you do sign up for the first time right now, you can get that Patrick Mahomes special. Of if you go higher than 0.5 total yards, 
that's just an instant win for you. He's obviously going to get higher than that, right? So you can start to stack your kind of your your picks all together on the back of this with sort of a freebie, as I would call it, on this particular one. But uh, we've got the rest of the picks through here, and so I will let's put together a quick one here for you guys as far as my picks, and you guys can kind of you know take from that as as to what you want to take from so to speak with that. Now, uh, in regards to what we're going to see here, I would say. Um, so I would probably go higher on McCaffrey than 92 and a half yards. I'd go higher on Debo Samuel with three rushing attempts. Cause I think they come back to that. Um, I'm going to go higher on receptions to Kelsey because not, the Niners don't do a lot of necessarily double teaming. So he will, I think still get his, his catches in there. We'll go, um, We'll go higher to Kittle because I think he's going to get the stack fronts as Purdy, which means he's going to need to get the ball out of his hands at times quicker there. So we'll go higher on the receptions. We'll go higher on these more. Than, I'll, I'll stay in this realm. And then um, let's see here. Give me one more here if I like. Who else do I like in this one? This is an easy one. I'd go under on that. So there's my picks. I'll take McCaffrey with more than 92 and a half yards rushing. I'll go with Debo with more than three rushing attempts. Kelsey with more than seven receptions. Kittle with more than four receptions. And then Sky Moore with under two and a half receptions. But of course, you don't have to take all five of these here. You could take one of these off. And if you're a first timer, you could just bump in the, uh, bump in the old, uh, uh, bump in the old, um, Patrick Mahomes deal I was just showing you on that, where you guys can use this one here where it's 0.5 yards higher. If you're a first time customer, that's going to show up. But they've got some great ongoing ones throughout this off season. Of course, you can still go hockey, basketball, baseball starting up. It uh, continues on. We'll be uh, continuing to look at it through the off season on some of these, especially for next year on some of the seasonal long, on uh, the seasonal long picks. But uh, still giving away lots of money every single week over on that side. Thank you to Underdog Fantasy for sponsoring the Hawks Nest. And uh, those would be my props. Adrian, actually, I'd also take the Chiefs at this point. I'm a little nervous that 70% of the money is on the Chiefs right now. That gets me a little bit like you talk about Vegas going, hey, NFL, uh, we want you to change this outcome of this game. There's too much money on it, all right? Roger Goodell. Chiefs can't win this game. Our whole business goes under. Come on. Uh, Skun Sami Odunzie would be very repetitive. We already have the Romo Odunzie type receiver in DK. Us getting Romo wouldn't make much sense. It's a value thing for me with it. I just think he should go real with the value. There's a little bit of some differences with the two of them too, I think. Some tiny differences. James Steger, do you think Geno Smith is good? I think he's a top 10 quarterback in this sport, James. Rocky Hikes, people like to follow what the media says, and quarterback's an easy target. Gino is a top 15 quarterback at minimum, and he's on a very good contract. Gino's not the problem, and we're fortunate to have him. Again, as I say with the uh, many comments that will come through on my chat, Rocky, uh, smartly put, much more succinctly put than I, I took in my meandering ways to, to try to illustrate that very uh, point. But uh, right on target, my friend. And that uh, that's the, the way I see it as well. And um, part of... Part of the solution, not part of the problem right now. 
as you say. BB says, if we could restructure or trade lock, and I'm for it, I'd like Polk or other wide receiver to scrub system. I get it. Michael Penix played extremely well until his past piss poor performance against the Texas Longhorns. Obviously, Gino will mentor our new quarter. Michael played bad against the Longhorns? I thought he played good in that game. For us, Ben, we need to draft another quarterback in the second or third round. I do think third round they're going to probably look to target a guy. Ricardo says people like to forget that we can't just stash five quarterbacks on the roster. Picking a bad quarterback to replace Geno can be just as bad as not picking any. Good point. Good point. Especially that guy's got to get on that field and play at some point, which is a real possibility. If you have a guy a little bit older at the position like Geno is. Evan trade down from 16 to a later first and get a second. Take Fuagua in the first. Snag Penix in the second. That wouldn't be too bad. I'd be with it, Evan. I don't know if Penix is going to last into the second round, though. I think he's going to test really well and get vaulted up into the, at the very minimum, top 20, but I think top 12 at this point. Skinny Summy says, forget the Geno talk. Y'all watching the SpongeBob halftime show? <laughs> Roland, uh, our top analyst in my, Roland says, Mike Florio and Chris Sims are top analysts in my book. They were shocked to see Pete go. What does that tell you? I don't know if Shocked says that it's the wrong hire. I've listened to both those guys talk about letting Pete go, and I don't think that any of them said that it was necessarily a bad to let him Pete go, to let Pete go. Being shocked in itself doesn't mean that a decision is bad. It just means it's surprising. Ringo, if the Niners win the Super Bowl, that would be the cherry on top of this shit sandwich season. How did they get handed McCaffrey from the Panthers anyway? Not a lot of running back value, Ringo, you know? It's not very high right now. And so you offer second, third, fourth round pick. There's not a lot of teams coming to the table probably willing to offer that. Especially because there was going to be a base salary with McCaffrey that was going to be pretty healthy that came with it. And it combos up. Mark Harper-Cohen, thank you for reminding me of that. Please do hit that like button and sub on up if you're not already. I really do appreciate it. And thank you to everybody too for all the donations today on the stream. Really kind of y'all. Oh, and, and there you go. Brandon could not think of a college coordinator who could not who could handle grown men with large contracts. We are screwed. Uh, again, I, I don't make the logical leap in that same way. I can't think of off the top of my head, Roland. I mean, I, I know I have usually a lot of answers off the top of my head, but sometimes on things I do need to go research them and go look to find. And I'm probably sure that I could find certain representations of success to your very question. I just don't happen to have it off the top of my head. I'm I'm pretty good on most things, but there is stuff that I do need to do and go do my research on to go do with. But um, the, simply the fact that I don't have a, a bevy of successful stories I can tell of you that happening does not mean that there isn't a potential there for success. And um, when it comes to coordinators who've had a history of controlling men and grown men with contracts in this league, I can show you just as many representations of guys who've been coordinators in this league who can't seem to get players that they've been a long time in this league and should have the knowledge of how to control those guys and keep those guys in line, yet they're unable to do so. So even just having that necessarily history of, I've been a guy who's dealt with guys in pro at the pro level and contracts thing, it's maybe a bit of an issue with a, an extra layer that he has to deal with in complexity, but I don't think that that in itself is a layer of complexity that means uh, we're screwed. I think that that's a bit of a jump from one to the other. The other thing I think about with this too is the fact that this is, I think coordinator hires don't have to be looked at in the same way coaching hires have to be looked at, Roland. I think with coaching hires and with coordinator hires, it's two different areas. Coordinators, you can have them come in, you can have them come out. It's not one that's a reliant on you having to hit a home run on that and then that's got to be super successful and if it's not, you're screwed. I've made the example of this, Roland. If you look at the Detroit situation, Ben Johnson was not Dan Campbell's first offensive coordinator. His first offensive coordinator they had come through there wasn't particularly good, right? So what does he do after one year? He moves off of that offensive coordinator and then he pushes Ben Johnson into it. 
So that's why I say you swing for the fences on this one. Is there some bust factor, which I've acknowledged, Roland, there's some bust factor to grub because of some of the untestedness, but there's also the big boom factor. So if he comes in here and he just busts out and he sucks and he can't handle men with grown contracts, you're not stuck with him for six years. You move off of him and you go get a, con a coordinator then that can work. Jaden Cur Jaden Cruz, 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 Cruz. I probably mispronounced it. Sorry, Jaden. Uh, hey, Brandon, do you think the grub hiring is going to end up like the Canada hiring in Pittsburgh? Uh, I mean, it's it's hard hard to say, but I would doubt that. I, I think the Pittsburgh offense was a lot more boring of an attack in its designs and its schematics than what Grubb is bringing to play. You know? I also think that Grubb is going to have a much better quarterback to deal with than Geno Smith than Pittsburgh had with Pickett. I also think we have more offensive talent on the side of the ball than Canada had coming into that. Haley says, wouldn't uh, the UW right tackle be like a left tackle since Penix is a lefty? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, he becomes kind of the blind side guy. I think he was naturally a left tackle, Haley, that they, they moved more to right tackle, not because of um, the left-handed the left handed stroke of Penix, but more because of Batano being the fixture there at left tackle. And uh, just keeping that kind of continuity there like that. But yeah, it's a good point. Right tackle, essentially left tackle in this offense. Casey Rosengarz has got good feet. Snappy out of his stance. Very snappy out of his stance. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Lucas watching uh, UW tape when, with him. How they, big guys at 6'6", six, six, they just, they're, they're, you know, in their stance and they're to their, to their athletic point so very quickly in their kick step. Stay LB, I like these hires and I'm excited for the future. However, I do think we need to make sure we are not overhyping a young staff. If we have a losing season in the first year, no fire everyone talk. It's not going to come from me. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in that stance of things. Um, it can be that way for coordinators, I think. It's not going to be that way for coaches for me. But if, if the offensive designs don't work, if he doesn't have a feel for how to do this at a coaching level, if it's complete failure, you have to be open to it. And I don't think that that's the worst thing to happen at that point. But when it comes to McDonald, you absolutely have to be patient with him. And I'm not going to be pushing anything on McDonald for, I've got to see success this year. In fact, I will be completely patient with it. Um, and I will be for the most part that way with the offense too. You're, you're taking yourself on both sides of the ball to your points now from one of the most simplified offense and defensive attacks that you will find in all of football to trying to take yourself to now one of the most complicated on both sides of the ball. Um, that's going to need to build in a little bit of a, learning curve, right? And and we do have to be, to your point, patient with that. I agree. I do agree. But I won't be trying to reach those conclusions from my perspective. Absolutely won't from McDonald's stance at all. Um, and, and very not likely to do with other coordinators either, unless it's just some unmitigated disaster. Gun Summy, I'm hearing from a lot of Cowboy fans. They are hoping that the team does not sign Tyler Badish. Badish. I was high on him in the 2020 draft. Is that a guy any of you would be interested in signing? I don't, I don't know. He's okay. I think he's, he's a, bit, a little bit more of what you're going to be getting in sort of an Evan Brown type, really, at the bottom line. Though he's probably more a run blocker and Evan Brown's more of a pass protector in what they do well. Hans says, I'm a fan of JPJ and Barton, uh, Cooper and Trotter, Sweat or McKinley, Robinson or Dorless should be the dogs to focus for to trade down in between 30 and 60. I like all those guys, man. Still haven't looked at McKinley yet. I got to take a look at McKinley Jackson, but all those other guys you mentioned are very good players. Julian Garcia, thoughts on Joe Milton? Probably one of the pure, more purest, strongest arms that you're going to find in this draft. Um, pretty good throwing motion as well. Um, Got a little bit of that Jameis Winston wild decision-making thing that he will do, especially as the play begins to break down. Uh, if you keep things on script and everything is really kind of easily well-formulated for him to, to, to just process and go, he's fine. If things start getting really complicated and now he's got to start leaning on mobility and improvising and playing off script, things start to kind of fall apart a little bit for him. Uh, this was representative, for instance, in the senior bowl when he's you know rolling out to his right. He's got space there to take to take himself six or seven yards, just take yourself the seven yards and get down, take the plus play. 
but he decides instead to throw late back across his body to the middle of the field, which I have often said is a cardinal sin for quarterbacks. You just don't do it. And uh, he got the ball picked off in the game. And that's sometimes in those senior bowl games, you do get little snapshot moments of what you get with the player and, and the good and the bad and the ugly. And uh, unfortunately with Milton, for all the good he does bring with, with mobility is relatively decent and the arm is really nice and the throwing motion is really nice and he can probably make every NFL throw. Decision-making processing, a little bit of the two issues I think that will end up preventing him from being one of the higher rated quarterbacks in this draft and probably find him Julian somewhere in the neighborhood of about the fifth round, fourth round at probably the highest. Steve Dickman says center and right tackle. I'm with it, Steve. Sign me up. Offensive line. For all you that want offensive line, yes, sir. I da- I will dab you up on that. It's gun semi. I love Joe Milton the third. He's the guy that would be able to replace Gino in a year or two. I definitely like his upside for sure. I do feel like he's got a little bit of a long way to go, which is why I think he'll dip a little bit in the draft from that third round spot. But wouldn't shock me if he went there. Misfits says, I hope Dirt isn't called turd when the defense underperforms. <laughs> Me neither. Orlando is just scrolling through Twitter and it's crazy the amount of meat writing Richard Sherman does for the 49ers. Yeah, he's basically in, in retirement said that he picks himself to be more of a Niner than a Seahawk. I, I, that's what I feel like at this point. I don't feel like he'll out and out just come out there and say it because he knows if he says it, that's not going to be good for his whole online persona. But I think if I could put Richard Sherman on a lie detector test, that's what he would say. So good for him. Like you go to Richard and be like, Richard, do you want to go in the Hall of Fame as a Hawk or a Niner? And he'd be like, I want to go in as a Niner. I feel like we've reached that point of it, which is sad to see, but that's kind of whole Richard's whole deal, isn't it? It's like, I'm just, I want to piss everybody off for the sake of pissing people off. So go, Rich. You do you. Ringo, some guy climbed the sphere at the Super Bowl. And now, how is that even possible? I don't know that stupid sphere. Can we please get rid of that thing? Uh, Ricardo says, I'm pretty sure Sherman does it despite the Hawks. He's petty like that. Very petty. Very petty. Let it go. Scott and Colson and Cooper are the linebackers we should be interested in. Colson's familiar with McDonald's defense. He is. He'd know it like a, he'd fit it like a glove. He'd know every check, every adjustment. Not bad to have for the guy with the dot on his helmet. Both of them are really good players though. CMC, why later? Is Pumpkin a Niner fan? No. He's a Seahawk, tried and true. Yeah, Anthony Bradford had a very high RAS. Defense is going from the main team to division rivals. Still has got to be the craziest thing for a legendary member to do. <laughs> yeah, this definitely was in itself almost a spiteful move. Vaughn says that Bradford had what, like a top 20 or what was it? A Roz from Prospect Like Ever. He was the 99th percentile athlete, Hans. Anthony Bradford, how he tested. He's a He's a legit freak show in that realm. He sees his pumpkins rooting for George Kittle. I don't know. Let me ask her. Are you rooting for Kittle? I was like three no's. Yeah, she said no. No Kittle, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a no. Uh, Scun Summy, what linebacker in the draft is closest athletically to Roquan Smith? Edrin Cooper. Cooper's, Cooper's got a lot of close similarities with Smith. Misfit Bradford's explosive, strong, just kind of slow movement skills. Yeah, he's not a quick reactor in space, right? He goes out to block a guy out in space. Here, guys, here comes a guy flashing just off of his peripheral. He's not going to be able to adjust on the peripheral flasher and pick that guy up. He's going to be like, I got to get out to that block. Um, so, But some of that could be a little bit of also just 
the need to to be seasoned. He came out with, I think, only like 17 starts under his belt at LSU. There's there's a lot of room there with the guy. I think he's pretty young for him to have some upside still there to what he he maybe provides long term. Miss Fit I says I think we should uh, look at Devin White, 10 million versus a year versus Sports Rack. We know he's very fast. Maybe McDonald could do something good with him, half the price of Queen. I've always had a very big uh, fondness for Devin White, Misfit. I have. And uh, he's a guy that is a little bit divisive because of the fact that there aren't times where he's always playing 100 miles an hour. He definitely hits the cruise control button at times. And that frustrates people with his play. But he's big. He's rangy. um, He can hit. um, He is hard to get his hands on as a blocker, as a linebacker, as you'll find out there, just because he is so kind of rugged and and just, uh, just... Kind of ideal for the position in that respect. He can hit. Um, so he's got some holes in what he brings. He ain't perfect. But like you say, I think he would be a fit for this scheme for with his skill set and what he would per, be able to bring. Um, almost almost maybe half. I, I do feel like Misfit. Brooks is a $10 million guy. I do think that I know Sports Rack may have him at 10, but I think White's probably more your 12 to 13, in my opinion. So I think that there's probably like a, it's more like about a five, six million dollar difference from what Queen costs. More like, you know, 30% rather than 50% what you're saving. And I'm, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, I'm not completely opposed to it. He's not an older player. I like, I like White. So I got kind of a soft spot for him. Misfit. Uh, Haley B, do you think they'll ever increase active roster size? Kind of wish they'd bump it up to like 56 need more space for depth with so many games each year. I, I agree with you 100%, Haley, I do. Um, I laugh because what you have with each CBA negotiation is two different things each camp operates from. On the owner's side of the camp, what they hold in the highest regard is the percentage of profits that they can retain on every time that they sign a new CBA. The players have at the forefront of what they want most is less practice time. And then maybe a little bit more money if they can get around to it, as far as the percentage goes. So what that also kind of bears out of that, Haley, is that an ownership group that doesn't want to expand the rosters like they should, even though they got greedy and added the 17th game, they got greedy and added the two Thursday night games. They need to increase the roster size, but they don't do it because what it would mean for them is that they would have to give a bigger cut of the pie over to the players to make that happen because the players are not going to take a discount on their deals in order to build in a bigger roster size. And this is where we get to the where the rubber meets the road. And so, yeah, the owners should do it. It would be better for their product. It would be better for NFL franchises not to have to scramble on a weekly basis to to get just the depth they needed in any given position. It's ridiculous that the NFL hasn't made this adjustment already. But um, I don't know if they will, for those reasons I just said, Haley, where it's just what one puts one onus on, the other puts the other onus on, and neither two shall they meet. Ringo, the Chiefs have to win tomorrow. Can you even imagine these Niner fans for the next three years if they win? Just get it done, Mahomes. Biggest game of his career. Oh, I know. Niner fans are going to be insufferable for a long period of time if they win this game. And that's, yes. Come on, Mahomes. <laughs> I don't want Niner fans. I don't want to hear it. No. Haley says, oof, I can't wait to see Sharbs running angry towards a cornerback that's about to make a business decision. Me neither. Me neither. That was a thing of beauty watching him run with that power last year. Boy, he, he can punish tacklers, can he, Haley? Don Don, this is Hawks Nest. Hello, Brandon All. Hope everyone is well on what would be the what it would have been the 95th birthday of legendary film score composer Jerry Goldsmith. Oh, all right. Happy birthday to Jerry Goldsmith, man. Big Jer. Chad Hart says, go Hawks all the way from the great state, 48, Phoenix, Arizona. Let's go. Kevin Hines, G. Joe Milton equals Jamarcus Russell. It's more Jam- Jameis Winston to me. There's some functionality in his play, whereas Jamarcus was completely unfunctional. Sun it's gun some uh, wouldn't be nice center to get a rather than spending a first on JPJ. Yeah, there's some other options you can wait later on. You don't have to dress it early if you don't want Scun. There's some good center prospects in this draft. It's 
Sanchez, did we resolve the Gino argument? I think we did. It's quieted down now. Odds, really curious what Grub would design for or offense. No one knows what it'll be. It's like getting a tailor-made suit. True enough. True enough. Haley says, can we get Gronk out of retirement? Imagine him and Grub's offense. Wouldn't be bad, Haley. I'll tell you, there's maybe, I'm hearing some people trying to soften a bit on Brock Bowers. I'm just saying, man, if he slips, if he slips, I saw Brett Coleman trying to make some online reference the other day about Jatavian Sanders and Brock Bowers being closer, not as hyped on Brock. It's like, oh my goodness. Oh, it was, it was two and a half receptions for Sky Moore. I'd still go lower if it, receptions are, I meant receptions. I didn't say that right. Oh, 2.5 receiving yards. Wait a second here. That's not receptions. Uh, two and a half receiving yards for Sky Moore. I think I'd still go lower. I don't think Sky Moore gets a single catch in this game. I'm going to still own it. Dylan, people think Gino's bad because I uh, didn't work out in New York and they say he was a backup for a reason. Yeah, it's often what they reference, Dylan. It's, it's something I've heard a lot too. Ricardo says, I think Gino had a few bad sacks early in the season and that got imprinted into people's memory. He played a lot better near the end of the season. Agree. Yeah. And I definitely don't think he played perfect last year. It's like, well, it's everybody's fault, but Gino's. There's certainly some some room there for Gino to be better as well. Um, some of that I think is a symptom of some of the things going on that are outside of his control, some of it within. But good point. John Smirsky, I think Gino and Penix are the same type of quarterbacks, except the right left difference. So do you think it fits well with Grubb? I do. I think it's a fair comparison between Penix and Gino. I think they have some similar skill sets in what they do. And yeah, I think it's a fair, that's one of the things I, reasons I thought that Gino is a fitness offense and, and what Grubb bring. But uh, yeah, very smartly seen by you. I, I've seen the same, I see kind of the same things in him. I've got a bit of a different comp for Michael Penix and my outlook for him, but it's same kind of stuff, same kind of thing. AI hey, says we still have PT baggers around. <laughs> Oh, uh, Miss Fit Imagine drafting Bryce Young after trading up to 101. Couldn't be me. I, you know, you know, listen to me last year, Miss Fit. I was like, what are they doing? Dear God. Uh, Andrew Valencia. People like to hate on him, but I think JJ is better fit for us than Penix. He's raw, but has all the tools and is young. Great developmental pick. Higher ceiling, lower floor. Um, yeah, you'll have to sell me on that one, Andrew. I, the, 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 all the tools part is the part you're going to maybe miss me on. I think he's going to run like a four, seven forty, And I don't think he's going to have anywhere near the sort of arm strength that guys like Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix, Caleb Williams. Uh, I don't think he's even got Bo Nix's arm strength, quite frankly. And, and doing my evaluation on JJ Penix, uh, as far as him pu pushing the ball and how often he's asked to relieve and try to push the ball up the field. It's just not as much there as it is with other quarterbacks. Hans is just trading to the first overall pick alone. That's like Vegas style, all on red. Oh, it's pretty cray cray on that one. And the fact that they gave up a first round overall, n number one overall pick the year after is just, oof. Whew. Haley says, uh, what the F kind of dumb point is that? Pete couldn't control his players last season and he's not a new college coordinator. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing with that, Haley. Like, like, there's plenty of people that aren't able to control these guys that have been in this sport for a while. I'd say, if anything, right now with some of the newer generation of players that are coming up, you know, these kids that are have their own way of communicating, have their own way of responding to different styles of communication, that it doesn't really rely upon more of the old manner by which you would go, that you have to have a little bit of the newer ideas of how to get through to these guys, you know. Uh, Scott and Summy says, is JJ's a good developmental prospect, just not for the Seahawks. You have to be able to push the ball down the field, and that is not JJ's game. Bingo. Bingo. That's a dog named Bingo. AI says, Grubb has been highly successful at every place he's been. He has. 
And in the case of Fresno and UW, it weren't, these weren't guaranteed spots for success. Nobody's saying that juggernaut Fresno State. And UW wasn't exactly riding high after Peterson left with Lake here. Haley says, I just hope Shanahan loses. God, that would be delicious tears. That'd be so great. Oh my God, it'd be awesome. I'm definitely going to be over on some of the channels on YouTube after the thing watching it. Maybe, maybe, we'll, uh, maybe we'll go raid a Niner channel after the game if they lose. Should we do that, guys? Are we going to troll? Is that, is that too trolly? I think we're going to have to do that now. If, if Niners lose tomorrow, we're, uh, we're going to go raid last second sports or something. <laughs> let's, go be, uh, let's go be toxic tomorrow. Come on. We've been nice to him throughout the whole year. We can be, we can be uh, naughty for a day. Arico says, I've seen some film on JJ and he definitely has an NFL arm. It's weird that he didn't get asked to throw it deep that often, but they were playing with a lead a lot of the time. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't see necessarily the same thing on those throws with him down the field on, on the NFL arm thing. And um, I may be just indifferent on my outlook. Um, as I've said with JJ Ricardo with me, it's there's quarterbacks every year that, that I have that, people will try to sell me on and, and that I get told on, well, you're, you're not seeing it. It's this, it's that it's there. It's on the tape. Um, and in recent years, this has really come up when doing this evaluation process. And so I hardline on this a little bit. I, I was this way with Wilson. I was this way with Malik Willis. I was this way with Matt Corral. Um, I was this way, um, with Mac Jones um, I, we can go through a litany of quarterbacks of the last three years that I've been kind of in this place, but when I land on this place on a guy, and if you want to call it souring on them or whatever you want to call it, I'm not hating on JJ to say that he doesn't have some potential there to maybe you can unlock, but there's some limitations there and he's being driven up board so much higher than he should be. And he is going to be the guy as I was right about Zach Wilson, as I read about Malik Wilson, as I read about Matt Corral. As I write about Mac Jones, I'm going to be right about this one too. And I'm telling you with this one, it's not going to be a guy long-term that is going to be able to be a successful guy. His upside is at, his highest upside is basically Alex Jones, Alex Smith, when he was like reclamated to being somewhat functional as a quarterback. And while as, yeah, Alex Smith was a winner, right? When Harbaugh got there, became a winner, right? But then Harbaugh couldn't wait to move on from him for Callan Kaepernick. He couldn't wait to move on from him for the tools he got. And that's my whole thing with JJ is that I think the same thing happens is that you draft him and you end up just having these sort of wayward eyes for the talents that you don't have at the position that you can feel you're missing. And um, I do think with JJ that there's a distinct difference in arm strength talent between the rest of the guys in this draft. And if he's got an NFL arm, it's a barely NFL arm. It's not a plus NFL arm. It's not an upside NFL arm. And you're talking about this guy's, some people are vaulting into the first round. How do we get to that? We're, we're taking a guy then in the first round because he's a winner. If, if that is his, you know, kind of upside or abilities that he brings to the table. And it's again, acknowledging he's not going to run four, four, he ain't running four five. Some people tell me, oh, he's got mobility. He's a scrambler. He's going to run four, six, five, four, seven. That's, that's not a upwardly mobile guy in the NFL. Brian Neese is Sherman's an LA kid and went to Stanford. He picked San Francisco in general principles. I, I mean, but then Brian, why doesn't, why doesn't beast mode do that? He didn't go to Prince. He didn't go to Stanford. He went to Cal, but they're both, you know, not that far away from each other, really. Um, and even, even Marshawn was calling and you can go find the clip where Marshawn was calling Richard out on, on the lack of faithfulness to Seattle when they were in Seattle running that primetime show when Niners and Hawks were playing and Marshawn's like, you know, what are you talking about, Richard? You know, Marshawn was getting on him about it. Which just made me love Marshawn all that much more. I was like, yeah, let him know. You tell him, Mar. You tell him, Beast Mo. Haley, what are the chances Jamarcus Shepard comes to Seattle to be the wide receiver coach and passing game coordinator? I don't know on that. I don't know too much on Jamarcus Shepard, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Yeah, she's, she's like, rub my kitty. <laughs> she does want me to rub. She's like, she's like, come on. John, good God, how many replies do you read through? You do awesome job, but what do you think of Wagner coming back? I'm a little bit weird for new folks that are in on the chat, Sean. Uh, I do tend to go a lot of times four or five, six hours on my live stream shows because I just tend to, 
I like reading people's chats. I like reading people's comments. Uh, I will say a lot of it is, Sean, I have a community here of people that are what I would consider real deep thinkers and intelligent folks. And even folks that we disagree with, there tends to be pretty good back and forth and pretty good discussion on the debate, which I think is worthy of entertaining people in the discussion who are watching. Um, I also think that if you're taking the time to watch my channel, YouTube's a big place and you can be watching a lot of different content, a lot of different potential Seahawk content. I think the least I can do is try to get to as many people that want to comment or talk or have questions on stuff as I can. And um, it can lead to kind of frustrating some people, Sean, because I'm not at the bottom end of the messages and I'm not on the current message at the bottom, but it's kind of worked for me. And uh, I like doing it this way. You know what I mean? But I try to get to as many as I can. Hey, Sean, you need to address both middle linebacker positions or essentially the, the, the mic and the will. And that's hard to do in one off season. Bobby's already said he's willing to come back. He's already showed you that he's willing to take a little bit of a discounted deal to come play here. So if that's the case, then it all aligns up. And where you can bring him in, it's not going to cost a lot. You know what you're kind of going to get with him. You can go and draft or spend big money on the other position at that point, And that doesn't hamstring you. One of the reasons that the Ravens can't go and really re-sign Patrick Queen is that you've already set the market setting deal on Roquan Smith and teams don't pay both of their inside middle linebackers that kind of big money. So that's what's probably going to allow him to be a free agent. So I like it as an approach. He and Leonard Williams are really the, about the two only in-house free agents that I would look to bring back, bring back here. And Clowney would be a guy that I'd absolutely look at and, and want to bring back here as, as well, Sean. That would be 100% a guy that I, I've loved Clowney for a while. I've also said, though, when it comes to Clowney, I've got a, I've got a personal dog in the fight where I played games online with him when he was here and, and chopped it up with him a little bit and got a chance to just a little bit talk with him about Carol and Carol's defense and stuff um, offline. And um, he's got that dog in him, I'll tell you that. You know what I mean? Clowney's definitely got that dog in him. So I'd, I'd be with it. Lost my spot here. Sean says, uh, that's a cool shirt you're wearing. How do fans get one? I was able to just to locate this one up on uh, Amazon. So just do a quick search in Amazon Seahawks shirt. This one should come up pretty fast. It was one of the, the ones that was up there. So I was like, oh, I'm all over that. Yes, sir. I'm always on the lookout for some cool Seahawks shirts, you know. AI says, Clowney might happen. Sports track estimates he'll only command $7.4 million next year. It's going to be interesting to see what his market is. He, you know, he's a guy that never seems to be able to get the big multi-year deal, but he always ends up getting paid on a yearly basis just as kind of a, he's sort of a mercenary, um, which I don't mind, but he's a great player. And I, I've been banging the drum for Clowney for years. I think he had a really good year when he was here. I think he had a high prevalence of double team blocks and chip blocks when he was here, like he's had through a lot of his career. And one of the great things that Mike McDonald did was pull those double teams off of Clowney. And uh, you give Clowney one-on-one -on -one opportunities against a right tackle in this league and, and he can eat. And he's going to make it a long day at the office for that right tackle. And if I'm getting that for $7.4 on a one-year deal AI, hell to the yes. Jamie, Father Gill, let's give Bobby a two-year deal and then let's give Jay Davian a second shot with us. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Let's go. Yes, sir, Jamie. Yes, yes. Oh. AI says the Bowers isn't getting past the Colts at 15. Yeah, I, I can't see him dropping too far, AI. You know what I mean? I can't either. I think even once he gets past, I think like 12 is kind of a, just maybe even about a ceiling, 12 to 13. But if he does fall to 12 AI, do you look at maybe flipping a fourth to move up three picks and jump up ahead of a Colts team to grab him then? Haley, I want Bobby back. I think he dominates in Mike McDonald's defense. I don't see the hype with Bowers. Anyone want to explain why he's so hyped? Uh, outstanding production for a few years there now. A little bit of injuries battered him down this year a little bit, so I don't think he was able to be as maximally effective this year as he's normally been. He's got gigantic oven mitt ha hands. Really get good, good uh, catch of the ball. A uh, fairly solid blocker in addition to that. There are some shades to me of Gronk in his ability. And he gives you overall ability at the tight end position where he can be both dynamic as a pass catcher and there's some really true upside there to him as a blocker. So I think he's as strong and solid as a tight end prospect as we've seen for about the last five or six years, Haley. And it's been a, it's been a very lean group 
of guys offered over the last few years at that position. Even when you have guys that are upper level or considered that, you have it's more like a Kyle Pitts type that's more of a tweener between free safety and between uh, wide receiver and tight end. Ricardo Gino wasn't even that bad when he was with the Jets. Uh, just didn't have the consistency. His, name, his nickname was the Gino Coaster. I like that nickname. <laughs> no, he wasn't horrible there. And some of that was just lack of uh, talent they had on that offense. And, you know, you have John Heimer's your offensive coordinator and um, Rex Ryan is your head coach. Ringo, if they swallowed their pride and brought Wilson back, 100% of the fans would welcome him like water under the bridge. Hope they're at least considering it. Yeah, Ringo, he would not be a fit to this offense, though. Uh, I mean, this offense is going to ask its quarterback to play on time. Um, uh, at, at, as much of the, the head of it a bit. Um, I, I don't know if that's going to be a fit for Wilson's skill set at this point. John says, thank you for answering my question now. Uh, laughing out loud, how about the diversity of coaching hires? I think it's a die, do or die, let's hope. Uh, do I have faith? I like the diversity of where they've been, the variety of different places they've gone to. I think, Sean, that it speaks to that you didn't just go down one line of coaching tree for these picks, which then would have limited you on the coaching talent and really truly seeking the best guy for the job. I think what they've done with this whole coaching search from the head coaching search down to the coordinators on down is really truly searching for the best and brightest candidates that they can go out there and find across the board. And um, we'll see if that builds and eventually builds up the strongest staff. I think it will do do so. But at least from a, an approach standpoint, I think they've taken the smartest and uh, best kind of approach for this. Hans says the best game from Gino was against the Saints last year. I think the throws he made that day are crazy. Twice Lockett, Noah Fant, and then the Lions game. Uh, and Dallas, if he plays at that level every game. It's hard to play, I think, for a quarterback at the level he played at those games, Hans. I mean, that was just about playing damn near perfect football in those games. I mean, for instance, the Lions game last year, we didn't punt once in that entire football game. Geno had to play perfect. You had to have scoring drives on every single drive to win that game, including the final drive of the game. Um, but yeah, he's, the Saints game, you're right. I think he had the best big time throws in that game. I mean, there was three jaw droppers in that game of, as far as throws go that are just few guys in the sport can make those throws. The roll to the left, the fan, and the true to lock it. Um, up the field, 50 yards between two defenders, two different defenders' arms, dropping it in the bucket. Mr. Dog, are we grubbing? Oh, we grub hubbing. We grub hubbing big time. For being more Seahawks, would DK have been a value pick or anything can happen pick had he he had a high ceiling coming out of but had a major injury concerns? Kind of depends on where um, your where the team's feelings were on the injury concerns in his neck specifically. But um, he was a value pick for us at the the last pick in the second round. That was a guy that was tabulated to be potentially top ten, top fifteen in the first round, and you got him all the way at the last pick in the second round. That's Absolutely tremendous value. The dude disgusted another dude, B. Just bring up Kyle has a losing record, even if he does win. Also, what's the narrative if Kyle loses? Because let's be honest, he has the most pressure. The narrative is that he can stand up in big games. That Kyle Shanahan shrinks in big games. And I don't know if you guys saw him all boozed up the other night, a couple days before the Super Bowl, but I was like, hmm, somebody's under a little pressure, huh? A little tippy tippy. I don't know about you guys. I'd be riding dead sober through the week of Super Bowl week, man. <laughs> I'd be eight hours of sleep a night, getting up eating all the perfect food. Dylan wants to trade for Zach Wilson. That's a, that's a move. That would be a move. <laughs> Copper wise, I don't want to back. I love Pete Russ and what he did for the team, but just like Pete, it's time to move on. That's where I'm at too. Time for the new. Time for the new. AI, does Marshawn go in the first ballot? Uh, you know, Marshawn's going to unfortunately have to get over the top of a hill that has nothing to do with statistics 
or what the, what the fans think. He didn't talk to the media. Those media members get real bitter about this type of stuff. And I'm guessing with Marshawn, there's going to be a little bit of a draw to maybe punish him a little bit for the, I'm just here to, so I don't get fined kind of approach to the media members. AI, uh, AI says, internet says, JJ runs a 4.6. Yeah, he'll, it's 4.6, 5, 4.7, I bet at the combine AI. He's a 4.6, not laser timed. And then laser timed, it'll be 4.6 and 6.5, 4.7. But that's not upwardly mobile at the NFL level. Like that's, that's not going to get you away from, and he's not going to have, the thing he won't have in addition to that with JJ, the key on this too, is not just the 40 time, it's the 10 yard split. What allows a guy like Brock Purdy to be very mobile and get away from guys is that 10 yard split, that one, five, four, 10 yard split. With JJ, he's going to run more like a one, six, five, 10 yard split. So you, you, you don't have the long speed and you don't have the short twitchiness either as far as to get away which is why I can't say we can't lean on JJ go, well, he's got the mobility to lean on. He's not going to be able to lean on that at the pro level. So it comes back then to the arm. Uh, Ricardo, I think the combine will reveal a lot about JJ. If he runs a four five and throws the ball out of the stadium, he might be a good developmental second rounder. Definitely a guy that can only help his stock in that way, Ricardo, if he's able to do any of those things. Uh, if he can put a great 10 yard split, if he can throw right there step for step with the Caleb Williams and the, and the, and the Drake Mays and the Michael Penix, that's the thing is he's going to go out there and they're going to let those guys rip and those guys are going to take the big one woods out and they're going to let the big dog hunt. And then JJ is going to come and throw behind him and it's going to look like a powder puff arm comparatively speaking. But I could be wrong, but that'll be my bit of a bull prediction for what I think you're going to see when we get to that combine with JJ there. Haley says, I, think, I don't think Marshawn will get in the first ballot, but he should be in the Hall of Fame if only for the number of impact plays he created. Yeah, I, I do believe that I think Marshawn should be in the Hall of Fame because I think he was, along with Adrian Peterson, the back of his generation. And uh, that goes a little bit beyond maybe statistical impact, um, how he impacted the sport, his lasting impact on the sport um, is felt in a manner that is, I think, unique uh, for even running backs that are even in the Hall of Fame and that he will be remembered where a lot of other running backs in the Hall of Fame will be forgotten about. And I don't know if there's a, a select special way that we can consider somebody for the Hall of Fame that goes outside of, you have your statistics, you have all the longevity, you have your awards, that we can just say that it comes down to this, he did that. And if there's a guy that fits into that kind of mold of the, the Gale Sayers type guy, that maybe they don't hit all of the longevity things or all of the other marks that you normally would look for for Hall of Famers, but they have something special about them that is unique that would drive them to be a Hall of Famer, I think Marshawn has that and uh, deserves to be one. So I, I would love to see it as well for him to get it. I don't know if he does though. Ringo says, Marshawn admitted he lined up on the wrong side of that play, one play which might have caused the outcome right after he flipped off the sideline before the play. Great team player. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got some following choosing. <laughs> Uh, Sean says, thank you. Best show ever. You actually involve fans. Much love. I love my people, Sean. I, I love my people. Um, I got, I, I brag about it, but I believe it as well. I think I got the greatest community that you'll find out there on YouTube doing these live stream shows because everybody knows what time it is and people come in here and they understand what we're trying to accomplish here, which is not to bring in biases and narr and drive narratives. And I'll have things I believe certainly. And I'll make, I'll make, um, you know, um, grand arguments and cases for why I believe what I believe and why I think you should too. But I do try on the other side of it to involve those folks here in the chat to give them that other voice out there to be heard. Whether I agree, agree with it or disagree with it or not, to try at least let it be heard and, and let the other side of it because I think that you do get to the most well-rounded perspective by getting as many different voices as you can into this process. But it is it is really the community we got here, Sean, that makes it go. You know, and that everyone, we, we get very little trolls coming in here. It's It just doesn't, doesn't really work to come in here and do that. You know, it's we're just here to talk football, enjoy the sport, celebrate the sport, celebrate our team and... It, it's wonderful that we're all on that same page, but appreciate you. Very kind of you. Chad Hart, I want B-Wags and Jordan Brooks back. They're both stud, studs. Certainly in play. Certainly in play on both those two guys. Haley, Mafe, Williams, Sweat, Reed, Nuosu, Clowney. That's a crazy rotation. Don't forget Morrison there, Haley. Got Mike Morrison there too. I know he's a fifth rounder, but you never know with him. B 
B, even more Seahawks. B, if you read X, there's a strong indication that Grubb likes Gino. I think it makes sense. I, I do think that some, from where some of the fans might stand on Gino versus where coaches stand and coaches both around the league and outside perspectives looking in on Gino um, will make the same sort of co cognitive connection I'm making a little bit in his play and what he is up against. As I've said about the simplistic nature of this offense in prior years and last year and what we've got going forward, that any presumptive offensive mind that would look to come onto this team to take over this level of talent that they have to deal with will have the same understanding that I've talked to you guys about. That when it gets downstream this far to someone like me that is an amateur, that's just a talking head that's telling you, hey, we don't run the ball to the outside perimeter of the defense. We don't utilize pitch plays. We don't utilize fly sweep. We very little at times put in our, our screen game at all. We don't throw to the middle of the field at all. We've got whole parts of our offense on this field that we're tearing and ripping away. And if I'm seeing it that at this level, being a guy like me on YouTube yakking away at this, you better believe that an incoming coach is very well aware of these things. And the fact that a quarterback could not only find a, a way to even be somewhat decent in that environment slash be effective, I think that, that most average coaches are going to take that as an appreciative fact and not look at it as, I need to get rid of that. I need to, get, I, I need to throw that into the trash. That needs to go away instantly. I think they'll be going the opposite direction. So thanks for the note on that. And it's good to hear. I, and I, that, I, that's my prediction as well. I bet Grubb likes himself a lot of Geno and has not driven as much to the quarterback position and that being a necessity for him here out the gate. John says it would be a sad day in Seahawks history, but if they let Lockett go for salary cap reasons, it would be like Wagner leaving for a year. But do you think it's possible? It's possible, Sean. I think there's other guys that are going to make more, be, they're going to make a lot more sense to cut. And that uh, though Lockett's not in his prime anymore and though he's very expensive, I, I still think he probably comes back for at least one more year and you ride with him one more year and then you, you call it a day at that point. So my I'm anticipating that he still does return here at this point. But um, it is a possibility. It's in play. Haley, JJ throws at the combine, you think? Yeah, unless he gets one of those like, oh, my, uh, my hammy. My hammy's a little tight. I just, uh, I don't know. Just, I, I can't throw today because my hammy, because of the 40 that we did. I can't, because of that. I can't, I can't throw now. <laughs> uh, Chris says, I really want Patrick Queen and Geno Stone. I take Geno Stone over Diggs at this point. Both of them are potential. Geno Stone's got some hell, great ball skills back there. And uh, Patrick Queen, I think, makes as much sense as any guy on that Ravens unit to come over here. Chad Hart, where do I think Russell will be playing football with? What team? I think it's probably... I think it's probably down to like a, like a Falcon or a, a Raider team. Those are the two that sort of make the most sense to me. Yeah, I'll go with those. Hey, leave Locker goes, that'd be pretty rough. Hard to replace him for less than you'd be saving. It would be. Definitely wouldn't be an easy decision. That's why I don't think I'd like to do it. And there would be some dead money still really heavily attached at that point. Tommy says, but uh, you know who had a widely underrated career as a Seahawk running back is Sean Alexander. His stats are impressive, even with what happened at the end. He did put up some great stats, Tommy. He did. One of the great, another one of those great debates in the Hawk fandom is where if Sean deserves to be there. I do think I'd put Marshawn before I'd put Sean into the hall, though, even though I know Marshawn probably has a little bit more rushing yards, maybe a few more touchdowns on the ground. And he's got the MVP. Camille, how much do you feel like Jody Allen's firing of Pete Carroll had to do with fan perspectives such as yourself played into her decision process of letting Pete go and hiring Mike McDonald? Um, it's a good question. I suppose that there is definitely some impact 
um, to a degree, I guess, from maybe, you know, talking heads like myself, pontificating on this stuff. I, I don't know if that has as much impact, for instance, Camille versus, let's say, a Steelers game late in the season when you're playing for a playoff footing and trying to get in there, and yet you've got half your stadium filled up with black and yellow because your fans have sold all their tickets to Steeler fans. I, I think that as much as anything stands out to Jody in that moment when she looks down from her press box and sees that all across the stadium. Um, I, I do firmly believe a little bit here, Camille, that this was not an issue that just arose up this year. I think that this was something that Jody attacked two years ago with Coach Carroll and said that this is not in a state right now that's going in the right direction and this needs to start to find a different path and a different footing here so that we can see that we're not just stuck in place here. And I think that she came then two years later to arriving at a standpoint of you still being stuck in place, you not trending up in the right direction. Um, so it's, it's maybe a bit of an impact on this, but it, is this enough in itself for people like me to, to push this all the way forward to the other side of it? No, I don't think so. And I think some of this comes down to Camille. They had a meeting with Coach Carroll, you know, and you ask Coach Carroll questions on things and Coach Carroll doesn't have the appropriate right answers for solutions. That's going to stand out to you. You know, Coach Carroll, um, I, I, this isn't working. You, your, your methodology and approach here isn't working. You, you've got to, you know, we, we you got to change some ways here. We got to move in a different direction. Uh, no, I want to do more of the same. Coach Carroll, Jamal Adams' experiment didn't work. Two first round picks. We've dumped all this money into it. You got to release and I let it go. No, we're going to make Jamal work again next year. Like, I, I think it's all that just kind of cumulatively starts to add up, Camille, over all, all that stuff, stacks on each other. And it's just too many negative items at the end of the day, too many bad things. John says, Mike Morris is going to rise with Mike's defense. He knows how to put players in the right place. John, just go look at the uh, hug. If you look at Mike McDonald walk through the Seattle facilities and Mike Morris was in there. And second, he saw Big Mike. He, he braced him in a big old hug and he said, we're going to do some exciting things together. So uh, he definitely is hyped up about Mike Morris. and Mike. One of the only guys in this building that's got that, uh, along with Julian Love, that's got uh, familiarity with this scheme. A working locksmith, what round did they pick a quarterback in the draft? I think they'll pick a quarterback in the draft in the third round. Two third rounders in there, room for you to take one to a QB, one to a position. I think they're moving back in the first round, so they'll still end up picking up that second, excellent second rounder anyway. And so I'll go with the third round. They'll end, third or fourth round, they'll end up taking somebody, I think. Uh, cool Breeze, what is uh, Mike McDonald's tendency with man zone? Kind of like about a 75-25 zone man split. So you're getting more zone than you're getting man. But Cool Breeze, this is a caveat I'd like to put with that because the background of Wink Martindale is to play way more man than play zone. But the problem with Martindale's scheme with the Ravens at the time of the end was that he was playing too much man. And then when guys got injured in the secondary, his corners got injured in the secondary, he didn't have the guys that could then run the man-based concepts. And then they would just get cooked on the back end because Wink Martindale would keep running man even when his frontline guys were out. I think part of the adjustment McDonald did from Wink and his ploy on this was that if I do have the backup cornerbacks come in there or less talented guys that I'll go more to zone, that I can protect them a little bit more while still running my scheme. When you look to last year, to my point on this cool breeze, they had some injuries out there at corner. Their slot wasn't exactly fitted out the way they wanted to have it fit. So, you know, they had to, I think, maybe lean into running more zone because of that. But now maybe having Tariq Woolen and Witherspoon and their skill set working in the way that fits back to a little bit of the designs of how he's been trained in this defense, maybe they'll be willing to run a little bit more man because of that. Part of what McDonald has said is that a big part of what instructs him on how he wants to call, call plays and run a game from the defensive standpoint is to be able to lean to the strengths of the players and what they do well. Players on this uh, secondary between uh, Woolen and Witherspoon play man coverage as well as you'll find in this league, not on this just team, but as well as you'd find in this league. You got to lean in the, into those skill sets. Haley's with me. She says, Mike McDonald ran more zone, but that's because the Ravens cornerback sucked in man. That's, there we go. Exact mundo. If 
Phoebe says, if we draft a wide receiver that had an amazing talent, but raw and needed a year, who would that be? Good question. I would probably go with uh, Keon Coleman or um, Tez Walker. I think both of those two guys have some room for growth, but they offer a lot of physical, you know, a lot of tantalizing physical potential to them too. Brandon Rice isn't a bad name either, Haley. Haley says, Grubb's an offensive line background guy. He's looking at what Gino did with a no offensive line and effing drooling. I, I agree. I agree. Grant's paintings, I'm really interested to see where they're going to play Kobe Bryant. Me too. I'm, I'm thinking it's going back to corner for him. But the way that he can tackle as a corner and, and all that, I think it, it becomes more he's going to there. But boy, he's got a lot of potential places you can put him. Slot, safety. A lot in play on that. Chad says, Tyler would definitely be missed. Steve Largent is 100% the best though. Still remember watching Largent back in 1986. You know I believe that, man. I got his jersey up behind me. It's... Oh, that's my favorite all time. Favorite Seahawk all time. Mr. Dog, do I think Carol will help McDonald at all? Maybe. Kind of depends on the level of bitterness Carol has to the whole situation and how it played out, I guess, which I can't necessarily speak to. Cool Breeze says, Jody, how much is Hawks in that stream? So <laughs> that'd be awesome if she did. What's up, Jody? <laughs> Uh, Haley says, B, we need a discord to chat Hawks between streams and during big news. Haley, we got it. We got it. Uh, just go check down in the uh, description section below of this video and you will find the, uh, the link to, there should be a, a an invite there, uh, an invite link there to the discord channel, permanent link. So, uh, feel free, click down in there and, uh, I'm not as active. I gotta be honest. I'm just, sometimes I get caught up in too much work during the day, so I can't get over there to the, to the discord channel, but we do got one going. And eventually I'm going to get this cooking and going a little bit more lively. Also been doing a lot more as well. Haley over on the, uh, we just got affiliated over there on the Twitch channel. So uh, I'm going to be doing more stuff over on the Twitch channel as well. Be going to be doing a, I might even be this evening. Oh, we're doing like a Madden rebuild over there through the Twitch channel. So that's another spot if you're looking for having a little bit of an offline where there's not as many people in the chat, a little bit more of an ability to have some nice discourse where it's just a few people in. Um, you can catch me kind of on both sides of that is just a little bit of a different spot, you know. Evan says, give me stone, cloudy and queen. Love it, man. Those names roll together, don't they? And Ringo, you can absolutely criticize Marshawn, man. I don't know if you're going to bring a lot of people to that side of it, but I you know, absolutely. Calm cow. Hey, Brandon, love your stuff, man. Thank you, calm cow. I appreciate that so very much. I do indeed. John says, uh, I love both our running backs. Although I just watched film on Zach, I noticed he keeps both hands in the ball, which is good, but maybe it hurts his cutting ability. Yeah, he's a little more of an inside runner too, and you're trying to keep those hands in that ball extra just inside. You can't always see where the, where the guys' tacklers are coming from, where the hits are coming from. But uh, he had a great season, Sean, and I think we've got a, as strong a backfield as any in the NFL, as strong and as talented as you'll find. And um, I think that definitely Grubb's going to find a way to better utilize these guys moving into next year. Banana the Bad Guy Williams. How will the players on offense be affected by Grubb coming in? How do you think Grubb will utilize the wide receivers and tight ends? Uh, he has a 12 personnel guy for the most part. 
that's what he's going to lean into being. So you, well, not for the most part, but there's a frequent use of 12 personnel. So still going to get a lot of two tight end looks. It's not just going to be three wide receivers, one tight end. I think that that, that is part that Steph stands out uh, in his offense is that there's some fluidity there um, between the two. Um, how he utilizes them. I think uh, you're going to have things very much, I think, in similar place as far as your outside receivers go. I think JSN becomes your your slot guy still, and that's where he still remains. And uh, DK, your X, Tyler Lockett, your Z. And uh, you, you kind of still roll with those guys in that kind of similar roles. How he utilizes them. Do you see more DK in the slot at times? Yeah, I think you do. Do you, do you see more of a, a, a diversification in the route concepts that you're running? Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing that stands out to me is that one every eight plays in Washington, they're running a bubble screen. So does that just become all on JSN? Is there more of an attempt to utilize a guy like Derek Young for that that role? Is it, do you try to make more of a bobo guy work like that with that? Um, even DK, a uh, guy you haven't used a lot, utilized a guy as a lot in that role as your kind of bubble guy is, can he do that stuff? And I'm not sure at this point, Banana. I'm not sure at this point. My give and take on this might be that they might need to find another receiver there with a little bit more yak ability um, to make the bubble screen stuff work and make the throw it to him in space and let him go. But because there are shot plays within this offense, there's still some deep developing plays in the passing attack in this spread offense. I think that still does definitely open the door for guys like Tyler Lockett and DK to still find their their place and and be able to still be very successful within the offense. I don't think any one player stands out as being more benef- benefiting from grub than another um, outside of the running backs, which I think are are definitely going to be helped out by his presence. And tight ends, he uses, he's, a, he's more of a receiver guy, but he will f- work in those tight ends. Tommy Hawksnest, I thought for a minute that that with all the Michigan and UCLA guys we have drafted, we were going with McDonald and Chip and knew it two years ago. I was like, damn, John, pre-planned much? <laughs> he does like to say he's got a two and three year plan, so... You know, he's man, he's true to his word, I guess. <laughs> I think he had some preferences, Tommy. I think he had some general preferences he was thinking about the last few years and and guys that he had grown grown fond of. Uh, you hear him talking about the game in Baltimore this year and and talking to the players about dealing with Baltimore and what that experience was like for them and him being just like, wow, they're really this see this game seems like it hit different on some of these guys, and indeed it did. Kind of feel like that. Kelly Hawk, no way just any running back can run 1,800 yards behind Walt Rush. Behind, no way. Any running back. That's one of the things where I ding back Sean from Marshawn is I just think there's a difference between the two and what each got as far as run blocking went. Uh, offensive approach, you know, all of that stuff was just, it's, it's keenly different for Sean's time. And you can't, you, know, you, can't, you can't take away from the fact he had two Hall of Famers blocking for him on one side of the, on one of the side of the field. Not to take away, no, I mean, Sean's still a really good player and a fun running back. No doubt about that. Chase, what do I think we do at tight end? I think we probably keep Disley and then draft a guy or two. Maybe sign a guy on a low-end deal as the number three who's on like a one-year $3 million deal or something like a functional tight end in the league. Ricardo, it's hard for any running back that didn't have an MVP season to get in the Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. I I, I think even there's probably been a couple guys that got an MVP seasons that aren't in. So, uh, yeah, running backs just have a hard time in general. There was that whole thing that happened about 10 years ago, right as we were getting into the end of the running backs era, you know, where they were real really highlighted portion of the offense, right? Where you'd have 15 guys a year with a thousand yards. And what happened at that point is you end up with a log jam of 10,000 yard backs. And that log jam of 10,000 yard backs has created a situation where there's just not as many guys now who can get in who you might've thought w- would have been no brainers or a back now to go get 10,000 yards. You'd be like, oh yeah, he'll definitely go get in there. But it's harder. It's harder for those guys to have uh, have it happen because there is so many sitting in that spot. Our cheetah package is about to be crazy. Yes, it is, Chase. <laughs> Hell yeah. CMC later. Oh, yeah, later. Says Super Bowl predictions. I understand our rivalry, but fuck AFC. Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll give you the two things on this, CMC. And I, I appreciate Niner fans in my chat always. And I understand, you know, you got to understand on this. You guys win. I got to hear it from you, Niner fans, all throughout my offseason. There is going to be at least a minimum of a three troll. There's going to be a three troll over on every stream on why you guys even talking about what your team's doing. We just won the Super Bowl. So what does it matter? Okay. And that's not bad for about the first three million times I hear it. But but by the time we get to the the draft, I'm gonna be way over it. And um Rams Rams fans and went off season wore me out on that stuff. So for that reason alone, you kind of get me out on you guys winning for that. Now, if you want to talk about the breakdown of, of, of how it plays, the Niners are not gonna run away from running the ball like the like essentially the Ravens did. They will stay committed to running the ball, and that's going to challenge that defense in the way that you have to challenge that Chiefs defense. But Spagnola has really done a good job of building in more of the stack fronts and stack boxes, I feel like, at times, to slow down the rushing attack of, of teams that run the ball well. And so they're going to press things down on the Niners. They're going to run man-based concepts. They're going to you know not make things easy for Purdy where he can just dink and dunk his way. He's going to have to make big-time throws throughout the course of the game. And uh, whether he does or doesn't, it's probably going to dictate whether the Niners win that game or don't. You know, If on those three or four throws that he has to make over that course of that game, does he make those throws or not? You know, uh, CMC, you go back to a couple of years ago with Garoppolo in that game, right? You're limiting his amount of throws. You're trying to limit him and what he's got to do. He's got that one throw he's got to make down the middle of the field. Got his guy wide open and he just ends up overthrowing him. And then that turns out to be game. I think you're looking at kind of a similar thing with Purdy in this game where he's going to have a couple of throws and whether he can hit him or not is, you know, what, uh, what will determine his success. AF says, I've been listening to the whole stream while delivering for Amazon. Thanks for the entertainment as always. Well, thank you, AF. It's my pleasure. I, I love what I do. And I just love the thought process of somebody just being at work here and listening to me in the background. That's always been a way I've consumed this kind of content myself and in my own way. So uh, thank you for that, man. I hope uh, the day's wrapping up and you're about to open a cold one and kick back and be able to relax a little bit. And yeah, the Discord channel should be down in the description link. I think it's, uh, do, 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 do I not have it in there? Oh, maybe I, no, I got it down there. Yeah. Well, maybe I don't. My bad. Wow, we'll get that. I'll post that up here in the chat then. Crazy, I thought I had that in there. Discord is not in there. Well, that, I guess that's the good reason why it's not been popping as much in there, huh? All right, I'll get that up in there. We've got one created though, so it's good to go. There is a Discord, Haley. I've not done a good job of promoting it. I'm I'm bad with it because I've been worried about promoting it because then people expect me to be in there and I'm like, I got already enough work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I can't I can't be in a Discord 24/7 on top of on top of everything else. But I do pop in when I can. And uh, let's uh, let's get an invite here. Get an invite to you guys. I'll pin that for you guys there. Do, 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 do. Uh, Chase, uh, thank you for the $5 donation. I appreciate it, Chase. This is, what are some quarterbacks you could see Seattle targeting in rounds two to three? Um, so this has gotten hard for me through the process. Uh, if you asked me this a month ago, it would have been a really easy answer for me, Chase, because I had a whole collection of guys I was looking at. Uh, Riley Leonard and uh, Cam Ward and maybe Quinn Ewers would be in there and uh, maybe Spencer Rattler would be in that territory. Now it would seem to me that we, we, we've got a lot of guys that have been pushed up into the first round and um, are not going to be available for us in the second and third who look like they might have. I don't even know if by the time we pick in the second round, Spencer Rattler will be sitting there available. 
So the list has gotten pretty small of guys who could be taken in the second and third round to me. Now, part of that is because of that, the guys returning back to school, like the Riley Leonard's, like the Cam Ward's, like the Quinn Ewers. Part of that is the guys that have been pushed up the boards, like a Jaden Daniels, who's now basically a top five pick and how he's looked. So Bo Nix as well on this chase, a guy that was looked at as maybe a second, maybe third round guy, somewhere in there. Now he looks like he's going to be pushed pretty hard up into the first round. Maybe not in the top half of the first round, but in the first round. And so that's, that's lightened the load here for me, Chase. It's more of now you get to the fourth round is where I would look to probably pick. If a Rattler lasts the third round, I'll jump on Rattler in the third round. If a Knicks lasts the third round, I jump on, on, on Knicks in the third round. I don't think they, they're going to. And then I just don't. So I end up with not very many guys at that point uh, worthy of picking. I mean, you're kind of looking at, the, here's your list, I think, by the time you get to, the, to let's say, the midpoint of the second round. Maybe J.J. McCarthy, Jordan Travis, Michael Pratt, Devin Leary, Devin Leary, and Joe Milton. You know, who, could I see us maybe looking at a guy like Jordan Travis, for instance, who's got some shades to him of a bit of maybe some Russell in his game? Yeah. Yeah, I could. Maybe see them in the third round jump on a guy like that, but that'd be a little one round early. So it, it has gotten lean chase. I can give you an answer like that, but I would say but my feeling on this is that it has gotten a lot, a lot, lot leaner than I thought it was going to be. Um, doesn't mean I don't still think that they don't potentially still target a guy in there, but I think that's why maybe John gets driven more to the fourth round, fifth round, looking at a Travis, looking at a Pratt, uh, a, a Michael Pratt out of Tulane, um, or Joe Milton and goes that route instead, rather than going in the third round where the value for a different position might be much better. Like defensive tackle might look a lot better at that point versus kind of reaching then for the quarterback in that position. But thank you, Chase. I appreciate the five dollar donation. I wish I had some better answers for you, but right now looking through these quarterbacks initially, it's been it's leaned out. So many of those guys returning, man. Any of Riley Leonard, Quinn Ewers, any of those guys, I would have been like, hell yeah, third round. Let's go. And Haley, yeah, definitely please pop in the Twitch chat. I'll probably be on playing tonight. And um I'm I'm gonna be on a lot there now that we got affiliate status. I want to have the Twitch channel be a little bit more of a low key, less intense, just kind of laid back thing that we can kind of do. And it hopefully we'll provide a little bit more of an a uh, um intimate discussions we can have on that side versus where I know sometimes I've got to roll through so many in the chat, especially like today when we get up over 354 and people in the chat and you're like, it's a lot. So it's hard to get as much of the interaction back and forth because I'm just all I can do to stay on top of the chat, so to speak. Cool Breeze watching B play Fortnite was pretty funny. Not gonna lie. It was a change though. Yeah, it's a little different. It's a little different feel, a little different flavor. Be more Seahawks, Brandon. Uh, Madden B, let's go. So many schematic questions I want to ask. Madden would be fun, both to kind of do a Madden rebuild and also to do some things of showing some coverages and things that you'd see on the field because um, I think it's a good way. Madden does a good job with how it at least shows some of the schematic stuff and, and setups to where it can be a pretty good way to sort of show as far as, far as a general teaching, tool, general teaching tool on how things kind of work. Mr. Dog, y'all play Fortnite too? Add me. I do play. That's been one of my main games. I'll be doing some COD. I'll be doing some, we'll be kind of flipping it around a little bit. Tommy says Pumpkin's the most pettable cat. She is the most pettable cat. Look at that face. Look at that. How do you not pet that? She gets a little cutesy look on her face. She does the whole puss and boots thing from Shrek. She's got that whole look down. And she's a deep purr. Very deep on the purr. Fleece the Mac. I heard Brian Birds is going to be a free agent. I want him. Come here, Is Carolina really not going to franchise tag him, Fleece? After all they did not to take, remember they turned down two first round picks from the, I think it was the Niners a couple of years ago. Uh, will they really not uh, even put the franchise on him now at this point? Gobri says, nap time is over for pets and salmon. Yeah, she's definitely like, it's salmon time. <laughs> Uh, Calm Cow, is it good or bad that our OC is also our quarterback coach? Don't know how I how to feel. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that there's been success in the past with coaches being both OCs and quarterback coaches. And you certainly can't deny with the work that he's done with Jake Hayner at front of the Snow State or Michael Penix recently that the man's done a very good job in guiding his recent quarterbacks. I feel okay about it. I feel pretty good about it. Lord Boom, Brandon, what is your Twitch handle? How do I find you on Twitch? Uh, never been on Twitch before, but if you're on there, I'll check it out. 
I just downloaded the app. So you can find me on Twitch. I am the Seahawks Nest. All one, uh, all one word on Twitch. You can also find it down in the description section. I know I've got that in the description section. So if you look on the description, I've got, uh, it's uh, the Seahawks Nest. It says Twitch dot 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 the Seahawks Nest. If you just type that Seahawks Nest into Twitch uh, search functionality, I'll try to get the whole link on there in later, later weeks here. But if you just type that into the search box, I'll be the first thing that comes up there at the top um, for you on that. And then just sub on up. But I'll be... Uh, on the Twitch channel, I'll be going probably about three times a week over there in the evening time. So if you're looking to have a little bit more discussion over there and, and just pop on in, it's not a not the worst of idea. And I'm hoping it provides a little bit of a place for some folks of you that I know we can't always catch me live at the certain times or you're just not able to get your comment in or question in because we'll just get overflowing in the chat. I'm hoping it can provide a little bit more of a space for the for you folks on that. To, um, so we make sure we catch everybody. So I'm not we're not getting anything coming through a little bit. But it's the Seahawks Nest on Twitch. Willie Del- Deloney, five game five game winning drives in one season doesn't constitute an it factor. Uh, Willie, you speak to exactly what I don't get with it, man. And uh, this is where uh, the you know the line keeps getting moved through the years because a lot of the people that that would tell me and and quite frankly, Willie, a lot of the the, the names that I will hear from people that are anti Geno right now were anti Geno two years ago, and what they would tell me at that time is he is what he is, he is what he is, he is what he is. I go okay. And, they, and then they would say things like, well, he might be able to be productive, but he's not going to be able to lead you from, from, you know, a quarterback's ultimate value is determined by what they do, being that most games come down to the final possession. And then vis-a-vis with that, then mo- a quarterback's value is then completely derived from what he's able to do with the game on the line in that one final drive, you know? And, and the inference was that Gino would shrink in those moments, that he wouldn't be able to rise up in those moments, that he didn't have what it took inside him, right? They had a general gut instinct that he just didn't have like that it factor thing. I'd love that you use that word because it's perfect. Um, and that's what they would reference. And then he goes out there this year and leads the league and come back from behind uh, victories. He's out there doing it, getting touchdowns, not field goals. Um, he's doing it on days where at times where he almost has to play perfectly offensively to get the job done. And then you still don't see much move on the spot then from folks that are, that told me that two years ago to go, okay, well, maybe he can make you come from behind. But then, you know, it, it just, you, that's where I always say with this in this discussion, it just, the Geno discussion, like the Russell Wilson discussion before it, like the Coach Carroll discussion before it, um, the camps are passionately in the camps that they are in. They believe passionately what they believe. And I, I don't think either camp moves the other camp to the side. Um, I'll let my audience and the folks out there decide which is the which is the one that has a an approach that they're building upon logic and reason, and one that's built upon potentially, in my opinion, a little bit more of emotionality and sentimental um, sentimentality, and those type of things. But yeah, Willie, I, that one makes me laugh too. Uh, Banana, the bad guy, Williams. What are your thoughts on the defensive coordinator from Dallas that we hired? I, I think it's a good hire, Banana. I think he's done a great job of of really maximizing the talent there on that Dallas defensive line. Because when you look at a, a defensive line coach, it becomes, you know, what do you do with the stars? What do you do with the role players? What do you do with the whole unit as a whole and their strengths and their minuses? And what stands out to me with that Cowboy unit is that it's a team that generates, really does a good job of generating pressure and, and not only generating it from the front line guys, but generating it from the depth. A guy like Dorrance Armstrong last year gets you a seven and a half sack. Sam Williams, four and a half sacks in a part-time role. Seems to get pretty good efficiency from his pass rushers. Can't deny the work that he's done there with Micah Parsons from the day he's walked in the door. And uh, <clears throat> even been able to continue to get Demarcus Lawrence playing at a really good level himself. So when I uh, look at uh, him as a coordinator, I think he's done a good job, Banana. I, I think, though, too, his his role on this team and and how much is on him and his and his shoulders is lessened a little bit when you consider the presence of Mike McDonald and Leslie Frazier. And so I think that that does, that does end up removing that down just a little bit in the how much, versus let's say the offensive coordinator, which was maximally important because you didn't have that same kind of support structure in place. So it, it's an important hire. You want to get it right. Eventually he might be the guy actually calling plays and taking that over for McDonald. But um I uh, I think it was a good solid hire, you know, solid hire. He seems to do good stuff. I watched a little bit banana of his, um, you know, they had them had him mic'd up on, on the uh, that that training camp show they've got on HBO behind Hard Knocks, and uh, he seemed like he spoke with pretty good presence. He's a Brit, he's a British guy, so it's odd when you hear the 
half the time they had the Cowboys players mocking his accent. So hopefully the players aren't just sitting there going, got too long left. Got too long left. Curl twist. You're going to curl twist it. You're going to curl twist your twat, eh? You're going to twat your curl twist. And you're right, Haley, I didn't get that. Uh, that was my bad. I didn't get the link in the... Just, I thought that I had that link buried in this, but I got to get that added. I got a pin, though, now. Mr. Dog says, we really shook things up. It was just some OC that got promoted to head coach. They completely rebuilt this coaching staff. They completely rebuilt it, Mr. Dog. It was going to be from, from bottom to top, all the way through. Let no stone go unturned. Interview just about everybody in America for every position you've got. I think they went through this pretty thoroughly and exhaustively. Whether the hires will be right or wrong, they did do this as far as tried to go and seemingly find any candidate they could that would be a potential guy for the staff and look at them very closely. And um, no guarantees for success, but at least you did it all you could to try to find all there was that was out there. I don't know, Ringo, I've heard Marshawn talk about the play in the last couple of years, and I don't hear him whining in interviews uh, as much. He gets pressed a lot in interviews to quote unquote whine or do that. But I, you know, I, I think when it comes down to it, I think that he's, he's been pretty good about being pretty chill about it. Has Marshawn in retrospect, he'll be honest about it, but I think he's been pretty fair about the process too. House says, I love the fact that Seattle is swinging for the fences. It may crash and burn, but they may also hit it out of the park. What a fun, exciting time to be a longtime Seahawk fan. It's the unknown. And it's the unknown, House. That's right. Boom or bust. But there's a lot of just there's a lot of potential there with the staff you put together. And swinging for the fences is a great way to put it. I agree. You didn't go for the double. You didn't just try to put solid contact on the bat. You didn't just try to barrel it up. You, took, you swung from the back of your ankles and this thing might go up into the second deck. Why are you mad, bro? Says, I hope we don't draft Penix. There's a good amount of people kind of not in on Penix. Makes sense. John says, you know your stuff. Thank you. What role do you think the uh, Titans will play with Grubb? I think they'll still be pretty active in this process. He likes his 12 personnel, so you're not just going to see one, but two tight ends. Westover, whenever Penix needed to go and, and utilize his tight end for a tough third down completion or a big play in the game, he would go look, not necessarily to Adunzier, McMillan, or Polk. He'd go out there to Westover. And uh, so it seems like at times, at least with the offense, the way Penix ran it, where you, know, you didn't maybe feature the tight end at the forefront, but that was definitely the guy that you would go to as the chains mover. When you were looking to target the middle of the field, you were looking towards that tight end. So uh, he's used a bit of tight ends in the past. It's obviously this is more receiver driven as an offense. Maybe you could even say, Sean, more running back driven as an offense before it gets to tight ends. But they still do have a role. And it still will be important to have two functional ones instead of just having one that you're just trying to get by with. GLP says, mortal lock for tomorrow's game. Me crushing a plate of nachos. Book it. <laughs> Let's go. Nachos sounds good. Uh, Randall McDaniel, thank you for the $20 donation. I appreciate you for that. It's great to see you in the house, Randall. Thank you so much for that dono. Hope you're doing well, bro. He says, hey, bro. Did Grub call plays at UW? Any concern about his ability to or willingness to commit to running the football? Nothing is a sure thing. Uh, success is an OC at pinnacle of college football. Sure is a leading indicator of successes. Well said on that. Um, in that, as you say, there is, there is no, no sure thing in this game um, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, everything is a little bit of a guessing game on this. Everything is a little bit of a risk. Some things are bigger risks than others. But um, I, yeah, I, I agree with you that... Um, I like the upside of this move. I really do. I like the potential of this move. I, I think that this is one that has the boomer bust, but if I, was, it was, if I was making this hire, Randall, on the onset, and I was saying in general terms, what do I want to look for on this hire? I would say, I want to push on this side of the ball, the offensive side of the ball, as hard as I'm, as I'm pushing on the defensive side of the ball. And, and that would be definitely where I would want to lean into with it. 
um, being that I'm, I'm trying to go cutting edge on offense or defense, let's go cutting edge on offense. And I think that they've, they've taken that step with now here this approach. Uh, last year, you had 574 total attempts for the UW. You had 411 carries. So definitely there's a discrepancy there. Trying to find my damn calculator here. Hold on. Do, do, do. Let's, let's do the calculator here. So, four. So, we got 985 total plays. So, you basically passed 58% of the time out at UW. So, I, I would say, you know, 58% of the time to, to 42%. Um, is a little bit of a, is, you know, a little bit more, maybe the discrepancy you'd want to be than ideal. But I also don't think it's crazy. It ain't like 70% like you've seen from some college offenses. Remember Randall with, for instance, Charles Cross, when he was coming out, they, they had like a 73% pass to run rate. And that's, remember, coming with, with uh, Charles Cross, that's with him coming out of the, the air raid zone concepts, a lot of the air raid concepts from an offense that we, that the Huskies were putting out on the field as well. So at least from a spread-based conceptual standpoint, you know, he's kind of the, uh, you know, he's kind of the Chuck Knox of spread concepts. If you think about it from his pass to run rate versus, I think, other guys. If you were to look at a Mike Leach, Randy, or, or Randall, or Chip Kelly, uh, I do think that you would have seen a bigger discrepancy in you know, Kelly at Oregon, for instance, versus this in the pass to run rate, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, I, I do think that he'll he'll be fine with the commitment and running the ball. He's He runs, to me, you want success in running the ball at the NFL level. It's less about a guy that's got a commitment to running it and the number of plays that he runs. And it's more about the type of running plays that he runs. Does he have a diversified attack? Does he work to the perimeter? Does he embrace the movement of offensive linemen and getting them into space? These are the things that he does, Randall, which to me would lead itself and lead me to believe that you will find um, a solid ground game. You will find an ability to make some headway there on the ground uh, you know, with his approach. So I don't have any issue there. And yes, uh, he did call plays out at UW. So uh, he's got that background in doing that. So no issues there. Been doing it the past two years. So you feel pretty good about that. Uh, and as you say, Randall, there's no guarantees on this. And something that I keep coming back to that I think people got to keep in mind with these kind of hires, coordinator hires especially, not head coaching hires, but coordinator hires, is that they, you don't marry yourself to them long term. If it goes bad, if, if Grubb is completely in over his head, if he's drowning from the second he walks out in the football field this next year and every other game like that is a, is a representation of that, you can quickly mid-season move off of him if it's horrendous. So if that's the case and you can move off of these guys anyway, Randall, so very easily and you're not married to him easily, why not go for the biggest boom? Why not take the biggest swing for the biggest opportunity of success out there that could be had? Because if it goes wrong, who cares? You can always go and double back down to the boring candidate who will give you the high floor but the, maybe the lower ceiling. And I'm good with it for that reason. Uh, one sec, let me get some water here, folks. Randall, thank you for that uh, $20 donation. I appreciate you for that. Dude disgusted another dude. I'm mad about it. I was in the wrong chat. I might have put the wrong link. It's uh, Hawks Nest Central. That's where you want to go to. But I'm going to try to be a little bit more on the Discord channel if I can. D. Swan says, go Hawks. Can't wait to see our team next season. Free Palestine. <laughs> well, thank you, Z. Swan. Appreciate you for that. And the Hawks looking good next year. Mr. Dog, Hawks Nest, do you play Fortnite on PS5? I do on Xbox, Mr. Dog, but uh, it's cross-play. So it, you can go between PS5, Xbox. 
PC on uh, Fortnite. But I do them both. Both. Haley says, I used to be anti-Gino. I've changed. That's great to hear. I think there's been a few folks like yourself, Haley, that have done that. And I'd always say that's an indicativeness of a football, smart football mind is not that, that you are right on everything at the forefront. And then, well, see how brilliant I am? I was right on this at this thing back three years ago. It's about getting it right. Um, and that's the part I can appreciate about the change of stances on Gino with that, that do look at it that way, where it's like, I understand the initial look at it to say, well, he's a career backup. He's this, he's that. All that stuff would have been fair. Um, in the outlook of it, but with two years of new data and two years of him out there performing, doing what he's doing, then you got to move with it, you know, and uh, good here. Haley says, I, I feel like teaching a lefty quarterback must be difficult if you're not also a lefty. Unfortunately, Mike McDonald is a lefty. Fortunately, Mike McDonald is a lefty. Let's go. Haley, I'm also a lefty. It's not that hard. We just look weird throwing things. That's the only thing. Cool breeze. Sometimes it's crazy to think about how many people in these streams because I feel like maybe 20 to 50 actively chat, but it's awesome that so many people watch your streams nowadays. You've been killing it for years now. Thank you, Cool Breeze. Yeah, we are, we're rolling, man. We get a lot of, a lot of folks in the stream, especially game days, man. We've been pushing up into eight, 900 folks in there at times when we're, when we're rolling along. We've gotten over a thousand before in, in the stream here. Um, so it's, it's definitely gets, it's getting cooking. You know, we're definitely feeling that growth on, uh, on game days. I can see it on the viewership. It's great to see. Feels good, man. The future is definitely bright in a lot of different respects. John says, thanks. I'm older. I think I signed up. Let's go. Pumpkin loves pets. Haley, Haley, uh, Haley says, Michael Penix is the Taylor Mays of this regime. I swear. That's a great reference. And Haley's, of course, referencing Taylor Mays in the draft that you had the potential of taking Taylor, but you went with Earl Thomas instead. Uh, and everybody thought uh, Carroll was going to take Taylor Mays because he was the safety he had at USC. He had recruited him. You know, he had talked him, to, talked him even to coming back to college rather than going into draft the prior year. Um, but uh, Pete was not, not a big Taylor guy. And Pumpkin is definitely pet mascot of the year. AI says, Gino better than Hasselbeck? And we went to the Super Bowl with him. Why? Because two Hall of Fame offensive linemen. I can see that argument made. I can get that. I, I totally can understand that aspect of it. Haley says, I wanted to win pet of the year, Pumpkin. <laughs> it's hard to compete with her though, Haley. <laughs> she's, 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 a, she's a lot of cuteness there to, to, to deny. <laughs> Uh, a few more Seahawks. Hey, B, when, when is your next uh, call-in show? We uh, have most of our coaching staff, and Thursday is February 15th, is the next day before most the guaranteed kick in the next day. A lot to discuss. Probably we'll try to, we'll try to see if we can fit it in next week, Feed Me. I'll just see if I can do the call-in show for the uh, members. <coughs> so we'll try to maybe shoot for next Thursday, if I can make it work. I'm down. We'll show. Then Lunatic, they've never even let us host when we had a dome. Oh yeah, we're not getting the Super Bowl here. Especially not with the lack of dome now, that's for sure. Are you going not into a conspiracy theorist, but like Farrell said after last year, these dumbass refs ruined the effing Super Bowl. Most ticky-tack holding call ever. Should be interesting if it's a close game. But yeah, the NFL's got to make that a bit of an onus coming into this. The past two Super Bowls, you haven't called defensive holding in the secondary for an entire football game. And then on the last drives of the game, you decide to start calling it uh, conveniently. So you, you got to call the game the same way all the way throughout, which has stood out the last two years in these key moments in the games, both that Bengals and Rams game and, and last year's game with the, the Chiefs and the Eagles. And hopefully, uh, hopefully they do that, Ringo. Because it, if, it, if you have another game like this where you go three and a half, three, three and three fourths quarters without ever calling defensive holding in secondary and then suddenly decide you're going to magically call it, it's like, wait, hold on here. You know, because that's one of the things where you get to say, well, we're just calling by the letter of the law, but you weren't calling it by the letter of the law throughout the whole course of the game. You've got to be consistent with it. And it's obvious to fans when you're not. Mr. Dog, any heat on JS if the staff is a flop? Oh, yeah. No doubt, Mr. Dog. No doubt. 
He got it. He got out a bit unscathed a bit from the Carroll situation, but I don't think he got out without any sort of like knowing, you know, you, you don't have some free pass here at this point, you know? So, yeah. King Tay says, do you think Grubb is an upgrade over Waldron? I do. King Tay. Yeah. I think in, Wal in, in Waldron, you're trying to just essentially pluck from the tree of McVeigh and hoping that that would bear fruit. With this, I think you know the fruit's a little bit more ripened than what you're getting. I don't know with Waldron, though, for sure, on the kind of coordinator he is. I think some of what he had happen go on there, King Day, was him being held back a bit by the philosophies of the team and, and how they wanted to operate offensively. Hey, they all keep saying it. Better to try and fail than to stick in persistent mediocrity. Me too. I agree, Haley. Yeah, I, I definitely agree on that one. So uh, uh, I'm with it there. Um, cool Breeze uh, call and show or Twitter space. We'll do a call and show Cool Breeze on the members channel on Thursday. So five o'clock Pacific Standard Time. I'll get a link out for it. But we'll do a call and show at that time. I think that would be a good, a good time to get it running. And you're a member of the channel, so you should get a link. Just keep an eye on your community post if you're a member of the channel. And I'll be posting it out over there to that. Ricardo says, if Mike McDonald feels like it's going to be a home run, Grub, I'm less sure about. That's fair. That's completely fair. Cool Breeze, GSN's media appearances have been gold the last couple of days. He seemed the most relaxed on KJ's spot. I haven't had a chance to check out the KJ appearance, but it was interesting hearing him talk about Waldron. Haley says, we should name it uh, Super Al Field. NFL won't let us toast, so we'll make our own. I'll have blackjack and hookers. <laughs> there we go, Haley. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Blackjack and Nuggets. Oh, that'd be a hell of a game. Randall McDaniel, thank you for another uh, $5 donation, Randall. I do appreciate you for that, brother. He says, uh, Gino's past decade as a backup is why fans don't back him. Some fans can't separate who he is to who he is now. Top 12 quarterback on a bottom half salary. Great way of putting it, Randall. And um, yeah, I think that just things things stick in people's mind for the way they want to view it. And I think people, we, we live in such a fast track world at times, Randall. I think that people only have so much time to think about certain things. And we want to think about things once and just sort of, okay, that's what I think about it. Stock that into the back of my head. That's what I think about this given subject. Move on to the next thing. And you just, you're stocking your brain constantly with things. Okay, I think about that. Now, okay, on to the next thing. And it's harder than when stuff comes to new change and things that give you new points of data to get you, get you going to like, you know, um, I don't know. It, it, it's just hard to bring people over on this. But yeah, I think that, that 10 years of backing up has stuck in people's mind, especially. I think a little bit of just the opinion of he, he is what he is is just kind of that's stuck in people's head and they couldn't be moved off of that. And I think anything support short, short Randall, of Gino going out there and having MVP seasons the past two years was not going to dissuade people off of their outlook of him on that. And that's unfortunate because he's played some really good quarterback of this team. It's not been perfect. Is there some things that you can pick apart his game that he can improve on in that time? Sure. But like you say, top 12 quarterback on a bottom half salary over the past two years. And uh, that is, that's good value. And that's a net benefit to the team, right, Randall? At the end of the day, it's a net benefit to the team, which is maybe the most important part. Is a future Rama reference? Ricardo, if Gino was in the draft straight out of college, he'd be a first-round pick. People forget that he had almost 600 yards and eight touchdowns in a game in college. True. He might be. He was a fr right at the fringe of being a first-rounder before, and then, so definitely possible. Pumpkin attack. She's definitely, she's definitely in loving mode now. Thank you, Randall, for all your donations, brother. me, I know this is a no, but could we trade K-9 because of becoming a pass team? What's his value? I, I don't know if he'd get you more than, he might get you a second round pick. Um, I wouldn't trade him though. Still in a rookie contract. Still don't have to pay him for at least two years. I'd roll with, I'd roll with him again.
Copper wise, the real question is, do we see Macintosh on the field this year? I would think you got DJ Dallas as a free agent. So he becomes your third back at this point, at least by default. We'll see if that changes up. Yeah, Haley, I think when you look at the stats on that, 57% pass rate ain't bad at all, especially on the college level, Haley, where that's always a number that gets generally more souped up, right? If you had a sliding scale you take to the NFL, that means that's like 53% run rate at the NFL level. Girl, I draft a guard and tackle this year, center. I bet they just roll with Brown Olu. I'm with him, man. I think that's what they probably do too, though. Yeah, Brian, I don't think we're trading K9. I think K9 gets Grub excited. He's like, yeah, DK, K9, KSN, Tyler, Charbonnet. CMC, I also love football. I know I'm hated as a Niner fan, but I love a football and a rivalry. As I always say, CMC, you're always welcome in here, and I always welcome Niner fans in here. And, you know, we'll usually be pretty respectful with you guys. But, you know, if you're asking me to, you know, root for a Niner team to win in a given game, I mean, you got to understand that's, that, that, that's, that, that's like having to pick which child you need to put down, you know? That's, that's just, that's a hard bridge for me to cross. But I respect you. And I love the football discussion. I do. Always welcome in here. James Johnson, I saw in a press conference for the CFB, Grubb said he doesn't run an air raid offense, considers it spread pro style. Said he wanted to make that very clear uh, about that. I can get where he's coming from on that. I mean, it, the, the, other, the other day, there's air raid concepts in what he's doing in, in some of the origins of it. But he's also developed in a way that goes very beyond what you have in your typical air raid concepts. There's much more of a prevalence of leaning into running the ball there's much more of a prevalence of power concepts within your running, uh, running of the ball than you normally get, which it tends to be a lot of finesse at times in the, in the spread-based concepts. He's not trying to run hurry up and, and just run as many plays as he possibly can, which tends to be another kind of typical thing that you see in this offense. So I can understand why he would say that and, and want to see that distinction made, James. And I think, it's a, I think it's a correct one. Spread concepts are becoming more prevalent in the NFL game, so it is becoming more pro style to, to lean in on them and call it that. And uh, because those concepts lean away from a little bit of the, the origins of uh, the air raid, I could see where that makes sense. Trevor Laris, I've always been pro Geno, even after filling in Russ, because I remember when he drove 90 yards down the field for a touchdown in the Rams game, I knew we'd be all right with him being the starter. Yeah, that was a hell of a way. I think this came in with like 90, wasn't like an almost 99 yard drive or something was the first drive he walked in on. But yeah, hell of a drive on his part. Very impressive when he walked in there. And uh, I'm glad to hear it. I think there are a lot of pro Geno people. I think the, the anti geno folks are just very, very, very passionate about their, their anti geno takes and where they stand on it. And uh, I'm trying to sell them on the other side of it. I'm trying to bring them where you are, Larry, Trevor, with it, because I think that this guy can take us places. I think that with the right offense put together, you can do some things here with this team. But uh, it has become one of those topics, as I say, it's, it's one of the select three topics. I've had a lot of topics I've done on this show through five years of doing the channel. And um, there's those topics that drive out the, the greatest of passions and the greatest of emotions. There's others that people are more open to there being a bit of a sliding scale and a back and forth. Um, but there's three distinct ones that have been, you know, we're having like trench warfare, like fights over these things, you know, where it, it really takes it up to another notch of a level as far as the, the disagreement goes on it. And Gina's one of those, one of those hot, hot button items. At least as college Gino would be called generational by people nowadays, like we do with everyone now. Maybe so. Definitely is it definitely thrown out a lot. <laughs> Ricardo, college Gino, 4,200 yards, 42 touchdowns. That's crazy numbers. Yeah, he had insane production at the end down there. And I think two years of it too, if I'm not mistaken. Kronos, I just watched someone say the only signing that impressed them less than Grubb is when we picked up Eddie Hamburger Lacey. I, why would we go hamburger when you go feast mode? Feast mode's so much better for him. Uh, how can you not be excited to get the cream of the crop from college? I don't know. I, I don't, I, I'm not really sure what these other folks think were thinking was available out there. It's a little bit like I've heard some people talk about the offensive coordinator job, that there's 10 different guys out there that are vibrant 
just great cutting edge candidates to just, all you got to do is reach out and just reach out and pick them up. And they're right there for you to have. I've looked at them and been like, when I've looked around the landscape and been like, man, Mike Kafka, uh, Frank Clark, Frank Reich, Bienemy, um, it's kind of lean out there right now. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to find a lot of good candidates. And I think this is as good a one as you had that there was out there to be had. Kronos, your point. Feed me more Seahawks. I feel like Gino was always good. He had a bad O-line in New York and was a backup for starters. And now he's uh, pulling a Kirk Cousins that they had the talent, but now the game has slowed down for them. Yeah, uh, that's a great way of putting it, man. First stop, didn't have a lot to work with. And now he's got more and more to work with and he's grown in his game and it's all come together. Part of why I'm excited for his future here and what he brings. John uh, Randall with another $2 donation. Randall, thank you for all those donos today. He says, bet you John goes shot and beer to start off. Oh, you know it. He's, he's whiskey and, a, and an IPA, Randall. He, he's a whiskey and an IPA. I wouldn't even put it past him to do a boiler maker on that, you know? Kerplunk. I could totally see it. He's got his back turned in this, in this shot in the bar. So you can't really see what uh, Johnny's drinking. But if you were on the other side of him right there, you'd see he's got two shot glasses lined up and he's got a stein of beer, but it's just that his big old melon is blocking the stein of beer so you can't see it filled. But he's about to go town. He's about to go crazy. He also pumpkin leaving an orange mark is hilarious. He does leave orange mark. He's a hairy beast. Uh, Copper Wise, didn't Gino get his job busted by a team in the Jets? He did. Yeah. Yeah, Gino didn't pay up on his bet, supposedly. And as Haley said, Gino's apologized for it. You can't hold him a no can on that. That's 10 years ago, a young player. Haley says, I'm excited for the random ass John. Quarterback John brings in. That ends up the next Allen Mahomes. Never doubt that man. He seems to have a pretty good eye for quarterback talent too. I'm I'm excited to see who he looks at for his next QB. He's he's done a pretty good job in the few times he's reached down into that well. AI says Grub has far more experience than Waldron. Certainly does coming in. Yeah. Another reason why I like I like this hire. You got guys called called games. He was in the national title game calling plays. You know it, it's. He's got the experience, I think, or at least enough. When Coach says it's staring us in the face, bring back Wilson from one last hurrah. If they had the guts to do it, they'd make the playoffs uh, run. I'd bet anything. I don't know where you where you land on that, Ringo. Though you're gonna maybe you can elaborate a bit. Uh, Russell does not play on time. That's there's things that I still will say. The Russell, I'm not. It's not to throw shade at Russell with this. It's not to say that that makes Russell a bad player or not a functional player in this league. But he's not an on time quarterback. He's an off script quarterback. Uh, in this offense, there's going to be so much of it built upon playing on script. So how, how does that work? I mean, he was just paired up with Sean Payton, one of the best on-script you know, coaches that exists in this league in the NFL. And Payton walked away with it going, I can't work with him. I can't make this go. I, I think Ringo, for Russ to have success, he has to have an offense built to his skill set, right? Like rather than forcing him into stuff that he doesn't do well, you'd want to fit him into something that he does right and does well. And putting him onto an on-time offense where he's got to throw short routes and whatnot, that's just not his game. It's never been his game. So I don't know, man. I, I don't know how you see the success on that one. I, it's not to say Russell can't find some success, but that this just wouldn't be that environment. Top of the pass protection issues you have. Yeah. Camille, serious question. How do you think Gino would do as a San Francisco quarterback? I would go from, uh, let, me, let me illustrate it like this, Camille. I would go from how I'm going into this game believing that Kansas City Chiefs are going to win this game to believing that the Niners would win this game. If Gina was on their starting quarterback in this first Brock Purdy, I think I, I would. It would be enough for me to move who I think the who I think I put as the winner here. 
Uh, JJ Radical, what do you think about drafting Michael Pratt in the mid rounds? Very, very live arm, much more of a lively arm than you might typically get in the middle rounds, JJ. I put a fourth round grade on him because of that arm, and he's got some pretty good mobility with it too. He's not upperly mobile, but good mobility. Um, he's got a little bit of a swagger to his nature, a little bit of a gunslinger nature to what he does, um, but he trusts his arm. He'll, he'll try to fit it in there to tight spots. His decision-making is pretty good in the pocket. Um, mechanics, pretty, pretty good. Not a lot of extra hitches to his throws. So fairly clean all the way around with that. You know, you got him playing out at two lanes, so the competition isn't as challenging as it is as other places. But as a fourth-round flyer guy, I, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Probably can't go third with him. Tommy says it was 92-yard drive on the Geno Rams when Geno came off the bench against the Rams. You have to remember we were watching Russ play like hot garbage and then got hurt. It was impressive. It was. No. Coming out there like that against that defense and having more success than Russ was having was stood out in that game. And even at the end where the interception happened, it was like, I think Tyler got pulled to the ground and then the guy picked off. It was like an uncalled PI that didn't happen or he might have driven you down for the win in that game. <coughs> cool Breeze, Feast Mode. I forgot about that, laughing out loud. That one stuck with me. Eddie Lacy will always be Feast Mode. <laughs> Best third down back you've never seen. He likes died. We'll get Macintosh next year. We'll get a bit of the Macintosh experience at that point. Uh, Swedish Shinobi. Gino, Gino supporters tend to bring up statistical evidence and game-specific examples. Gino haters tend to lean on emotional response and anecdotal evidence, I feel. That's it. I guess I've said you guys so well quantify this stuff in such a much more... So I know you got the 150 character limit there, Swedish, but that's just a fantastic way... Uh, of putting that in in such a succinct fashion in addition to that because it's hard on this kind of given subject to do just that. But I don't think that there's a more succinct way to put that. Gino supporters tend to bring up statistical evidence and game-specific examples. Gino haters tend to lean on emotional response and anecdotal evidence. And this is, I, I'm, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree one, more 100% with you on that, Swedish. I think it's a bit of the heart of the frustration I have with the debate on that is you have one side pulling sort of from one range where they're trying to honestly take this as an approach of, you know, let's come to maybe even potentially some common ground and it's sort of the other side going, no, he just sucks. There is no common ground. He's crap. And that's just, I just, this is what I think. Like, okay. Kevin O'Connell, you still live? She. <laughs> Demarcus White, I feel like we don't give John enough credit. I seriously think he's a top three general manager in the league. Uh, it's part of why I've, I've thought and I think most, there were some people that were calling one to see John in addition to Pete. But I think a lot of people on this, Jamarcus, to their credit in the fandom, were really much more on, look, John should stay. John's overall a, a, a benefit to this, and he's done a good job. And I think the, the tough part of this, Jamarcus, becomes those things that people would point to as failures of John that he has to sort of take the, the blame for may not be on him for the blame. And what... What was Coach Carroll? What was John Schneider? Who overruled the other? Who had more say in that building? I, I think that there's a lot sort of spinning around in that um, as far as trying to get to the truth and the heart of the matter there. And I think that that's what Jody Allen was doing by letting Carroll go is a bit of an indicator there when she lets him go. But Keith Schneider, that there was a lot of these bad decisions that were probably going back more to the coach than they were the general manager. Um, and I think he's done a great job the past two years with some of the changes they've made going back to value in the draft. The contracts they've signed have been pretty smart money spent uh, along the line the past few years, especially. Um, I think he definitely is a guy that is in contention in that top three GM role, like you say, Jamarcus. And um, maybe we're going to see that proven out a little bit more now that he's not working against having a coach that has more oversay over him, where he gets to be a pure general manager and really um, function in that role like most normal general managers are allowed to do so. And Kevin, we are stoked to see the Seahawks play again, man. Stoked, I tell you. Uh, I says, why did Grubb struggle so much against uh, Michigan? Well, Michigan had one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in all of college football. And uh, that's, that's going to make a lot of quarterbacks have a long day at the office. No doubt about that. Um, I don't know if he's struggled as much in his play calling as from my standpoint, I felt like Michael Penix just didn't really make his throws in that game. You know, there was a lot of errant throws and overthrows and missed throws that were not what you tended to see from Michael Penix throughout the course of the year. 
Was that the pressure of Michigan's defense getting to him? Maybe somewhat. Some of them were just kind of flat out missed throws, especially when you had Penix moving a little bit um, and having not to necessarily just throw from within the pocket. So, you know, I, I did feel like there was a little bit of that at play there. Uh, maybe he didn't call the best of games, but I didn't think it was like a piss poorly called game. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's all those factors probably. McDonald uh, may be smart enough to draft a kickoff punt returner that is a burner and a guy the other team is scared to kick to equals game changer. Very, very well might. Very well might. Certainly will be hopefully not DJ Dallas. <laughs> no more DJ Dallas. Haley says, around the league, uh, he's, uh, JS is seen as one of the best general managers. There's a reason Jody trusts him. You can't have a dedicated roster spot for kick, re- kick return and punt return anymore, not in the modern league. I think it does get harder to do that. You've got to get a guy that's a receiver and who does provide legitimate receiving skill. Um, the rosters are just too strained at this point, to your point on that, Haley. Especially with the 17-game season and all that stuff, you just you can't afford to hold a specialist on the roster like you once kind of were able to do. Camille Ola says, I Leonard Weaver, the Cleaver, plus beast mode equals feast mode. That's that's true. That's true. Leonard Weaver, too, had the best uh, nickname for his stiff arm. They called it the baptism. <laughs> I love that. David Adams, I wonder if JS has a full GM general manager control in 2017 draft, if he would have traded Russell Wilson for the first overall pick and some more from the Browns. Very well, could have been interesting to see on that, David. Yeah, certainly, you know that Coach Carroll wasn't going to really want to let him do that if he did, and uh, he very well could have. I know that he had had quite enough of Mark Rogers, I think, by that point in dealing with him. So um, certainly it's possible, David. And what an alternative universe that would have looked like. Colbreeze would have broken me as a fan. I believe the right decision has been made. Yeah, true, cool breeze. Ringo is the Seahawks legend, about the same age as Geno. Tons of playoff uh, Super Bowl experience. Uh, always found a way to get it done. I really think that it'd be the best move if they have the guts to do it. Comes back to Ringo, though, fit. He's not a fit for your offense and what you've done. Um, the, the tons of playoff Super Bowl experience, not recently. It's not been that way. You're reaching to something that was 10 years ago when you're talking about that. When we're talking about today right now, that's not the case. Russell Wilson has one playoff win since 2017. So um, that's, that's not necessarily, you know, the, the, great, the playoff experience isn't worth, worth a lot if you don't able to actually win in the playoffs going there. Um, always found a way to get it done. Also, again, if you're one in five in the playoffs since 2017 and you've had multiple years that you've missed the playoffs since 2017 on the teams that you've played upon, um, maybe you're not always finding a way to get it done. Maybe sometimes you find a way to get it done, um, and other times you don't. Um, but again, back to Ringo, fit in the offense, playing on script, playing on time. It's the necessity of what you need with Russell here. It's not something that's kind of like, if it's convenient, you get around, you know, this is what the, you've just brought this offense in when that's a big part of the onus of this offense. It's not improvisation. It's not playing off script. It's not doing pirouettes in the pockets for five minutes before you try to launch a moon ball down the field 55 yards. It's, we've got to hit your, hit your throws on time. And that's something that Russell Wilson has struggled with throughout the whole course of his career. He's done great things too. I ain't throwing shade at Russ and saying he's limited on other, but there's things he can't do. And if you bring a guy in here to try to do things he can't do, then that's not setting him up for success, but actually setting himself up, setting both him and the team up for failure at that point. I understand, Ringo, that a lot of people have a lot of love for Russ. I get that. And I'm not asking you to put that, that love away for us. What I am asking you to do is to put the love of Russ in one side and then what's best for the team right now here on the other side. And uh, if you do both of those things, I'll think you'll come to find that both loving what's done, Russ done in the past versus what's best for this team right in the here and now um, <clears throat> is not to run back here with Russ at this point. I says Stroud looked unbelievable and perfect at the combine. Can't believe Panthers chose the bobblehead. That's the owner. I David Tepper came in there and overruled supposedly the staff on that one. What are you going to do? You know, the owner comes in and does something crazy. It's it can, it's crazy. Haley says Jess wanted to draft a quarterback. Pete wouldn't let him because it pissed off Wilson. He wanted to drop Wilson earlier, but Pete overruled that. These are both known things. Yeah, certainly what we've heard in the scenario, and it makes sense.
AI, we will see on how John handles this draft before making those statements. Our drafting from 2014 to 21 is absolutely bad. Way too many misses, bottom half of the league. Um, it's why our roster has holes. Uh, hard to put 21 in their AI when you only have three selections in that draft. Now, he traded those picks away, certainly, but um, it gets a bit harder to make distinction on that when we don't have a first-round pick and second and a third and a sixth. But you're right. Those drafts were, for the most part, bad from 14 to 20, no doubt about that. <clears throat> um, but again, comes into the play on this AI, and this is the part that you don't know, I don't know, anybody doesn't know for sure. I think this is where we have to also logically deduce something, right? So let's take this through two different pathways, AI, right? I'm Jody Allen. I've got my committee. I've got my behind-the-scenes knowledge of the inner workings of the Seahawks team here through the years, right? John Schneider's drafting bad drafts in 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, 18, 19. He's making trades for Jadavian Clowney that goes after years. Trades for Sheldon Richardson, third round pick that goes after the year. Uh, two first round picks for Jamal Adams, right? Making these wild, wild trades and not great drafts, okay? But we also know at the same point in time as that's occurring, as I agree with you on that, that Coach Carroll is the vice president at that time. He has oversay of your general manager which is one of the most unique situations you have set up in all of football. There's maybe two or other three places that are set up in that same fashion. So there's a possibility that exists that a lot of these bad decisions that are made during that time period are intricately linked back to Coach Carroll and him being the driving force of it. I don't know for sure. No one knows for sure on this. Like I say, you can read a little bit into this AI, I think, by the fact that she didn't move Schneider with Carroll in this process because it would have been easy to do both if you really thought he was part of the what was leading this thing to be somewhat broken in the first place. And then what does happen two years ago that we think and we, we believe in what we're hearing a little bit in the background here, AI, is that we hear that Pete, Coach Carroll has had some of those vice presidential duties pulled from him, that John Schneider has gotten back control of the draft. And the second that he gets back control of the draft, you have two of the, uh, this is the other side of it, you can't discount because I noticed you didn't put that in your message. You've had two of the best drafts you've had in your history of your franchise the past two drafts with those rumors that Carroll had the vice presidential duties removed. Do I know without, with 100% certainty, in fact, how this whole situation played out? Who was responsible for this pick? Who was responsible for that pick? Who was the one that was driving the worst of the picks? I don't know for sure. But there's a little bit of some evidence here that points to the fact that Carroll had a pretty heavy-handed approach in these vice presidential duties, much like he had a heavy-handed approach on the offensive side of the ball when he was really a defensive-minded coach. He's not, he's not shy about putting his fingers in whatever pies he saw fit. And so if that's the case, and it was logically speaking that John was inhibited through those time periods that you mentioned, and then she removed that inhibiting factor of Coach Carroll and let him run free, then you don't really hold as much of John to account on that, right, AI? That's more back down to Paul Allen giving Coach Carroll the control he shouldn't really have given him, because as we've seen with a lot of these coaches, it just turns bad when you give him this much power and control. It's turned bad for Bill Belichick. It turned bad for Coach Carroll. It's turned bad for Mike Holmgren when he was here the first time. You know, these coaches want that power. They want that control. They want all that overriding stuff, but it's not in their benefit to do so. You know, they just need to concentrate on kind of coaching. Jamarcus White, I feel like a lot of Penix missed throws were a result of Michigan's simulated pressure and his internal clock being, being so low. Also, he was getting beat up. Yeah, it's kind of all of it together. It wasn't just a pure like bad game. It was Michigan taking it to him too, Jamarcus. You know, it's good defense, that's for sure. They probably had a little more cumulatively talent on the defensive side of the ball than you might have had on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, John says, I'm sorry, Brandon, Geno Smith is not the guy. He's not him. This new regime is going to want to go down with their guy at the helm. I believe that guy is Penix, Nix, or Jordan Travis, or Rattler. Um, I, I, I totally appreciate the standpoint, John, of the folks that say, you, you got to understand, John, it drives people on my standpoint of this, though, effing crazy. Like, it's it's so hard of a conversation to have, John, of... I can give you A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. I get down to Z as far as itemizing Gino's strengths and pluses and what he's bringing to the table and speak to his contract 
and speak to what he's brought to, everything to the play the last two years. But then the other side of it will be like, well, he's not that, literally your words on it, he's not that guy. Or I'll hear Gino is what he is. And can you understand, John, at least just, just from this standpoint, can you understand how hard and frustrating it is to then have a back and forth beyond that at that point? There's nowhere else for someone on my side of it to go for, nor is there any meat on that bone for me to pick from. I mean, it's just, it's a general, my outlook is just not the guy. I'm not discounting that they're not going to look for a quarterback here, John. I'm not. I, I certainly think that this is where I've said and said it multiple times. All camps can end up feeling satisfied by this situation. The Geno camp people, he is your starter going into next year. He is not going to be released out of the contract. I've been saying this for a long period of time. Geno will be on this roster next year. He will be your starter next year. They're also likely to draft a quarterback. But the thing with Geno on this, John, and the thing that I've driven for, and I've, I've been five hours into this stream right now, and I've had a bunch of back and forth with anti Geno folks who've said just almost exactly like you say it, not the guy. I don't see it. Not it. Just, and it's a little bit like somebody said above. It's, you have the Geno camp primes to bring all of these. Here's some facts, and here's some statistical backing, and here's this, and here's that. And then in the other side just goes, no, he just isn't it. Well, there's not a lot of other places for us to go on the discussion at that point. It, the discussion kind of gets shut down on that spot of things. Why isn't he it? Build your case, build your argument, you know, flesh it out a little bit. I don't want to do that here, John, because I know you're just coming in here and I'm five hours deep into trying to drive to this. But it's where I get frustrated with this is I call for it, I ask for it, I beg for it. It doesn't come from the anti-Geno sediment camp. It just comes back to, again, these these phrases that get used that don't have any meaning behind them. Not the guy. What does that mean? Is what he is. What does that mean? You know, it, it doesn't, I, I can't, I can't put any of that together as far as tangibly that being a real strong argument. And if there is a strong argu argument to be made that Gino is not the guy that he does suck, that he's just a bridge quarterback, that he just basically should be sitting there holding a clipboard all the time. Then you've got to build the argument up behind it on that. You can't, if you come in with just a sweeping magnanimous statement, I just came in here and said, Gino's a top five quarterback. I, that's just why I see it. That wouldn't add up for you guys. You'd hold me to account on that. Based on what? How do you come to that, Brandon? How do you build? How can you say that? You'd expect me to build my case on that. And that's what I'm looking for on the other side of this is for the folks that stand here, when you bring this up, just please build the case with it. Give me something beyond he is what he is or this or that. Give me something tangible I can go to. Because it's, it's in five hours of doing it and, and talking just a day. This is what's been for two years is I keep asking for and begging for and I don't get it on the other side of it. And it's, it's why I say at the end of this, John, I can't, I can't do any more discussion on this one. I can't do any more of the Geno talk on it because there's nowhere to go anymore. And there's nowhere to go because the other side of this doesn't give me anywhere to go because there's nothing tangibly you're giving me to, to turn over here in my brain. Mark Goldman, I just joined. Are we talking about offense? Oh, we're talking about all things here, Mark. Because the offense, although stagnant sometimes, we should focus on the defense. I think we got to cover it. I think we try to cover it all. We can, Mark. You know, I think we can get address both sides of the ball. But defense definitely needs a share of help too. Camille, did we ever get a compensatory pick from Link McDowell? No, you don't get a compensatory pick for busts, basically. Uh, comp picks get determined by how many free agent losses that you have versus collectively how many free agents you sign, Camille. There's a secret sauce on how it's determined, but uh, it's not one that we know of how the NFL doesn't tell us about what the secret sauce is. So in general terms, you, you lose more free agents than you take in, you're going to get compensatory picks. You take in more free agents than you lose, you'll get compensatory picks. You have a defensive coach that's a minority hire for a head coaching position, you will get compensatory picks. Um, but those are the only ways to kind of have that go down.
Cool Breeze says there's no quarterback depth in this class mid, and it isn't an intermediate issue. We draft quarterback next year or two. Yeah, true, Cool Breeze. I see it the same way. It got leaned out a little bit as we went along through the process. I says franchise big cat. Can't franchise him, I. Um, this will be the third time he's franchise tagged, so the cost would be so exorbitant to franchise tag him. You know, by the time you get to the third time, it's like 20% on top of the franchise tag cost uh, to make it happen. But I do think you can re-sign him and sign me up for Clowney, man. Sign me up for Clowney. I don't know if you'd be able to get all that done. and Maybe you get that done. It'd be hard, but maybe it'd be tough to get all that done necessarily. Haley says, drafting a quarterback really would be like putting a ritual sacrifice under center. Their blood fuels an actual quarterback in three years once they've decreased and have a real offensive line. <laughs> AI, who picked uh, Eskridge over Creed? Exactly. That'd be another one that would be an interesting one to find out whose decision was that, so to speak. Dustin Larson, thank you for subscribing to the channel. Appreciate you for doing that. Welcome aboard the Hawks Nest. Sean, I'm with you on Gino. There are way too many Gino haters. It's kind of pathetic. I, it's, it, it's something that on, I, I try to steer away from it for much conversation, but it does, it, it just throws me off. Uh, um, I, I don't, I just don't quite get it. And again, I'm, I'm, that's the frustration of my part is that is the people that are on the other side of an issue. I, I say this often. I'm, it's, uh, I'm not trying to uh, throw shade at people that don't agree with me. I'm trying to understand the people that don't agree with me because there's maybe something I am indeed missing. I'm, I'm certainly can be thick. I can certainly be slow on the ball at times. It's certainly not beneath me. But if I am being slow or thick on a situation and then I, and that's the case, then I've got to be explained to exactly how I can have that eyes and eyes to me where I'm missing it. And that's the part that does, that is missing in this debate and discussion. And whoever put it above in that way that you put it was just perfect. It's, 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 it's one side coming at it from one angle, another side coming from another angle, but we're not really talking about the same language a little bit. Philip Gassel, Geno's a solid quarterback and deserves his chances. If people want to see a bad quarterback, look for a name called Dan McGuire. Hawks, number one overall pick. Then would, they would say, they would then say Geno's awesome. Yeah, we've definitely had some stinkers and definitely committing to drafting one doesn't commit to necessarily getting you a good one. Well, yeah, we've seen that with a lot of guys that we put. I mean, Rick Myers, another one, you made the number two overall selection in the draft. Uh, it's, it's a tough game that's hitting on QBs. Haley says, nobody knows what JS likes because we drafted one quarterback since he's been here and that could have been Pete. Definitely. He was at the pro days of, of uh, Mahomes and Allen Haley. So we do know that. Um, signing up for, for Geno Smith and being willing to ride with him here as the quarterback these last couple of years has, I think, been an, 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 uh, a positive and, a, and the right decision on that. I think he's got a pretty good track record on the, on the quarterback. Dude uh, discussed another dude. B, wasn't the year we had Lacey? Wasn't that the year that we couldn't run the ball at all? Yeah, I think that was also the year that you went with your center was, I think, Drew Nowak. Uh, that was the Luke Jokel year, I think, at left guard. I mean, we might have been like Reese Odiombo at left tackle or something that season. So it was, the offensive line was bad. Real bad. James Radley says, now Grubb gets to polish his offensive scheme against a McDonald's defensive scheme every day. Go Hawks. That's it. Couldn't solve it in Michigan against that team. Now he gets a weekly base against practice to, to try to figure it out. 
And I think both of these uh, offenses and defenses will challenge both sides of the ball in a way that, uh, you know, I know the iron sharpens iron is over said way too much, but at least you're getting schemes that are going to challenge in a way that other offenses and other defenses throughout the league can challenge you. Um, so maybe you're better prepared than come game day to deal with those said schemes. And John, we'll see if Penix is likely to fall to us with the injury concerns. I do feel like he's probably taken at this point in the top 12, but there's a wide difference of opinion on him and who's to say um, how everything fits out to the medical evaluations, to the combine and all that stuff. But he does strike me as a guy that'll end up probably in the top 12. And I do see him as a first round guy, John. I do agree with you there. Ricardo says Penix wide receivers and O-lines are the secret sauce to Penix success. He is Indiana bad without him. Certainly you do wonder if he starts getting hit a little bit more and asked him to throw, especially on the move. I mean, that's one place where his accuracy dips down is once you ask him to start to move off out of the pocket. Within the pocket, even if he can move, he can move around within the pocket really well. But some of the throws when he gets outside the pocket to get a little errant and the ball does tend to sail a little bit. But I do agree with you, Mark. Uh, John, I do think he's a first round talent. Uh, we don't have an O-line. Uh, we have two highly rated young tackles and just got a great offensive line coach. They also will address the interior line and free agency in the draft. Um, while there, there may be a more of an onus upon doing it, and I hope there is, John, as far as the offensive line getting into the future addressed, r right now, no, we don't have a good offensive line. They didn't, they didn't consistently last year open up holes in the ground game. They didn't pass protect well at a 28th level in the sport. There, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this offensive line to bring it up to snuff, in my opinion. And while, while Cross looks like he's pretty solidified there, he's not risen to some stardom status. He's played a little bit better than just a smidge better than league average this year with still some upside to him that you hope he's going to gain. With Lucas, you've had the coaching staff talk about a chronic issue with his knee. And he's had both of his first two seasons, John, with an inability to stay healthy on the football field. Uh, both of his first two years, if I'm not mistaken, have had his seasons end due to that same knee. Now he got surgery. Is he going to recover? Maybe, maybe not. Tends to be when they mention chronic injuries that those don't tend to resolve themselves instantly. When it comes to the interior of the line, you Bradford and Olatimi might be the guys, but they're, they're certainly not known quantities at this point. It certainly is a question mark at this point. So, you know, it's, yeah, you could go and address it, but the key here, John, with bringing to Michael is you're going to have to give him a clean offensive line. And if you don't, you're going to get him battered, you're going to get him bruised, and you're, you're going to get him playing poorly. And we don't offer him that right now. And I think if you bring Michael Penix to any team, I'm agreeing with you. I think he's a first round talent, but you've got to get him the line to be able to allow him to be able to succeed. He is a quarterback, maybe more than any other in this draft that is going to be relying on that. And we don't, we don't have that currently. You know, we can make an onus to do it. We can make a drive to do it, but it, it's going to take a little bit more than a soft stroke for us to get there. There's a lot of heavy lifting to be done to get this offensive line to a place where um, I think you're going to get the most out of Michael Penix's game. I don't know if the, the when they when coaches speak to chronic John, it doesn't tend to typically speak to the fact that it's a surgery is going to fix the issue and it's just done with. And that's the part I wonder too about with him, John, with sliding in the draft like he did. The guy that I had a first round grade on that kind of dipped in the draft. But it also doesn't. Well, Lucas and Cross also don't have anything to do with the fact that the other three fifths of your offensive line are a complete question mark right now. You have no certainties on that offensive line. You would be drafting Penix with a little bit of that uncertainty. And to mention in free agency, maybe there's a guy in free agency, maybe there isn't. But when I look at the free the agent crop out there, John, of guys that are available, there's not a big list. And there's a lot of other teams out there with a lot more money than us to spend and overspend on guys um, of the few that are available out there in free agency on the offensive line. The draft's looking better. And I don't worry about his mobility too bad, John, but just the throwing off when he's got to roll to the outside of the pocket, the, the accuracy dips. It does.
AI, I don't see us taking a quarterback with our current draft picks. We have too many holes. We need two offensive linemen, linebacker. Hey, all two linebackers, maybe AI, to your point. Safety, tight end, maybe two tight ends. Um, yeah, I see it. I see it similar. Yeah, the problem is, John, though, the, with free agency, when you mention free agency, there's a couple of issues there. Is first off, the stock of free agencies for the interior of the offensive line is not particularly good. There's, there's not some great options there at center and guard that you're going to be able to go out there and pluck out there in free agency. Um, your best case scenario is maybe you find a league average guard, you know, Connor uh, Williams or whatever, you know, that's about as good as you're going to be able to find. So there's not a lot there in free agency to go pick. It's one thing to say, we'll just go pay, pay it in free agency and get it. The other thing is currently, John, you don't have any money to spend. We're, we're sitting on negative $2 million of cap space, functionally about negative 10. You know, you're going to try to re-sign probably Leonard. You're probably going to re-sign Bobby. It's, there's, only, there's not going to be a lot of money made, made there, you know, to go out there and spend that money on. Um, and again, John, it's, you got to understand, John, I know that there's people that pop into this early and late and sometimes come in and it's like, well, we're three and a half hours in and I'm just jumping in, giving you guys my initial thoughts on this. But you have to understand, John, that right from the onset of this stream today, there's been people with the anti-Geno sentiment on it. And I, I, you can get defensive on this or whatnot. I understand if you do, but you know, from our side of it, what I've just called upon, what I'm asking for is the thing that we, is just missing. And it becomes that uh, he's not the guy you want to keep him, keep him. He's a bridge quarterback. He's, it's all reference to these terms rather than building your case up. Build your case for being anti-Gino. Why does, what is it about Gino that's so bad? That's what, we're, that's what I'm asking for within the stream. And what you've got to understand, John, well, you've just come in here Three and a half hours long, we've been asking for this and not getting it from the anti-Geno folks. It's the wash, rinse, repeat of Geno sucks. Okay, well, why does Geno suck? I can give you reason A, B, C, D, E, F, G, O. I go down all these line of reasons as to why he's a good quarterback, as to why he's been a benefit, why he's been a help. And then we go back to the next person. And okay, now it's your turn to, your turn to respond now. Respond to those facts I just gave you. Respond to all that statistical backing I just gave you. Respond to all of the offensive limitations of your attack I just gave you. And it's go, well, he just sucks. Okay then there's nowhere else to go at that point, John, right? At that, the conversation gets kind of shut down at that point. And maybe the anti-Geno folks don't really want to talk about Geno. Maybe they just want to tell people that he sucks and that's the end of it. And if that's the case, so be it. But you know what we try to do here is get into the elaborate point of the discussions on this to get to the depths of it. And that's what I'm looking for is where's the depths on this, this hate? I, I feel like Geno like, slept with y'all's sister sometimes by the way that he gets talked about. And I just don't get with the, the thinking of why it goes this, this hard to the hate on him versus so many of the other parts in this team that need to be corrected and fixed. John says, it's not about hating Geno Smith. It's about not knowing who he is. He's just not leading the team to any kind of contention. So that's, that's completely fine if you feel that way. But that's what I'm saying to you now is that it starts to feel like hating if you don't build your case. You, you just said on your comment above that, Geno's trash. These are the, can you not see, this is the kind of way people are speaking on it, but none of that is you building up a tangible argument for your beliefs. There's emotionality in there. There is a passion in there. There is care for what you think and believe. All of that is certainly within that. But the thing that is missing on that and the thing that for in the five hours now of streaming, I've done it on this discussion is it's turned on the two years, John, on the two years, stream after stream for two years of the discussion on this. I go through this wash, rinse, repeat on almost every stream and never get to the tangible, true argument of the people that hate on Gino. It comes down to Gino's trash, Gino bridge quarterback. He is what he is. We know what he is. He's not this. He can't raise Lombardi, but it's not actually building the, conver building the argument, John. I build the argument for pro Gino. I point to what he's done the past two years in productivity. I point to the unimaginative running game that absolutely flat out refuses to run anywhere but the A and the B gaps. I point to John, the 32nd rate at targeting the middle of the field with your passing attack in the NFL. I point to that. I point to a defense that spends three fourths of its time on the football field. I point to the 28th best pass protection rate for the past two years that you've been giving Gino back there and asking what quarterback is going to flourish within that? What quarterback is going to raise Lombardi's under that environment? I bring these tangible arguments to play, but then the other thing, the other, now when I flip it to you, the other side, I go, now to you, 
right? Like we're having a rap battle. Okay, now you throw your rhymes out there. Well, the rhymes that come back to me are just, he's trash, bridge quarterback is what he is. Can you see that there's a difference, John, in the way we're talking about these two items now? You may feel what you may feel, and you may be right, 100% may be right. But the folks that are on the anti-Geno side of this, you're not doing a particularly great job of building your argument to bring the folks like myself to your side of it. You can change my mind. You can win me with a good argument, but present a good argument. Gino is trash. Gino's a bridge quarterback. We know what he is. These are not making arguments. These are not making points. These are speaking in magnanimous tones that you don't have to, it's a great sound bite, but it's not you basing anything off of with any sort of real structure to it. Let's go to that. You know, or maybe there's just not a way to get there on that. John, you know, maybe there's not, maybe it's just such an emotional subject that the emotionality that it seems to breed in the anti-Gino folks just it, it clouds it up and I'm, this is where it's at. And, I'm, and it's like, it's like the, the gates of a castle coming down and that's where it's going because that's what it feels like. And that's the frustration for me is that I truly want to get to the good discussion on this and maybe there's a good discussion to be had there. But every time I rip back the layer surface, you know, the, let me say this, that, that I think about Gino. Let me say that I think about Gino. But when I, okay, let's get to the, now the tangibility. There's nothing there below. It's, it's empty beneath a little bit. Flicking switches. Come on, you and Brendan just did a f episode freeing up cap space. Yes, we did. Um, and you can free up cap space. But remember, with this, you're not starting this out at a place where you're sitting on any cap room as it stands. You're freeing cap space up so you can get normal business done and make a couple of signings. That's going to be what you're going to be able to do. Um, can you go hog wild with it? Sure. I don't think I'm expecting the team to go hog wild with it. Um, so it's just like once you resign Leonard Williams, once you bring back maybe a Bobby. Uh, signing here, signing there, and again with the with the with the offensive line help and going and getting a guy in free agency, you know, yeah, we've gone out there in free agency and gone out with an Austin Blythe. We've gone out there and grabbed an Evan Brown. We've gone out there and signed Cedric Abuhi. You know, sometimes there's not any offensive lineman available out there in free agency. It's kind of a valuable position in the NFL. And when there is a valuable guy out there, and you have your Hawks, even after they've cleared their cap space, sitting on twenty five million dollars versus a team that's sitting on seventy five million dollars of cap space. Who do you guys think is going to get that offensive lineman? But there's not even really that good. You're going to be overpaying for a real mid-offensive lineman anyway if you try to go that route this offseason. Brian Blank says, why are we trying to fix something that's not broken? I don't know. It's why I lamented so much. You know? Again, John, guys, we deserve better than Gino, is what you say. That's not a bit, you're, build the argument. Build the argument, man. I, I gotta let the Gino thing go. I really do. Just, just is not going anywhere on um, doo -doo 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 -doo. No, I don't think he's trolling Jamarcus. I think John believes what he believes, but two years. <laughs> two, it's two years of this. Yeah, I got to let it go, Young. I, I got to let the Geno thing go. For the anti Geno folks, go. I got to let it go at this point. I'm pretty much open to all discussions and topics on this channel, but this is one I've reached, much like I reached with Russell and Coach Carroll, where it's just, I, I got nowhere else to go with it. I've tried to make my most passionate example. I've tried to ask for the other side of it, and I'm not, it's not coming. So I'm done. I'm done moving with it at this point. I, I've given more time and effort to it than I probably should have at the front of this. Poncho, Honcho, thank you for the $10 donation. The same MFers that say Gino is mid are the same ones that think Justin Fields is going to come here and save the day with the same trash defense and same O-line Gino has. Agreed. 
uh, agreed. If not with Justin Fields, that it's it, it's that there's some other magical, vibrant choice that comes in here and as a quarterback will save all of these other problems that are on this team. And they don't, and they won't. And, and the issues with this offense last year were not Geno Smith. He was not part of the problems of your offense. And you have so many problems offensively last year. Undisciplined play, unimaginative attack, lack of an ability to create any holes in the ground game, unimaginative in the ground game, shitty pass protection all around. You know, all of these things combined to be the bad parts of what really drove your offense. And even that offense still found its way to be tickling up around the top 10, top 12 status, even with all of those limiting factors in it. And why was that? Because you had a guy like Geno Smith playing pretty good football. Because you had a guy like Geno Smith getting done what he got done. That's, that's where it comes down to. But yeah, it's, as I say with this and, and where I'll be on this right now at this point is I, I'm, we're going to go in the future on this discussion and your anti-Geno folks are just going to have to talk to kind of space on this one. Because I've tried, I've, I've done backflips for two years to try to give you guys some, uh, I'm, I'm giving you the five, six hours of a show to make and present your case. And uh, whether you have or not, I guess we'll let the audience decide whether it's something to warm it up. But I'm completely open to being taken and taken from a spot where I believe this and you can pull me over to think this if you build a good argument. Build a good argument. A good argument is built on the back of as much facts and evidence as you can present and as little of emotionality and just sort of personal beliefs and biases you might have. You got to rip one from the other to get to that, you know, happy place, so to speak. And I don't know if we've gotten there on the Gino thing, Poncho. But man, thank you for the $10 donation. And uh, yeah, Justin Fields isn't going to save things either on his app. He's not going to put the Superman cape on. It just ain't going to happen with that, you know. CJ King says, Gino was the clutchest quarterback in the league, yet he still sucks. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And he was being, he was being facetious with CJ in his comment there. Yeah, John, it just comes down to those things I've mentioned to you that of the inhibiting factors Gino dealt with and the part that you're not giving any kind of value to is that I'm dealing with all of those inhibiting factors of the quarterback and whether it's Gino that would be on this roster or Justin Fields or any quarterback you would have put in that situation would have failed out at a much higher rate, would have failed completely than what Gino produced on that field the past two years, including win comeback player of the year award last year. Most quarterbacks you give that type of situation, they die on the vine. That's the point. It's hard enough for a quarterback to operate, let's, let's say, for instance, when he doesn't have a good ground game to lean on, right? Hey, Gino, it's all in your arm. We can't run the ball today, right? That's tough enough, John. Then when you tell a quarterback, hey, Gino, also, you have no running game today and you got to not throw to the middle of the football field, okay? Anything between the numbers, you don't throw there at all. Carroll's dictated, just we don't do it, okay? We're going to do that at the 32nd rate in the league, okay? Go do your job, though. Go, go be awesome. Go be an MVP, Gino, okay? No ground game, and you're not throwing in the middle of the field. Oh, oh, one more thing. One more thing. I know, man. Sorry, uh, one more thing. Uh, you're not going to have any pass protection too, okay? So just that as well. Like You're pretty much going to be on an onslaught of pressure on every snap, just about every single time. But just that stuff. Other than that, man, we got you a lot of offensive talent, man. You're going to go out there and cook. So other than that, you're good. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. One more thing, Gino. One more thing. Uh, A and B gap runs. That's where we're going to live, okay? And the defense is going to know this. We've been doing this for 10 years. They're very well aware of we loving the A and B gap runs. But just Coach Carroll believes that you you wear a defense out over the course of the game. If you just keep hammering that A and B gap run, eventually that defense will wear down, man. You know? So all that stuff, you just go out there and deal out. You better be good. You better be good, man, or you're just a bridge. If you aren't going out there and putting up top five stats at that point, dealing with that, you are a bridge quarterback and nothing else. Uh, fans, since 92, I don't know if they'll bring back Phil Haynes at this point. Mobile offensive linemen are going to be very, very important at this point. They're going to be carrying a big part of, uh, of the onus here. And Phil doesn't necessarily move well in space. Amazing Mario Brothers, people who hate on Gino are frustrated because he's not a superstar like Mahomes or Lamar. Newsflash, it's pretty damn hard to get a top five quarterback. It's, it's definitely the way I felt with the two Amazing Mario Brothers. They don't grow on trees. They're few and far between. Finding guys into that uh, rarefied air. And John, you ask about uh, Gino, will you ever win you a playoff game? The one playoff game that you put Gino Smith into last year 
on a team that had six rookies starting on it, on a team that was that was moving that was playing on the road in San Francisco, playing with the team that was considered the best team in the NFC at that time, on a team that didn't come into that game, John, with a single starting nose tackle that was healthy, had Geno Smith scoring on every drive, I believe, through that first half, and had you the lead at halftime in that game. But what held you back in that game? Geno was going to have to score on every single drive against that San Francisco defense in order to win that football game because your defense sucked. Because your defense couldn't stop McCaffrey on the day. Hell, your defense couldn't stop a, a cool breeze on, on that day. Was that a failure that day of Geno's play? Was that a failure of Geno not getting it done in, in, in a moment you need him to get done where he, he didn't have the guts, he didn't have the, the stuff to rise to the moment? Or was that the defense failing you? Because I thought he played a pretty damn good game through most of that game until it became clear that you were going to have to score every single time and then the offense started to press a bit. So yeah, I think he can. Ramsey Foster, damn dude, you've been streaming for five hours. How do you do it? I don't know, man. I love what I do. It makes it easy when it's that way. But uh, I don't know. My, my eyes blink in five hours go long. Camille, has, how has Evan Bosick fared as a Brown? I think he's done okay all around the league. Flash says, no one brings up stats to back their Geno hate because they know it wouldn't help if uh, it wouldn't help you if you think about our situation log logically and what Geno has given us, you'd be a fool to hastily move on. That's where I stand with it, Flash. That's where I flash with it. Well said. I do you, Hawks? Brandon, sorry you have to deal with the Geno critics, but I do love when you point out all the good qualities. Go Hawks. Thank you, man. I don't mind. It's good talk. It's good discussion. John says, Geno's not a franchise quarterback. Uh, he's 33, for God's sake. I bet all the people that play Madden trade him for one year and uh, always draft a young quarterback. Uh, well, I mean, maybe the case, uh, maybe not on that. Madden may not have him exactly rated as good as he probably really is and deserves to be. Geno's not a 78, which is where Madden had him kind of placed at. Um, but again, not franchise quarterback, you know, it's based on sort of what there. Jamarcus says, nobody's saying you can't saying you can't draft a quarterback. John, nobody's saying a Geno is the future, but you fail to realize what he's providing to this team by giving us a high-level play and a low-level contract. Wonderfully put. Uh, Ramsey Foster, thank you for the $5 donation, Ramsey. I do appreciate you for that. How much of Geno's resurgence is based on Pete Carroll's staff? And do you think that will carry over with presumably a different offense and a new staff? Um, well, I think certainly a guy like uh, Canales had a big impact on Geno. Um, and you lost Canales this last year. And, and Geno still, I think, did pretty good. Uh, maybe he missed a little bit of his presence with that. Um, hard to say because I've never really been able to hear much about Waldron's impact on Gino or, or what he feels like he's done for him. It certainly doesn't speak well when you have uh, GSN talking about Waldron and he can't bring up one good thing that Waldron brings to the table. Um, I think Gene, Pete Carroll has a very good, did a good job, um, and this goes to a little bit less than the X's and O's about mentality and creating um, a positive environment for quarterbacks, especially for them to succeed and to get the most out of QBs and to get them in that right headspace, it seems like, where they can perform at their best. Um, that certainly seemed to be something Carol had a really good understanding of how to sort of almost kind of like a, from a psychologist perspective, manage the QB position. And I got to give Coach Carroll credit on that. I'm hard on him in certain ways, but I wouldn't be hard on him with that. I think that's a big part of getting Russell to play so well as he did early on, to get Russell to play with the confidence that Russell was able to play through in his first couple of years as he was still, you know, obviously finding his way as a young quarterback. So uh, there's maybe a little bit of that within it that you do miss, Ramsey. I will say with a guy like Grubb coming in here, though, you have a guy who took a Jay Kaner at Fresno State and kind of brought him up to becoming a pro, almost a decent pro prospect, kind of like a fifth, sixth rounder kind of guy. guy that was the MVP at the uh, Senior Bowl last year. And uh, certainly uh, he's done great work with Michael Penix as well from what you saw with Michael in Indiana to the production that you saw from Michael at Washington. So I think Grubb is 
potentially going to be able to at least give you almost as much of what you had from Carol, maybe just in a different way, maybe more in the X's and O's way and less of the psychologist kind of way and mentality kind of way. But uh, we'll see on that part, Ramsey. I don't have a certain answer for you on that for sure. Bailey says, like all of our staff except Frazier, advanced metric guys. Do you think they won't like Gino? I agreed. Oh, they'll be in on it. Yeah. Ricardo, teams generally only roster three quarterbacks and you can only develop two of them realistically. Got to pick one you really believe in. Banks has enough red flags to discount him. Very well could. Very well could with a lot of teams. I think that teams that love him are going to really love him and teams that will be out will be probably really out on him, you know. El Destructor, yet we're about to see a completely scheme skill position dependent unathletic quarterback with a wet noodle arm in the Super Bowl. <laughs> well said, El Destructor. <laughs> That's very true. Three hour John, would you, who would you have? Oh, sorry. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Radu, what's up, Radu Turkan in the house? How you doing, Radu? Says, uh, one year for Gino, though. No, give him more time for a better line. If Gino has a statistically top 15 line next year and is still the same, he is a goner. I'm, I'm completely fair, uh, happy to put my money in my own mouth was on this one, Radu. I mean, not to mention next year is a lot more easier to potentially move off of the Gino contract at that point because you're not eating as much dead money as you'd have to this offseason. But yes, if I bring in an offensive attack where we start taking those things I just talked about that are impediments to playing the quarterback position and you remove those things, then I'm not going to lean up. Then there is no excuse to lean back on those. Then you do hold the quarterback to account. You got to work with this and this and this, and yet you, you failed. I think a big thing that's probably hurting Russell Wilson right now is statistically speaking, he had a top five pass protecting offensive line for the first time in his career. Did he flourish in that environment? Did he maximize that in the Denver environment? No, not really was able to do that. So, and that's to Denver's points, not giving them an excuse. And they're going to move on from Russ at that point, right or wrong. That's going to be their outlook of it. So, it's completely fair to say if you give him those items and you can, hey, I give you a forward-thinking offense. I give you a defense that wasn't sitting on the field three-fourths of the game. I give you a rushing attack that will attack all, all places that will go vertically as well, horizontally as well as vertically, and it's in how it's going to look to go after defenses. We're going to try to target the middle of the field. Um, we're going to get better manufacturing of plays in here for you, the quarterback position, where it's not all on you back there going through three raids and having to hit a 15-yard post route on a line. You know, there's going to be more stuff that I'm going to be able to script up to help you out. If all of those things or many of those things come in benefit of Gino, then I'm going to be a lot harder on Gino if he can't then excel within that. But I do believe he will. And my proof to this, Radu, is the first 12 games Gino started, not this last year, but the year before. You look at the first 12 games that Gino started back in 2022. You had good pass protection and you had a good running game through those 12 games. And how did Gino play within that? Was he a top 12 guy at that point? Was he a top 15 guy at that point? No, he's playing like a top five guy and he was even an MVP discussion at that point in time. And I believe you provide him the same moving into the next, this next year, you will see him in a similar place as far as his performance go. We'll see who's right. We'll see who's wrong on this one. But I do feel very, very strongly that that's going to be the case if you can provide him that. JSD says, could we possibly get Buddha from Arizona? Yes. Certainly is possible. Buda Baker, of course, was wanting a trade last year out of AZ and then kind of called off the dogs on that one. But uh, I think that he is in a place of where he's a little bit open to leaving there. And if you do move off of both of your safeties, is there a way that you could maybe find a trade with Arizona where you wouldn't give up a lot to bring him back in at that point? It's possible. It's possible. Um, and he's still a pretty good player. Injuries have come up and bit him a little bit here in recent years, but he's still a very good player. Uh, dude disgusted is another dude. B sent you a tweet. Let me know if you get it. Uh, I will, man. A little hard here on the stream, bouncing to the Twitter thing here between, but I'll take a look in a sec here. Uh, young, uh, Josh Allen's in most interceptions since the other league. Is Josh Allen trash too? Oh, you're talking to John. Mikey Gaming. Dang, laughing out loud. I've been watching the stream for a while. They bring you back to Geno arguments often. It always comes back to you. It's why I've got to be stronger about just going, I'm, I, I got to let him just go through the chat and flow through. I, I got to get better about just realizing there's nowhere to go with it. 
But it's also against my given nature because I like to talk about all the subjects to the nth degree. But this is one I think we've definitely exhausted, Mikey. Um, <laughs> he says, Josh Allen's no longer quarterback and he's Herbert because he doesn't win playoff games. These are the things I learned. <laughs> John said the eye test for Gino alone is enough to know you got to move off of him. His release is long and slow. He's a statue and cannot create on the move, which you have to in the NFL. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I've ever heard people re reference Gino as having a long delivery, John, before. This is the first time I've heard Gino's got a long delivery. Compact and pretty quick delivery has been the outlook that I've seen with him. Um, I, I'll give you that he's not a mobile guy. Um, necessarily uber mobile but i don't think that it's necessarily a full-on statue either i also think a guy starts to look a lot less mobile john when you have him inundated with pressure on the constant ringo says you can't say gino is as good as wilson maybe in moments but nobody would say he's a better quarterback over his career uh, i think the body of work is definitely works in russell wilson's favor but he's had more of an opportunity to play more games than gino's had um situation and where you go to and environment matters for quarterbacks you know and so it's you know you are you are a victim or you're you get a benefit from where you get to go to gina went to a first stop where he didn't have a lot working in his favor and then didn't get another opportunity for 10 years um that doesn't have anything to do about where both of those two players are at right now in the course of their career and right now in the course of their career, Ringo, you've got one team that is sprinting as fast as they can to get rid of a guy that they just traded two first-round picks and a third-round pick and a plethora of players for not two years ago. That probably should say something about where Russell is in his career. Meanwhile, you're going to have a guy in Geno Smith who signed that contract and is going to remain under contract and with this team moving through the next season. Um, when it comes to Wilson, I'm not saying G Wilson can't find success still within this league, Ringo. What I've said with this, and you have encountered me on this, which is again, just like, I have these conversations with some of you guys that disagree with me. We don't, it's like I'm, I'm asking for something and you're not hearing me on it. How is it that you would see Russell Wilson playing on script and on time within this offense when that's not who he has been as a player, Ringo? Let's go to that right there, okay? I'm not discounting he's been a good player. I'm not saying he has had at times a really great prime in 2015, 16, 17. Russell had that. But we're not in 2016, we're in 2020. Four. and you're running an offense that's going to require the quarterback to play on time Ringo not off script not improvisation not hold on to the ball and pirouette it around and throw moon balls but play on time Russell's not a fit into this offense just flat out Johnny Utah, Hawks Nest, I guess it's a free content when the Geno haters come in, give something to do while we speculate about roster moves. I suppose so. I suppose so. I got to let it go, though. I got I to gotta put this Wilson volleyball on the water and let it float. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got to, for my sake of my sanity on this one. <laughs> John says, how many times has Gino been stripped because his arm is four feet behind his head? This is, again, becomes the issue, John, with when you start to have what you feel emotionally you've seen in your head, right? Like you see something in your head that emotionally stands out that I have this moment that stands out. So Gino must be getting stripped all the time. He must be fumbling all the time. Gino had one fumble in 2023, John. So if he's being stripped, this is what I'm saying. When you talk about these, speaking from emotionality versus staying to what is fact, when you talk about eye tests, when you talk about these things that aren't references that you're not building an argument, man. There's no argument they're building. You're telling us about your feelings. You're telling about what you think, but you're not telling us how you get to that spot. When you say bridge quarterback, it doesn't really mean anything. Bridge quarterback doesn't really mean anything. And as I've countered you on this, it, who's the quarterback seeing in that environment, John? Let's just say, don't give me a Mahomes. Don't give me a Herbert. Like how many quarterbacks you think in this league or six, uh, the last two years with what Geno's had to deal with? 
would have succeeded in this environment, would have looked like anything but a quarterback that is a failure for the position. That's the part of the math I think the anti-Gino folks aren't doing here. And that's the part I think you got to come a little bit more forward here with John is really taking into account how encumbered the position was over the past two years. It's been behind the eight ball on a weekly basis. You know you're going to get out coached on the other side of the ball. You know the other defense is likely to know where you're going with the football prior to the snap. You know that you can neither run the ball well nor pass protect well. No quarterback is, that's the point here. And that's what we're trying to hammer on you that you're not, you're not accepting at all and that most anti-Geno folks don't, which is that any quarterback put in that situation is likely to fail. The fact that Geno found success in it, the fact that he was comeback player of the year award last year, the fact that he's been still a very productive quarterback speaks to his ability, not to his crappiness. Speaks to what he can do for the future if you give him more to work with not how fast you need to go throw him into the trash. And anti-Geno folks, the folks that are out on Geno or believe him, are never going to get pulled to this. I get this at this point, John. It's been made remarkably clear to me now after two years of doing this. But I think you anti-Geno folks are in for a very big surprise based on how passionate you are in your feelings of how crappy he is as a quarterback, about how mid he is as a quarterback. Because he's going to come in now this year and they're going to give him an offensive line. And you're not going to likely see a quarterback taken with the first overall pick. And you're going to have an offensive scheme now that's going to maximize the talent to the utmost. That's not going to ignore the middle of the football field. That's going to run to the edges. That's going to utilize fly sweeps. That's going to throw a screen pass once eight every eight attempts. And with all of that, you're going to see a better Geno John like you saw through those first 12 games that when he first got a chance to start in 2022. That's my evidence to back it up. And that's where I'll stand with it. And we'll just, let's let it lie with that, John, at this point. Because like I said, I don't think either side's bringing either side to the other, other end of this. But that's, to me, the bottom line. And I'm going to be a very happy man when I get to see a lot of these folks get surprised by how Gino is going to look so good in that environment, by how much he is going to be able to flourish in that environment. And I only hope at that point, John, that folks like yourself or folks that have been hammering me for two years about how Gino is this, just only this. He is what he is. He is mid. He is not blah, 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 blah. But then they come back in and it's not then you coming in and saying, well, it's all that supporting cast he has. I mean, any quarterback could have done it. Because I swear to God at that time, if I see the same names that I remember and I've had these discussions with that time trying to present that to me at that point, I am going to go off. Haley, hey, wait, wait, B, uh, Gino started for the Giants when Eli got hurt and should have won the job, but they didn't want to bench Manning. <laughs> That's, well, it's true. The coach there wanted to go with Gino Smith, but the fans gave him hell for even thinking about it. Then when he finally did it, the fans basically almost revolted for doing it. But yeah, there was, at those stops he had being, he's behind Phillip Rivers. He's behind Eli Manning. He's behind Russell Wilson. There was never any chance with the contracts those guys were in with those guys in those franchises that he was ever going to overtake those guys for a starting role. And there are 32 starting NFL jobs. And just because you get a chance one time at one place doesn't always mean you get another shot at another place, you know? Uh, Richie Stern, thank you for the $5 donation. Says, I say we settle the debate by asking Lion fans if Gino is good or not. <laughs> there we go, man. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, John Robinson, the reason that the people call it Geno hate is the same reasons I'm bringing up to you. And I've been asking to you and I've been asking for now five and a half hours on my stream. And then remember with this, John, again, you've come in at the end of the stream. There were people, there were, there were a good amount, of, not a good amount of people, but they're very loud. The people that are in the chat that feel this way, they were hammering on the same thing. So it's a guy like me standing in my position, John, bringing up all these tangible points. And it's people on the other side of it talking about eye test, gut feeling, bridge quarterback is what he is. And so what it feels like to people is, well, you're not referencing anything tangibly that you can go to. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the turnover worthy plays, but that in itself is not the end all be all stat. It's also not even, it's a stat with a lot of, I think, uh, uh, there's a good amount of, uh, whether we want to give that stat some end all be all belief to it, I don't. Because there's a good amount of an arbitrary nature in order to, to determine that stat, John. There is. I can speak to a lot of throws this year that I guarantee you are on the turnover worthy peg of things and how they marked it that we're not on Geno, that we know for a fact we're not on Geno, that we're actually on the receiver. DK Metcalf not running a post route in the Bengals game and just deciding to shut it down halfway into the route. That's not on Geno, but that would be a turnover-worthy play under your stat, right? So you can't just ride onto one particular stat 
as well as context matters on those turnover worthy plays, a context which is not given to that stat. One reason it's kind of a new stat and still being kind of fully considered about how much weight you really want to truly give it. But that's why it comes down to people feeling like it's hate, John, because when you ask for a tangible argument to be built, you start to feel like you're getting more feelings from the person. You start to feel like you're getting the personal biases from the person rather than them willing to build an argument. If you believe something, you build the argument towards your belief of it. Why do you want a modernized offense? Allow me to build my arguments for it. Why do I want to go to a value-based model for drafting? Let me build my arguments behind it. If, if you ask me why you want to build your value-based drafting model, I just like it. Okay. But why do you want to like, what's, what's the benefit to the team? What, it just, it's, it just, it's the way that you should just do it. That's just the way you do it. That's how it's done. Okay. But build the case. And there's no case built. And if there's no case built, John, then it does come back down to feeling like hating. And um, I'm not describing you just to be a pure hater on this, but I can understand how people could come to that conclusion. If I literally beg for six hours for some good arguments to be brought from the anti-Geno folks, and it comes back round and round again to the same old place. And again, John, just understand, it's been, when we walked in about an hour and a half ago, we had four hours of the same kind of thing spinning around in circles on it. <laughs> three hours says if you give Gino a good offensive line good play calling and he's bad sure you could say he's bad but you can't say that he's bad right now he's done amazing uh, things put in that situation he's in completely fair you give him those things give him middle of the road give him middle of the road pass protection give him just somewhat decent run blocking give him a scheme that takes advantage of all parts of the field and not just 33% of it and uh, I, you know, John says uh, Schneider's end of the season evaluation of Gina was tepid at best. I don't know. I didn't walk away with that feeling that that's what he said as well. I, I think he said it was just what he said, John, was this. If you listen to what the words on he said was, he started out a little slow, but he got hot at the end of the year. And the prior year, he started out slow and he started out hot and got cold at the end of the year. So he said he thought he had a similar season to the season he had last year. So the season that he had last year where he won the comeback player of the year, John rewarded him with a contract extension. So if John says that he had the same year this year that he had last year, why would he be looking to cut him or move off of him at that point? I, I didn't come to that conclusion on the press conference by the way that John spoke. Johnny Utah says, eventually John will tell us that Gino hates Puck. <laughs> DVDB, with the hiring of Grubb, I can't wait to see the O-line bolstered the way that it needs. I'm excited for the run game as well because of the spread. That helps set it up. Um, I can't either. He's got the offensive line background. I think this definitely feeds us into the spot I want to be in where if we're talking about one positional group I'd like to address above all else, it is the offensive line. And that interior of that offensive line, I'd love to hammer it and get it right. And I think that this does as a hire, maybe give us a little more indication that they'll lean that way. I think that this is much more of a potential of you drafting a Troy Fatano than it is you drafting a Michael Penix at this point, bringing in Grubb. So I, I hope, I hope as well that they drive in that way, DVN. And I think if they do, um, look out, look out, not just for next season, but the foreseeable future. Look at the switch. Championship teams overwhelmingly have great elite quarterbacks. I don't see how you can argue against that point. Um, well, yeah, but again, it's like somebody said about Brock Purdy. Is, is Brock Purdy an elite quarterback? He's in the Super Bowl playing right now. You know, uh, Niners got there with Garoppolo quarterback. Um, to win it, do you need the great one? Maybe. I think those great teams as well, Flick of the Switch, also have good, great supporting cast with them. I don't think it's just the elite quarterback somehow flying on top of everybody else through. So let me give you, as I say, let me back this up with some evidence. Patrick Mahomes goes to the Super Bowl. He wins his first Super Bowl. He's got Mitchell Schwartz and Fisher as his right tackle. A very good interior offensive line. Wins it, right? 
goes back there against Tampa Bay. No longer has Mitchell Schwartz. No longer has Eric Fisher. The interior of the offensive line is in disarray. He gets pounded. Does he win that game? Does Mahomes with his with his the best quarterback in the sport and his cape flapping in the wind? Does he beat that Tampa Bay team in the Super Bowl because he's just so great? Or does that offensive line and the eroding part of it hold him back then in that game to where he's not able to bounce and push it through? That's when he's got still a Tyreek Hill in his prime. That's when he's still got uh, a, a Travis Kelsey in his prime, right? And then what happens? Chiefs come back and they double back on the offensive line. Hey, let's go rip Orlando Brown from the Baltimore Ravens. Let's go draft Creed Humphrey in the second round. Let's go get Trey Smith here out of uh, Tennessee. Let's go sign Joe Thune, left guard from the New England Patriots, and give him a big deal. Let's make sure this never happens to Patrick Mahomes again. And then what happens with Patrick Mahomes? Back to winning a Super Bowl last year. No Tyree Kill anymore. Older Kelsey, but winning a Super Bowl. And I can go through many other different examples of this. But the, the, the thought process that these quarterbacks fly like the, they're shooting laser beams out their eyes and faster than a speeding bullet thing, it's, it's not really the case. I don't really think it's on Geno Smith to a single-handedly beat San Francisco this year, John. That's again what we're trying to, I'm trying to drive to on this is the thought process of somehow there's, there's the rest of the team and then there's this quarterback. And I don't get this whole superhero quarterback thing. I, I really don't get it. You, you need your team around you to be great. You, if you want to take down a great team like San Francisco that's going to get to the Super Bowl, you got to have a great team to do it. You got to have a great offensive scheme. You got to have great coaching. You need good quarterback play within that too? Sure. But is that the end all be all? Does it just stop with that? The buck? No. You need all those other things. And I think you can make a lot stronger argument. You need all those other things first before you ever get the quarterback. Haley says, Gino could go undefeated, break every passing record, win five Super Bowls, and people would still say he's not the guy and doesn't pass the eye test. He literally couldn't do anything to change their mind. I don't think so. I, I think we're, that's why I think I'm at the point with Haley where I go, I, I just got to let the, the conversation go at that point because I, I think you're probably right where it's about where I just don't, if there's much that can be convinced on the folks that are in that stance of things. DVDB, Goff is an elite, uh, but went to a Super Bowl and could have had a second appearance if not for Campbell's fourth down calls. Gino is plenty good for that. Agreed. I, I just don't think, and I think this is a bit of the Tom Brady effect because Tom Brady has been the GOAT and come through and then you have Mahomes on the other side of it. And I think that this is maybe set in people's mind a little bit of a uh, unfair thought process on the quarterbacks that come down the line available and that you can go find these guys easily or that there's a lot of them out there. There, there really isn't. Um, and you can get guys that are what we could call good enough to do, have enough of the skill set to get it done, and you build the rest of the team and they can get it done. And I think Gino can be that guy. I do. Especially if it's more of a team from their process that's driven to understand we're not trying to drive this where the quarterback's got to make everything happen, but this will be a team-based effort to make this happen. We will strengthen up this team fully because we're not paying $60 million at the quarterback position. We'll build up other better parts of the team. And I think there's different approaches to get to the promised land. There's not just one road to take you to the promised land. I think there's a couple different roads that can get you there. Haley doesn't pass the eye test though. He wears glasses, so not 2020 vision. Clearly bad eye test. <laughs> uh, Philip Castle, 100% Brandon. Thank you, Philip. Appreciate you. Will Valdez says Brady had a top 10 defense and weapons on offense every year that made it to the Super Bowl. Yeah, and especially in the early part of his career, Will. He was not Tom Brady through those first three Super Bowls. He was more game manager Brady, you know? And that's what his role was. And they still won it. He didn't have to go out there and be magical for that, right? Just be good enough to get it done with the rest of the supporting cast you got around you. Ricardo says Nick Foles, Joe Flacco, Trent Dilfer, Brad Johnson, washed up Peyton Manning. Is Gino worse than any of these guys? Great point, man. Great point. Johnny Utah, history shows teams with super, win Super Bowls with Hall of Fame caliber quarterbacks or good quarterbacks on rookie contracts with great teams around them. 
That's where a little bit though, Johnny, to me that you have a little bit of a cut of that with, with Gino in the deal you have him on. Whereas maybe he is not on the full on rookie contract, but he's also a lot of the problem that's the tell teams back me not having high caliber, Hall of Fame caliber quarterbacks, but having very good quarterbacks is they're paying those very good quarterbacks at the 50 million mark, 45 million mark. You're Daniel Jones types that makes 45 million per year, right? That's what ends up having that happen. Whereas if you have a guy like Gino who got it, who was on a contract last year that was hitting for the 17th amount most in football, and he'll go up a little bit more this year to a degree, but he'll still be not one of the top paid, 10 paid quarterbacks as far as his actual true cap hit this year on the cap. That then gives you the money to then go build out the rest of the team. Um, yeah, history has shown, we're, we're there, but there are a lot of exceptions on that list. Um, Ricardo just mentioned a bunch above there. Doug Williams. I mean, how Doug Williams in Washington, there's an example back in, back in the freaking what, 89. They come in, they don't have their starting quarterback. They go to Doug Williams. You have John Elway on the other side. You know, by the way, people talk about quarterbacks. That John Elway experience there with the Broncos in that game against that Washington football team should have been enough for then John to be able to carry the boys home, right? For Denver to go get that championship. You've got a backup quarterback you're going up against in John. The Washington Redskins boat raced that Denver Bronco team. Why? What was the main reason there? Because Washington had a better team. Denver had the better quarterback. Washington had the better team. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of ways to get there. It's, it's not just this one way. And I think it's a little colored recently. Again, I think because of the Brady Mahomes and they've covered so many of the Super Bowls over the last 10 years that this is what we're all, we all got a recency bias. And so that's what's happened recently. And so that's, that must be what's going to happen into the future and how this goes as we go forward. I'm not so sure on that with it. Brian E, exciting hire of Ryan Grubb and two thirds of what I've heard here is Geno sucks garbage. I'm sorry, nobody knows play football is possibly this myopic. Yeah, it's definitely, we've definitely probably shifted too much here in the Geno camp. It shows uh, the push on the quarterback and the media nerve. That's all they talk about, but it also shows people who understand football and who just repeat what they hear. Yeah. Definitely would have probably would have liked to have covered more grub. And I'm, I, I think what we're going to do here after this, guys, is today's, today's one's going to be the last, the Gino one. I know it's a discussion that's going to be a point people are going to want to talk about, but I don't think it's getting us anywhere fruitful as we go forward on this. Um, I think we just got to be where we're going to be. If you're anti-Gino, be anti-Gino. I, I, but if, if you're pushing in the chat, I think that we've kind of proven this enough over this time period of two years and talking about this, that there's not a productive place to be had when it comes to Gino, unfortunately. There's the camps that believe what they believe and there's, there's nothing else there to go beyond that. It really is at this point. It's just us kind of hammering our head up against the wall. Hammer and wall. Johnny Utah, Hawks Nest. Uh, Dijon Cooper is available at 16. Would you take him to play the Hamilton role in Max D? I salivate at the thought of Spoon and Dijon confusing the hell out of offenses. Um, when I watched Deshaun's tape last year, I wasn't as much of a fan on him being used all over the place, you know, where he was a Sam linebacker, then sometimes he's down there in the slot, then sometimes he's a free, sometimes he's a strong, sometimes he's an outside corner. I liked the tape a lot better this year, Johnny, when he was just merely an outside corner. And that, he just fit to that role, that's who he was, that's where he was, that's where he was at. Now, I think he gave you a little bit more playmaking, maybe last year moved all across the board and his ability to get interceptions and take the ball away. but. I, I don't know if it was for the best for him as a player. I, I don't know if he's quite big enough to have down there around the box there, you know. Um, so I would more look to want to put him on the outside. I like the thought of his flexibility, but sometimes you with those, those guys, Johnny, you know, you can just, some guys are really well fitted to do it. Other guys, they can do it, but they're maybe better to be just like this. And he's going to have enough speed and twitch to him that I think that he'll be just good enough as an outside corner to make that, make that role. DVD says, B, I also think Gino brings a good winning attitude and demeanor with him that holds wide receivers accountable, but will also correct things when needed. Self-accountability as well. I think he's definitely said and done all the right things as far as what you'd hope for from a leader standpoint since he's taken over. Uh, and he certainly had times where he's taken, the, uh, he's taken the, the brunt of it on the chin and owned up even at times where I don't know if it was always on him to be fully his fault. <laughs> Haley says, irrational angry noises to hide the fences. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Uh, Kronos, B, have you seen EJ Snyder's QBS graph? It quantified how much of quarterback EPA play is by him and how much it is from a supporting cast. Ooh, no, I didn't. I will go check it out. 
what did it uh what did it say about uh our guy Gino here? Ricardo says Brady and Mahomes also played on great defenses, uh, great teams with elite defenses. That gets ignored in the only elite quarterbacks win Super Bowl narrative. Elite teams win Super Bowls. Amen. Well said. Well said. Peyton offers so much more than just his quarterback play at the latter part of his career. Yeah, but John, I mean, they, he, was, he was a shell of himself as a QB. Right, I, I mean, he's he's a shell of himself. He's in full-on game manager, and they win that Super Bowl. That's not Peyton being elite Peyton or anything close to elite Peyton. That's, I mean, they're they got times they're putting Brock out there in favor of him through the year because he just can't get it done anymore. Uh, that's Brock Osweiler, right? Wasn't that who they? I mean, that's who they were throwing out at times instead of Peyton in that season. He was he was definitely a shell of himself at that point. Yeah, John, no one's no one's having low expectations for the team. I don't think anybody's making that argument. He may have been a de facto coordinator, but their offense wasn't particularly good that year, John. And he wasn't particularly good as a QB on that team. Certainly more of a representation of that team of a of a team getting it done, not the quarterback getting it done. Even more Seahawks, do players get to choose what team they want to be in the Hall of Fame with? I don't think so. I'm not, I, I don't believe it goes that way. Um, Scott Brohes, can we all agree that hearing Dak scream, here we go, makes me want to chew glass? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it can get annoying. Here we go. Lucas, which is maybe Penix is the guy to sit for a year. There are a couple of other options to draft a quarterback that's potentially great quarterbacks in the NFL. Indeed. Indeed. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap this show on up. Anthony Heronis, thank you for subscribing to the channel. I uh, appreciate today, as always, the live discussion. And for the folks on the anti Geno thing, I'm sorry we didn't, I think, get as much. I'm, I'm trying to think that one of these shows, we're going to get a breakthrough on this, and maybe we'll kind of find some of that good common ground on this one. Um, don't know if it's there to be had. Um, we got a little bit steered away on this show, but that's the nature of the beast here. That's why we do so many streams is sometimes it'll take us in different directions. And, uh, we thought we we're gonna cover more of the grub hiring. I think we got, got a little more on the Geno stuff today, but Hey, it's the way it goes when you got a live stream show, it can go anywhere. It can, uh, hit on anything. Nonetheless, uh, this was a fantastic hire here by, uh, your Seattle Seahawks as an offensive coordinator. It's boomer bus city here. No doubt about it on this one. And, and certainly there is some downside to the upside here. I'm not going to discount that. But when it comes to a forward-thinking offense, a cutting-edge offense, now being paired with what looks like a cutting-edge defense from a schematic standpoint, a lot more things within the control of the Seahawks team that they're taking care of that they could have controlled in the past, but they left uncontrolled, untaken advantage of, which should help this team, I think, to a bit closer to getting to success uh, that much faster, hopefully. We'll see how it all breaks down. But uh, at least on the surface of it, you can see the intelligence behind these hires. Even if you don't agree with them, I think that you can agree that there was a smart process that brought them to these hires. They may work out, they may fail, but at least that is the sound fundamental part, I think, to this whole process, be it how they've looked for the head coach or how they've looked for the coordinators. If you can, for me, folks, do me a favor, please, and hit the like button. I do appreciate, again, all the discussion on this, um, even for the folks on the other side of it. Um, it's always lively in here, no matter what on that side of it. I want to uh, also thank the sponsor of the show today as we wrap on up. Underdog Fantasy is the sponsor of this show. We got some great ongoing... Um, Prizes contest going on with their site right now. You can use my code NEST. Click the link down the top of the description section below. And that link, if you're a first time uh, person on their site, they will match you up to 100% of your first deposit up to $100. So $100 on me to you from the Hawks Nest. Win, win, win. And you can get on there and win yourself a little bit of money in addition to that. Including, including right now, first time, first time people, new customers coming on in. They will give you a freebie 
A free beyond those parlays there were 0.5 total yards with Patrick Mahomes. Take the over on that. That's a free one you can put right with the rest of your other ones. Get you right on the pathway to getting yourself a little bit of some win, winning money here on this Super Bowl. Um, we all know that the Chiefs are going to probably take this one. Get the, they can reward the Swifties and all that good stuff. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But I want to thank Underdog Fantasy. Get on in it today. Baseball, basketball, hockey ongoing throughout the offseason, even as the rest of the sporting action wraps up. Thank you to them for uh, sponsoring the show throughout the course of this year as they are doing so. Um, appreciate you guys again for that lively discussion. I know that no matter what my fellow Seahawks faithful think, even if it's in disagreement, that wherever we may land on any given subject, that it is absolutely going to be passionate and it's going to be something that you truly believe in your heart and soul. And uh, I think that's all you can ask for from your fellow fans, no matter how they see it and how much there's a difference of opinion is that there is the passion there, there is the care there, there is the love there. And when it comes to my fellow 12s, there's no doubt about it, we're as passionate as you will find. And that will lead to some of these discussions getting a little bit hot and heavy. I do appreciate nonetheless that it's able to stay respectful between different parties here as we do get in these discussions, even through six hours of streaming today, where people can keep it on the level, keep it even, Steve, and understand uh, let's just, let's stay on the points of what we're talking about. Let's not make it personal. And uh, where we cannot find sometimes some common ground on, for instance, this Gino thing, at least I can say we did find some good respectful discussion where I don't think that we went off the rails or got out of pocket with it. So I appreciate everybody uh, for being in that camp and that role on it. And uh, we will be back tomorrow. Coming back tomorrow, less than 24 hours. We will be back at 3.30 Pacific Standard Time. And we'll be ready here to stream out the uh, Super Bowl game. So strap yourself in. We're going to get ready to roll. Got a lot of off-season content planned here to uh, cook up for you guys. Maybe some interviews will get scheduled in here as well. So uh, it's going to be a fun off-season. We've got the Seahawks staff put together. We know how this is going to look. We know how this is going to get set up. We can see the vision. Now, it's just about Coach McDonald getting this vision executed in the way that he sees fit. And that'll be the fun part that we get to see next. Thank you guys for watching today. Do me a favor, please hit that like button if you can, if you haven't already. It does help this channel out. I know it's a pain in the butt. I know you don't want to do it, but if you do it, helps the channel out, helps me show up on those algorithms, helps me get more subscribers, which is ultimately the, the biggest goal that we're trying to reach here. So I uh, appreciate you guys. I love you guys. I thank all the new subscribers in addition and all of the folks that, that donated from Chase to Radu to Randall to Poncho to Ramsey, uh, Lord Boom. Um, Primo, John, multiple, Sanchez, multiple donations over. Just a ton of support from the channel as always. Mumble's not for sale, Snail. Really appreciate all of you guys on that as ever. You guys are amazing in that respect. Uh, never fails on that. Every stream, you're always here in that way. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, one final note, we'll be streaming probably tonight a little bit, maybe over on the Twitch side. So if you want to go over there, I'm the Seahawks Nest. I will be Twitch streaming up a little bit over there. If not tonight, we'll be doing some more so in the future. So probably want to get subbed up to me over there so you can see when I'm live and going live there. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Appreciate you. I love you guys. Even with those that I disagree with, nothing but love back with you. As I always say, no matter whether we're in disagreement or not, let's not us all forget we are all part of the same Seahawk family. No matter what we may think or believe, we are all part of the family. And don't you not think that that's completely understood in this way and what we go about. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Love you back in 24 hours. But until that time, please, my God, don't you ever forget. Never forget. Go Hawks.